Part 1 Introduction Islam is an exceptional product that needs a skilled and a qualified salesperson that knows his commodity and conveys it wisely and with pleasant teaching. The West is a fertile field for the work of inviting non-Muslims to Islam, da'wah. Many Westerners concern themselves with material items, thus cravings for whims and desires. However, they will suffer from spiritual emptiness and an inner vacuum that they can only fulfill through spiritual nourishment, and this nourishment is perfected in Islam. Despite the excellent commodity and the great demand, the harvest of the work of calling to Islam, da'wah, is still unsatisfactory. The call to Islam, da'wah, faces two vital and linked obstacles in the West. These obstacles are as follows. A deficiency of knowledge. The callers, du'at, in the parts of monotheism, tawheed, that deal with the knowledge and perception of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, actions associated with the lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his names and attributes. Unfortunately, many Muslims in the West don't realize that they live in a predominantly Judeo-Christian, Ahl al-Kitab community, who already believe in God. However, they distorted the concept of God. Outreach to the Jewish and Christian communities must begin from the foundation of their cultivated passion for knowing our Lord. Callers to Islam, Du'at, must feed this passion with authentic knowledge of our Lord from revelation. Inviting to know the oneness of our Lord comes before inviting to the actions and symbols of Islam. The following narration, hadith, confirms the above. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu reported that Mu'adh radiallahu anhu said, The Messenger of Allah sent me to Yemen and said, You are going to some of the people of the book. Call them to bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped but Allah, and that I am the Messenger of Allah. If they accept that, then teach them that Allah has enjoined on them five prayers to be offered each day and night. If they accept that, then teach them that Allah has enjoined on them charity, zakah, to be taken from their rich and given to their poor. If they accept that, then beware of taking the best of their wealth and protect yourself from the supplication of the one who has been wronged, for there is no barrier between it and Allah. Many Muslims are deficient in calling to Allah, da'wah, because they lack knowledge about Him, or they have an incorrect understanding of His names, attributes, and actions of Lordship. This is the objective behind our first book of the Right Belief series, Know Your Lord. Poor conduct is another obstacle that stands in the way of a fruitful call to Islam, da'wah. Muslims must invite while conducting themselves with good character in all aspects of their lives. The excellence of good character is a vital component of the work of calling others to Islam. A sign of possessing the correct knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and excelling in performing the rituals of Islam is to have an exceptional character, knowledge. Knowledge and character are linked together. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu is reported to have said, acquire knowledge and teach people, learn with it, dignity, tranquility and humility for those who teach you and humility for those you teach. Sadly, we may frequently hear a Muslim say, I would rather deal with Christians or Jews, but not Muslims because of their bad character. Of course, it is wrong to say that about Muslims, despite the lawfulness of dealing with non-Muslims in general. This statement shows two essential facts. 1. Good character radiates one's faith, 
Iman, before its content testifies to truth or falsehood. Hence, regardless of the caller's contents of faith, Iman, his good or bad character will radiate and degrade his faith, Iman, respectively. Such is the case with many Christians and Jews in the West, who build their faith on translated second-person testimonials and thousands of conflicting manuscripts full of errors and contradictions. 2. Bad character defames one's faith, Iman. Even if one holds the correct belief system, Aqidah, many Muslims do not realize that their first tool of calling others to Islam should be the excellence of character, which presents before the content of orthopraxy. The story of Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, one of the first ten people to accept Islam, is a testimony to the prominence of good character. Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu was distressed by the custom of idol worshipping that proliferated at the time in Arabia. He was one of those who abandoned idolatry to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, following the way of the patriarch and prophet Ibrahim, Abraham alayhi salam. When the news reached Abu Dhar that a man in Mecca claimed prophethood, he immediately sent his brothers, Unais radiallahu anhu, to Mecca to investigate. Unais radiallahu anhu spent days in Mecca carefully examining the Prophet ﷺ's behavior and social interactions. He returned to his brother, Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu, and reported, I have seen him exhorting people to virtues, and his speech was not like poetry. Notice that the first attraction the Prophet ﷺ had was his excellent character. His speech was substantial and commanded virtues, rather than indulgences like poetry and gossip. This is what non-Muslims should see in a practicing Muslim, and it will become the magnet that attracts them to Islam. For the above reason and many other reasons, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to teach His followers the excellence of good character. Allah said, It is He who has sent among the unlettered a messenger from themselves, reciting to them his verses, ayat, and purifying them, and teaching them the book and wisdom, although they were before in clear error. Surah al jumuah verse 2. Furthermore, the above verse, ayah, reveals one of the favors Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed on the believers, stating that he has sent them his messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to teach them the Qur'an and to purify them. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once declared, I was sent to perfect good character. This statement clarifies that one of the reasons behind the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's mission was to elevate and perfect the moral character of the individual and society at large. Chapter 1. The Imperative To Know Your Lord The title that I chose for this work is Know Your Lord. There are two keywords in this title, the commanding verb know and the object Lord. The commanding verb know refers to acquiring knowledge through reading and studying. This means to apply the first command the Messenger of Allah وسلم, received from the Archangel Jibreel. Gabriel السلام, If one is unable to read, he can still obtain knowledge through attentiveness to one whose character exemplifies nobility. In the case of our messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa who was illiterate, he learned from the recitation of the archangel Jibreel, Gabriel السلام, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, It is not but a revelation revealed, taught to him, by one intense in strength, that is, Jibreel, Gabriel. Surat an nujum verse 4 to 5. The object, your Lord, 
refers to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the divine Lord of Prophet Ibrahim, Abraham alayhi salam, who created us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Allah created you and that which you do. Surah as safat verse 96. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facilitates all that we do, and He began His revelation in the Quran with a command for us to read and to learn with His permission. The first subject mentioned after the command to learn is knowledge of our Lord. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who created us and facilitates for us our ability to do all things, amongst them reading and learning. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Recite, in the name of your Lord, who created, created man from a clinging substance. Recite, and your Lord is the most generous, who taught by the pen, taught man that which he knew not. Al-Alaq, verse 1 to 3. Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, said, Since Allah is the Lord and sovereign of everything, and he is the master and giver of all knowledge, just as he is in the origin of everything that exists. Likewise, knowledge of him is the root of all knowledge. Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, a student of Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, said, Whoever knows Allah knows everything other than him. Whoever is ignorant of his Lord is even more ignorant of everything other than him. Imam Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, depicted the same understanding and the arrangement of his book Sahih al jamia the most authentic book after the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah began his book with a section titled The Beginning of Revelation and then he followed it with chapters on faith, Iman, followed by the chapter on knowledge. This arrangement suggests that al-Bukhari rahimahullah meant to emphasize that the first obligation upon a human being is faith, iman, and the way to attain it is through knowledge, and the source of faith, iman, and knowledge is the revelation. The arrangement is not by accident. Al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, made some important points with such an arrangement. In this chapter, we will briefly present three main reasons why we must learn about our Lord. We are aiming to inspire every Muslim to embark on the journey of acquiring knowledge of faith, Iman, particularly the things which allows us to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the hereafter, Akhirah, including paradise, Jannah, and hellfire, Jahannam. The three reasons are as follows. 1. Knowing our Lord precedes the Quran. 2. Knowing our Lord inspires compliance. 3. Knowing our Lord is a means of da'wah, call to Islam. Knowledge of faith, Iman, precedes the Qur'an. The following statements confirm that every Muslim must comprehend the basic tenets of faith, Iman, before embarking on learning the explanation of the Qur'an. Tafsir al-Qur'an There are six articles of faith, Arkan al-Iman, which include belief in one God, Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, angels, divinely revealed books, the prophets, the day of judgment, Yom al-Qiyamah, and the divine predestination, al-Qadr. Notice that the first article of faith, Iman, is the belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This belief begins with learning about Him, and this was the practice of the companions, Sahaba, of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Jundub bin Abdullah radiallahu anhu said, We were with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we were strong youths, so we learned about faith, Iman, before we learned the Quran. Then we learned the Quran and our faith, Iman, increased thereby. Similarly, Abdullah bin Amr radiallahu anhu reported, A man came to the Messenger of Allah and he said, O Messenger of Allah, I recite the Qur'an, but I do not find that my heart understands it. The Prophet said, Verily, your heart is filled with faith, 
Iman, and faith, Iman, is given to a servant before the Qur'an. Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, commented on this concept. His position is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord and sovereign of everything, the master and giver of all knowledge, remembrance of him and knowledge of him is the root of all knowledge. After this recognition, the Qur'an gives detailed knowledge and increases faith, iman, as Jundub bin Abdullah al-Bajali radiallahu anhu and the other companions, Sahaba, said. Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, said, Accordingly, the more the heart knows, believes in, and practices what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have ordered, the more a person's faith, iman, increases, even if that person has a general adherence and general verbal confession. Similarly, if someone knows Allah's names, as well as their meanings, and believes in them, his faith, iman, is more perfect than that of someone who does not know, but believes in them generally, or someone who knows only some of them. Hence, the more one knows Allah's names, attributes, and verses, ayat, the more perfect his faith, iman. Knowledge of faith, iman, inspires a disciplined compliance. As mentioned above, faith, iman, increases the knowledge in the heart and the practice on the tongue and the lips. The practice is performed through the actions of worship as learned from Revelation. Who do we worship? Who do we bow to? Who do we prostrate to? The answer to all these questions must be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. But this certainty, yaqeen, of faith, iman, is increased by what we know about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just as our actions improve from knowing and responding to our Lord. Now think if we know more about Him, how much we would enjoy our worship. We wouldn't do it just because it is mandatory, but because our hearts would desire to worship our Lord. The following are situations which confirm the knowing the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His attributes, actions, and sovereignty over the Day of Judgment, Yawm Al-Qiyamah, and the hereafter, Akhirah, are inspirations and motivations for a believer to comply with the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are pieces of evidence of the necessity to know our Lord. Hijab, khimar, and intoxicants, khamr. The mother of the believers, Aisha radiallahu anha, confirms that knowledge of the articles of faith, arkan al-iman, such as the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, paradise, and hellfire, inspires the Muslim to comply with the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The result is that the Muslim will have the intention to take the effort to save himself from the hellfire, Jahannam, and enter paradise, Jannah. Aisha radiallahu anha said, be informed that the first thing that was revealed thereof was a chapter, surah, from Al-Mufassal, and in it was mentioned paradise, Jannah, and the hellfire, Jahannam. When the people embraced Islam, the verses, ayat, regarding legal and illegal things were revealed. If the first thing to be revealed was, do not drink alcoholic drinks, people would have said, we will never leave alcoholic drinks. And if there had been revealed, do not commit illegal sexual intercourse, they would have said, we will never give up illegal sexual intercourse. Our mother is hinting that knowing what a believer will receive of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's bliss in paradise can become positive enforcement to comply with the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Likewise, the knowledge of the hellfire becomes the negative enforcement to abandon the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the years 1920 to 1933, the United States underwent a national campaign to prohibit alcohol. The caring politicians initiated such a noble cause to decrease evil and corruption, solve social problems, reduce the tax burden created by prisons, 
and poor houses, and improve health and hygiene in America. Unfortunately, the results of that attempt indicate that it was a miserable failure on all counts. The failure was because the prohibition was not preceded by faith. Amen. A similar campaign took place in Mecca, which was gradually implemented over the same length of time. This campaign successfully motivated the Muslims to spill alcohol drinks and abstain because of faith. Amen. Anas ibn Malik, radiallahu anhu, I used to offer alcoholic drinks to the people at the residence of Abu Talha. Then the order of prohibition of alcoholic drinks was revealed, and the Prophet ordered somebody to announce that. Abu Talha said to me, Go out and see what this voice, this announcement is. I went out, and on coming back said, This is somebody announcing that alcoholic beverages have been prohibited. Abu Talha said to me, Go and spill it, that is the wine. Then it, alcoholic drinks, was seen flowing through the streets of Al Madina. The voice was announcing that a verse, ayah, was revealed which completely prohibited alcohol. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, O you who have believed, indeed intoxicants, gambling, sacrificing on stone altars, to other than Allah, and divining arrows are but defilement from the work of shaitan, Satan, so avoid it, that you may be successful. One should ask why the divine campaign to prohibit alcohol worked while the prohibition in the U.S. failed. The human initiative failed while the divine prohibition succeeded as those who know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala believe in Him, love Him, fear Him, and know that a manifestation of their exaltation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to adhere to His commands. Another statement by the mother of the believers, Aisha radiallahu anha, confirms the decisive compliance of the early Muslims from the immigrants to a command such as wearing the proper hijab, Islamic veil for women. The compliance was absolute since they were brought up in monotheism, Tawheed, and had learned that faith, Iman, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala must be followed with action. Aisha radiallahu anha said, May Allah have mercy on the early immigrant, Muhajir woman, when Allah revealed, O Prophet, tell your wives and your daughters and the women of the believers to draw their cloaks, veils, all over their bodies, that is, screening themselves completely, except the eyes or one eye to see the way, that will be better, that they should be known as free, respectable women, so as not to be annoyed. And Allah is ever oft forgiving, most merciful. They tore their coarse wraps and covered themselves with them. The Qibla Another story to be told in this context involves the change of the direction of the Qibla. The Qibla is the direction towards the Kaaba in Mecca that Muslims face when performing prayers, salah. In fact, it is one of the conditions that must be fulfilled to validate the prayers, salah. Al-Aqsa Mosque, Baytul Maqdis in Jerusalem, was the divinely decreed Qibla at the beginning of the Prophet Wasallam's mission. The Muslims used to face Al-Aqsa Mosque, Baytul Maqdis in Jerusalem, during their prayers, salah, while they were in Mecca. However, they would stand south of the Kaaba during prayers, salah, so that they could face both the Kaaba and Al-Aqsa Mosque, Baytul Maqdis in Jerusalem concurrently. After the migration, Hijra to Medina, the Prophet ﷺ and the companions, Sahaba, continued praying while facing the Al-Aqsa Mosque, Baytul Maqdis in Jerusalem, and thus they had to turn away from the Kaaba since Medina is located on the north of Mecca and south of Jerusalem. Al-Bara ibn Azib radiallahu anhu explained, When the Prophet came to Al-Madinah, he stayed first with his grandfathers or maternal uncles from Ansar. He offered his prayers, Salah, facing Al-Aqsa Mosque, Baytul Maqdis in Jerusalem, for 16 or 17 months, but he wished 
that he could pray facing the Kaaba at Mecca. Though the Prophet ﷺ would have loved to have the Qibla changed to the Kaaba, he did not utter a word of request and continued obeying the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, We have certainly seen the turning of your face, O Muhammad, towards the heaven, and we will surely turn you to a Qibla with which you will be pleased. So turn your face towards Al-Masjid Al-Haram in Mecca. And wherever you believers are, turn your faces towards it. Indeed, those who have been given the scripture well know that it is the truth from their Lord. And Allah is not unaware of what they do. When the Qibla was changed to the direction of the Kaaba, it became a test for the Muslims and the people of the book Ahl al-Kitab in Medina. It was a test to see who truly obeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and who disapproved. Al-Bara radiallahu anhu explained in the same narration as above. Jews in the people of the scriptures used to be pleased to see the Prophet facing Jerusalem in prayers, salah. But when he changed his direction towards the Kaaba during the salah, they disapproved of it. Allah said, We did not make the Qibla, which you used to face, except that we might make evident who would follow the messenger, from who, from who would turn back on his heels. And indeed, it is difficult, except for those whom Allah has guided. True enough, there are those who ridiculed the Prophet ﷺ when he changed his prayer direction from Al-Aqsa Mosque, Baytul Maqdis in Jerusalem, to the Kaaba in Mecca. However, those who truly believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam immediately obeyed the command and faced the direction that pleased the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Al-Bara bin Azib radiallahu anhu said, Then one of those who had offered that prayer, salah, with him came out and passed by some people in a mosque who were bowing during their prayer facing Jerusalem. He said, addressing them, By Allah, I testify that I have offered prayer, salah, with Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, facing Mecca, Kaaba. Hearing that, the people changed their direction towards the Kaaba immediately. Notice the disciplined compliance of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and his companions, Sahaba, who immediately adhered to the commands without any hesitation. Knowing your Lord is a means of da'wah. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu reported that when the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent Mu'ad radiallahu anhu to Yemen, he said to him, You are going to some of the people of the book, Ahl al-Kitab. Call them to bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped but Allah and that I am the Messenger of Allah. If they accept that, then teach them that Allah has enjoined on them five prayers to be offered each day and night. If they accept that, then teach them that Allah has enjoined on them charity, zakah, to be taken from their rich and given to their poor. If they accept that, then beware of taking the best of their wealth and protect yourself from the supplication of the one who has been wronged, for there is no barrier between it and Allah. It is very important to learn the fundamentals as the caller to Islam. Da'i, who knows Allah, Jalla Jalalu, can invite with conviction and with the most beautiful revealed words with which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described himself. He calls to a Lord who is in possession of the most perfect and majestic attributes. Hence, calling without knowledge is an injustice to the exalted status of our Lord. The value of a subject is known by the virtues of the associated attributes. We see that medical doctors are highly paid because the subject of human well-being is valuable to ensure the dignity and honor of the creation to whom the angels prostrated. The attributes of the human are exceptional as an intelligent creation who can choose to use its 
faculties for worship. A medical doctor is competent with his or her patient if he knows the attributes of the human subject. Any subject is described with a specialized language, and the one who is proficient with this language is the individual who begins with knowledge and invites others to appreciate its virtues. In the following beautiful statement, Sheikh ibn Udaymin, rahimahullah, exemplifies the concept that is known by da'wah, that inviting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins with knowing him by his attributes, far as he removed from having anything comparable to him or any equal, free from all kinds of defects and imperfection, qualified with every beautiful name and every perfect attribute, doer of what he intends, wills, above everything and with everything, the one who is able to do everything, the one who manages the affairs of everything, he commands and forbids. He speaks the legislative, diniya, and universal, kauniya, words. He is greater than everything, and he is the most beautiful, the most merciful, the all-able, the all-wise. Chapter 2 how to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As we advance towards a subject, know your Lord, we have presented just three significant demanding reasons why we must embark on the unpausing journey to know about Allah Jalla Jalalu. However, there are many other motives. Knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will lead to loving Him, fearing Him, relying upon Him, and hoping consistently in Him. All of these are forms of worship, which are facilitated by knowing Allah. Knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Islam is unique, since every Muslim has been given the tools to truly know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and not in some vague, dry, philosophical sense. Instead, for example, the believer knows Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in detail, via his names and attributes, and the knowledge, the knowledge of which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has graciously provided in the Quran and Sunnah, prophetic tradition. Every one of his names should lead a person to greater love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as well as greater fear of him. This is accompanied by attempting to get closer to him through knowledge of those great attributes applied in performing righteous deeds. These are some of the statements emphasizing the merits virtues and benefits of knowing your Lord. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah said, from among the signs of experiential knowledge, ma'rifa, of Allah, is veneration in awe. As the servant's experiential knowledge of his Lord increases, so too does his veneration and awe increase. Ibn al-Qayyim also said, whoever knows Allah knows everything other than him. Whoever is ignorant of his Lord is even more ignorant of everything other than him. Furthermore, knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names and attributes is an explanation of everything in creation because he is a source of creation and the essence which pre-existed everything. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah said, Whoever knows the names of Allah and their meanings, believing in them, will have a more complete faith, iman, than the one who does not know them but just believes in them in general. Ibn Sa'di, rahimahullah, also commented on the matter. Whenever a person's knowledge of Allah's beautiful names and attributes increases, his faith, iman, also increases, and his certainty, yaqeen, is further strengthened. To conclude, our faith, iman, and belief in Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, begins with a definitive affirmation of the heart. The heart develops surety, typically when knowledge of the subject is gained. That is why the first step to trigger definite affirmation in the heart, and the first step towards complete faith, iman, is to know Allah. Acquiring knowledge. In general, to acquire knowledge, we may employ our built-in faculties, such as intuition, logic, 
reasoning, or the scientific system of observation, testing, and repetition, which is not independent and still requires our inbuilt faculties. Absolute certainty, yaqeen, can only come from direct revelation, which ended with the passing of the seal of the prophets, Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It follows a degree of certainty, yaqeen, which results from various methods of seeking knowledge that remain attainable. Ibn Uthaymin, rahimahullah, divided certainty of knowledge into quantitative levels as a result of varied methods of seeking knowledge. Knowledge or comprehension of a real thing with certainty, settled belief or comprehension of something, while contrary positions exist which are less likely to be true. Slight ignorance or absence of full comprehension. Doubt, which is to think that you comprehend something, yet you are aware of contrary positions, which could possibly be true or have some truth. Delusion, or to think that one comprehends something despite the presence of that which should cause you to realize that you are incorrect. Compounded ignorance, or comprehension, in a way contrary to true reality. You may not know that you are in ignorance. What follows are the most effective means to certainty and settled belief, and an analysis of the means away from the darkness of ignorance of our Lord. The specific means of gaining Islamic knowledge are specialized and detailed. They will be discussed, inshallah, if Allah wills it. In the last section of part one of this work, Know Your Lord. Intuition, al-fitra, spiritual intuition involves believing what feels true because it inclines the heart to true serenity. It refers to inner spiritual insight and consciousness guiding us to attain knowledge. Since Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us in the best form to distinguish right from wrong and truth from falsehood, we must strive to protect, maintain and enhance the state of purity of spiritual insight. This is the purity of an individual who was born in complete submission to our Lord and who retained that position of serenity and balance and did not become corrupted by the man-made systems of religion. However, if we fail to preserve our intuition, it will become defective and we will not make the proper judgment. Also, our instinct is greatly influenced and driven by personal biases rather than reasoning based on what is apparent of spiritual perception. The success of spiritual insight is dependent on sincerity, purity and sensitivity rather than what is provable through the scientific method. What results is often compound ignorance, doubt or delusion. The intellect, it is a built-in faculty which is a crucial avenue through which we acquire knowledge. Through logic, we can evaluate and understand the relationship between events, ideas, people, qualities and the like. The intellect is a crucial avenue to acquire the truth when we employ reason to draw conclusions from observations and identify whether those conclusions are valid or invalid, are necessary or have potential. When it comes to the truth about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, intellect leads us to substantiate his experience. However, to learn about his names and attributes, certainty, yaqeen, can only come from learning the revelation in the Quran and Sunnah. Prophetic tradition without the guidance of revelation, the intellect can result in compound ignorance, slight ignorance, and even delusion based on unsubstantiated innovations. The visual observation. Perception is another built-in faculty. It involves acquiring knowledge through the senses, in particular the eyes. It is one of the most creditable methods of acquiring knowledge. We often assess the visual observation based on the famous adage, 
A picture speaks a thousand words, which means that we can convey the most complex knowledge by a single image, conveying its meaning or essence more effectively than a mere verbal description. However, there are some samples of many visual illusions that trick our senses. And this introduces problems with relying on visuals alone to derive knowledge. We do have Muslims who claim to have seen angels, divine lights, or even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself in the form of a magnificent being seated on a throne, al-arsh. They claim it to be a true perception enabled by the evolved spirituality. Such an experience is usually followed by the individual abandoning basic Islamic practices like prayers, salah, and fasting, under the mistaken opinion that such practices are only for ordinary people who had not had their type of experience. Examine objectively Saul of Tarsus, aka Paul the Apostle, who was not from the companions al Hawariyun of Prophet Isa, Jesus a.s. He never met Prophet Isa, Jesus a.s. during the Prophet's stay on the earth. In fact, he was an oppressor against the companions of the Prophet Isa, Jesus a.s. Saul claimed to have seen Prophet Isa, Jesus a.s. in a visual experience which became the foundation of the innovations he introduced to the followers of the Prophet a.s. These innovations changed the practice of submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which the early disciples, al Hawariyun, were upon, and institutionalized a Hellenic Christianity which contradicts the revealed descriptions of our Lord's names and attributes. Unquestionable acceptance, taqlid. Taqlid is blind following and accepting new knowledge or ideas because some authority figure stated or exhibited that they are true. Perhaps it is the most common and effective method of acquiring knowledge, since primary intersubjectivity is a means of beginning the development of knowledge when we are born into this world. However, since this knowledge is obtained from our caregivers, it becomes the statured hurdle that establishes a child on the path of inheriting ignorance or compound ignorance. As this method of gaining knowledge progresses, the child may become distanced from knowing their Lord if the caregiver does not have true and correct knowledge of his names and attributes. These authorities from which an individual learns include parents, the media, doctors, imams, religious figureheads, the government, and professors. While in an ideal world, we should trust authority figures. History has taught us otherwise. And many instances of atrocities against humanity are a consequence of people unquestioningly following the authority. In regards to those who must follow because of a lack of certainty in authentic Islamic knowledge, it is a permissible form of following for the common Muslim. The common Muslim will be led into error unless they follow the people of knowledge because our condition is close to compound ignorance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, You people can ask those who have knowledge if you do not know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said, They should separate from every division of them a group remaining to obtain understanding in the religion and warn their people when they return to them that they might be cautious. The scientific method. The scientific method is a process of systematically collecting and evaluating evidence to test ideas and answer questions. While scientists may use intuition, rationalism, and visual observation to generate new ideas, they don't stop there. Knowledge derived upon the scientific method of geosystems, ecosystems, astronomy, climatology, and even our own physiology leads those who are honest and sincere to recognize the existence and nurturing influences of our Lord on our lives. 
By using the scientific method of observation, testing, and repetition, we learn much truth about the world Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created. However, observation has its limits. Our misjudgment limits its potentiality. In conclusion, the knowledge we gain through perception is the most reliable. But the question returns, can we know our Lord by perception in this world? Perceiving our Lord. Both the Quran and the Sunnah, prophetic tradition, are explicit that believers will see and hear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in paradise, Jannah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his companions, Sahaba, and their successors from the righteous agreed upon this fact that the believers will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in paradise, Jannah, and on judgment day, Yawm al Qiyamah, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Some faces that day will be radiant, looking at their Lord. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said, Nay, surely, they, evildoers, will be veiled from seeing their Lord that day. Shaykh al Fawzan, Hafidahullah, commented on the above verse, ayah, They will be veiled from seeing Allah. So, if the disbelievers will be veiled from seeing Allah, it is proof that the believers will see their Lord. This is because the believers believed in Him in this world without seeing Him. So Allah will honor them in paradise, Jannah, by manifesting to them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, The righteous will receive good reward for their deeds and more. The word more, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam explained that it meant to see the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Suhaib radiallahu anhu reported, that the Prophet ﷺ said, When the people of paradise, Jannah, have entered paradise, Allah, blessed is he, and Most High will say, Do you want anything more? They will say, Have you not brightened our faces, and admitted us to paradise, and saved us from the fire? Then he will remove the veil, and they will not be given anything that is more dear to them than gazing upon their Lord, the mighty and sublime. Hamad radiallahu anhu reported similar and added then he sallallahu alaihi wasallam recited this verse ayah for those who have done good is the best reward and even more Jarir bin Abdullah al-Bajali radiallahu anhu narrated we were with the prophet and he looked at the moon on a full moon night and said certainly you will see your lord as you see this moon and you will have no trouble in seeing him. The vision will be as clear and confident as seeing the full moon on a clear night or the sun on a cloudless day. The goal of our current discussion is to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this world, dunya, based on an experienced perception. In a nutshell, we cannot see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this world based on many pieces of evidence. From the narrations, a hadith mentioned above, the Prophet ﷺ said, Be informed that none of you can see Allah until you die. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu reported, similar to the narration, hadith of Jarir ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhu, that some companions, sahaba, asked the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Will we see our Lord on the day of resurrection? He said, do you have any doubt about seeing the sun on a cloudless day? Obviously, from these narrations, a hadith, we can deduce that the companions, sahaba of the Prophet ﷺ, were firm on the belief that they cannot see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this world. Hence, they were asking about the hereafter, akhirah. The reports of seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hereafter, akhirah, are mutawatir as they have been reported by more than 30 companions, Sahaba, of the Prophet ﷺ. Furthermore, there is wisdom in the withholding of seeing our Lord in this life. Seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be a great blessing and joy. Indeed, it is the greatest blessing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept it for the place of ultimate grace and comfort, namely, paradise. This world is a mixture of good believers and disbelievers. 
So the blessing of seeing our Lord is deferred until it will be given exclusively to believers in paradise, Jannah, reserving the blessing of seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until the hereafter, Akhirah, also provides a strong motive to do good in this world, dunya, so that one may see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and feel secure and content in nearness to Him in the hereafter, Akhirah. Another reason is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing us in this world, dunya, with a belief in Him without seeing Him. There are things that many people believe in, but they cannot see, that is, gravity and electricity. One can only see the effects or results of gravity, but not the gravity itself. Believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even more so is to have surety of faith, iman, without the affirmation of sight. This is the quality of the articles of faith, arkan al-iman in Islam, which we cannot see or know in this world, such as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his angels. We are tested daily in our belief, and accordingly, our faith, iman, goes up and down. To be a believer, we must believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the meeting with him. We must affirm and remember his angels, his books, his messengers, and believe in the resurrection and predestination, al-qadr, and what we identify as good or bad of the divine decree. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, This is the book about which there is no doubt a guidance for those conscious of Allah who believe in the unseen, ghaib, establish prayer, salah, and spend out of what we have provided for them. In these verses, ayat, we learn that the first quality of believers who are conscious of our Lord is to believe without seeing. Despite these points of wisdom, if we are to ask Muslims today the question, can we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this world? We will be amazed that some will say, we don't know. Some will say, yes. Others will negate seeing our Lord, but will be unable to substantiate their answer with evidence. This is because we do not know our Lord as the companions knew. Many Muslims have been influenced to know our Lord through a Judeo-Christian lens, which is not built on what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to them, but rather is a layered perspective built on hundreds of years of exegesis based on ambiguous or mistranslated verses. The cultural interpretation. The Western Judeo-Christian tradition affirms the ability to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this world in contrast to the orthodox Islamic perspective. In fact, Muslims are prohibited from imagining Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all. They have distorted and made unsubstantiated claims concerning an embodied essence of our Lord, founded or interpretive teachings, rather than the affirmation of explicit revealed statements. This has been proven by statements that contradict the transcendent oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Tawheed. For example, in Genesis 3 verse 8, it said, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. The second example of a serious theological error is the attribute of theophany in Genesis 18, 1 to 4, as quoted below. And the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre, as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them, and bowed himself to the earth and said, O Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. The Islamic presentation of our Lord is based on concrete and reliable explicit evidence as revealed without distortion, inference, or metaphoric interpretation. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, 
And certainly did our messengers, that is, angels, come to Ibrahim, Abraham, with good tidings. They said, Peace, and he said, Peace, and did not delay in bringing them a roasted calf. But when he saw their hands not reaching for it, he distrusted them, and felt from them apprehension. They said, Fear not, we have been sent to the people of Lut. Notice the phrase, they said, Salaman. He answered, Salamun. According to Ibn Kathir, Rahimahullah, when the angels greeted Prophet Ibrahim, السلام, his response indicated his acknowledgement that they were angels. The scholars of explanation, Tafsir, have said, Ibrahim's reply of Salamun was better than that with which they had greeted him with, because the subjective case Salamun, instead of Salaman, alludes to affirmation and eternity. The attributes of angels were given where they belonged. Neither were the qualities attributed to humans, nor were qualities of divinity bestowed upon them. Consider the request of Prophet Musa, Moses, alayhi salam, to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when Musa, Moses, arrived at our appointed time, and his Lord spoke to him. He said, My Lord, show me yourself, that I may look at you. Allah said, You will not see me. Al-A'raf, verse 143. The above verse, ayah, indicates that in this corporeal world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be seen. Rendering images of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Islam is an impossibility and amounts to disbelief, kufr. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that nothing resembles him. And there is nothing like unto him. And he is the hearing, the seeing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said, And there is none co-equal or comparable unto him. Jewish and Christian teachings on God are confused partly because of anthropomorphic interpretation. In addition, their theology and exegesis are based on incomplete and distorted scriptures and depictions that negate the attributes of divinity or liken them to the attributes of the creation. Another excerpt from Genesis reads, And Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men, and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. This depiction was embraced by the Hellenic-influenced European monotheists, who appraised the use of anthropomorphic iconography from its pagan polytheistic origins. Certain Christians put statues or images of an old, wide-bearded man depicting God in their places of worship. Some of these were produced by the likes of Michelangelo, who depicted the face and hand of God in the Sistine Chapel. This is an error in understanding called tamthil, resemblance, and it is an impediment to understanding our Lord as He wants us to understand. Contradiction to Seeing Our Lord there are many pieces of evidence to prove the impossibility of seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this world. Let's discuss some of them. The limitation of the human mind. The human mind is limited in specific areas, one of which is the visualization of the divine essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is different from anything the human mind can think of or imagine. Therefore, if the mind tries to picture Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, certain aspects will be ambiguous and open to indefinite interpretation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself said, 
vision perceives him not, but he perceives all vision, and he is a subtle, the acquainted. This is not a negation, ta'til, of seeing our Lord in the hereafter, akhira, but only a negation, ta'til, of grasping him. He the exalted did not say that eyes will not see him in the hereafter, akhira. He said, no vision can grasp him. The negation, ta'til, of al-idraq, grasping, is not a negation of seeing. Grasping contrasts seeing like the difference between sensation and perception. A sensation is when an image is put into the eye and transferred to the optical nerves and transduced into the subtle electrical impulses of our nervous system. Perception is the organization of the impulses to rationalize meaning in the brain. Perception describes the organization of input stimulus from any of the senses, including smell, touch, hearing, taste, kinesis, sight, and others. The image which is seen is sensed, and the understanding of this input is perception. This is grasping. An ungraspable image is a sensed input that is so great and powerful that it can't be processed by the limited circuitry of the nervous system. The Prophet ﷺ directed us not to attempt to picture Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's essence. Instead, we may try to imagine other things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created. Ibn Umar anhu narrated that the Messenger of Allah ﷺ said, Reflect deeply upon the blessings of Allah, but do not reflect upon the essence of Allah. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu reported that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Reflect deeply upon the creation, but do not reflect upon the essence of the Creator. Verily, his essence cannot be known other than to believe in it. Al-Manawi rahimahullah explained the statement in his book, Fa'id al-Qadr, to ponder about the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means to reflect on the origin and creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in totality, not in particular. For instance, if we look at the universal pieces of evidence, al-ayat al kawniya of the Creator in the creation, the sky and whatever planets and stars it contains, their movements, their orbit, their rising and setting, and the earth and all the mountains, metals, rivers, seas, animals and plants, and whatever is in between the sky and the earth, the atmosphere with its clouds, rain, thunder, lightning, thunderbolt, and other creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is not an atom that moves in all this creation, except that Allah Jalla Jalalu has many pearls of wisdom in it, which bears witness to the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His greatness and might. The evidence that these universal signs are proof of a creator and a means to know him is in his statement. And of his signs are the night and day and the sun and moon. Do not prostrate to the sun or the moon, but prostrate to Allah who created them, if it should be him that you worship. Allah also said, Exalt the name of your Lord, the Most High, who created and proportioned and who destined and then guided. This tells us that the intricate order and balance in the universe in its composite systems are sustained in a continuing balance by our Lord and are thus evidence of His greatness. Through contemplating this, we can know our Lord and that He has given these universal pieces of evidence as a means of calling to us to Him. Therefore, it is more appropriate not to think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his essence or nature, but to learn of his attributes through his creations. Allah said, Indeed, within the heavens and earth are signs for the believers. The unquantifiable stimulus. Below are a few examples characterizing the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's attributes and his creations. The throne, al-arsh, and the footstool, al-kursi. Contemplating the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seeing him in this life is an impossibility. And the nature of that impossibility is given through a reflection 
on the largest things in the creation, the footstool, al-kursi, and the throne, al-arsh. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu narrated, between the first heaven and the one above it is a distance of 500 years. Between each of the heaven is a distance of 500 years. Between the seventh heaven and the footstool, al-kursi, is a distance of 500 years. Between the footstool, al-kursi, and the water, is a distance of 500 years. And the throne, al-arsh, is above the water. Allah is above the throne, al-arsh, and nothing whatsoever your deeds is hidden from him. Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, radiallahu anhu, reported that the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, the footstool, al-kursi, compared to the throne, al-arsh, is only like an iron ring thrown in a desert on earth. The Prophet ﷺ tells us that the footstool, al-kursi, despite its immense size, is in comparison to the throne, al-arsh, like an iron ring thrown in a boundless desert on earth. It indicates its creator's greatness and absolute power. His two feet are near the footstool, al-kursi, and the throne, al-arsh, is above it. And then he rose above the throne, al-arsh, in a way that suits his majestic greatness. Istawa, above the throne, al-arsh. None can fathom such great size and majesty. But we can appreciate the attributes of its exalted creator. The two feet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are mentioned in the following statement by Abu Ismail al-Harawi, rahimahullah, with his chain of narrations that lead to Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu said, Indeed, the footstool, al-kursi, is the place of the two feet of Allah, and none is able to estimate the greatness of the throne, al-arsh, with its true estimation. The wording is from Waqi' ibn al-Jarrah, and it has been reported from Abu Musa radiallahu anhu, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, Ikrimah radiallahu anhu, and Abu Malik radiallahu anhu. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I have been given permission to speak of one of the angels of Allah, one of the bearers of the throne, al-arsh. The distance between his earlobe and his shoulder is like the distance of 700 years travel. Note that it is one of the eight angels who bear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's throne, Hamlat al-arsh, and not Jibreel, Gabriel alayhi salam. The fingers... Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu said, A Jewish rabbi came to Allah's messenger, and he said, O Muhammad, we learn that Allah will put all the heavens on one finger, and the earths on one finger, and the trees on one finger, and the water and the dust on one finger, and all the other created beings on one finger. Then he will say, I am the king. Thereupon the prophet smiled, so that his premolar teeth became visible. And that was the confirmation of the rabbi. Then Allah's messenger recited, They have not appraised Allah with true appraisal, while the earth entirely will be within his grip on the day of resurrection, and the heavens will be folded in his right hand. Exalted is he, and high above what they associate with him. The veil. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala identified the method through which the beloved of his servants perceive him in this life. There is abundant evidence in the revelation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has speech which has been heard, but there is no authentic evidence that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been seen in this world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exalted said that he spoke with Prophet Musa alayhi salam, and we sent messengers about whom we have related their stories to you before, and messengers about whom we have not related to you. And Allah spoke to Musa, Moses, with direct speech. Abu Umama radiallahu anhu reported, A man once asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, O messenger of Allah, was Adam a prophet? He answered, Yes, with whom Allah spoke. The man asked, How much time elapsed between him and Nuh? Prophet Muhammad said, Ten Qurun, centuries. 
or generations. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, And it is not for any human being that Allah should speak to him except by revelation or from behind a partition or that he sends a messenger to reveal by his permission what he wills. Indeed, he is the most high and wise. We may all speak to our Lord, but our means of knowing our Lord in this world through his speech is indirect. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us that this is possible through revelation, a messenger from behind a veil, as mentioned above. One meaning of behind a veil is communication in our dreams. The evidence is the narration from Abu Qatada radiallahu an, who reported that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, A true good dream is from Allah, and a bad dream is from Satan. Furthermore, a true dream, a good dream, of a righteous person is a trace part of prophethood, which means it is a special form of communication. The Prophet ﷺ said, When the day of resurrection, Yawm al Qiyamah, approaches, the dreams of a believer will hardly fail to come true. And a dream of a believer is one of the 46 parts of prophethood, an nubuwa, and whatever belongs to prophethood, an nubuwa, can never be false. The veil is also described as a visual anomaly in narrations, a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ specifically in descriptions of his journey in one night to Jerusalem in ascension from there into the heavens. Muslims believe that this journey was a real event, even while we have no rational way to confirm this apparent impossibility. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described this event. Exalted is he who took his servant by night from Al-Masjid Al-Haram in Mecca to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa in Jerusalem whose surroundings we have blessed, to show him of our signs. Indeed, he is the hearing and seeing. The Prophet ﷺ did not see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the night of ascension, al-mi'raj. Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu asked the Prophet ﷺ about this, to which he said, There is light. How could I see him? The Prophet ﷺ did not see him but he saw his veil of light. The veil prevented the Prophet ﷺ from seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The veil separates and insulates. It is a liminal barrier that shields sensation and perception from the overwhelming stimulus of the sight of our Lord. There is a profound explanation for this veil in the following narration, hadith. Abu Musa radiallahu anhu reported, that the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah, the mighty and sublime, does not sleep, and it is not befitting that he should sleep. He lowers the balance and raises it. The deeds of the night are taken up to him before the deeds of the day, and the deeds of the day before the deeds of the night. His veil is the light. Abu Bakr anhu added that the Prophet ﷺ said, Our Lord has a veil of fire, and if he were to remove it, the splendor of his face would burn all of his creation as far as his sight reaches. Seeing our Lord in a dream, we established that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be seen in this world, dunya. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will enable believers to look at him in the hereafter, akhirah. However, it is possible to see a representation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a dream. The evidence of this is in a narration, hadith, from Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, who narrated that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, During the night, my Lord, blessed is he, the Most High, came to me in the best of appearances. He said, O Muhammad, do you know what the most exalted group busy themselves with? I said, No. So he placed his hand between my shoulders until I sensed its coolness between my breast, or he said, on my throat. So I knew what was in the heavens and what was in the earth. He said, O Muhammad, do you know in what the most exalted group busy themselves with? I said, yes, and the acts that atone are lingering in the mosque, masjid, after the prayer, salah.
walking on the feet to the congregation, perfecting the ablution and difficulty, is bagh al wudu And whoever does that, he lives in goodness and dies upon goodness, and his wrongs shall be like that of the day of his mother bore him. Some of the scholars, ulama, have commented that it is possible for other than the Prophet ﷺ to see Allah in a dream. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, said, A believer may see his Lord in a dream, in various forms according to his faith, iman and belief. If his faith is correct, he can only see him in a beautiful form. And if his faith, and if his faith iman, is defective, it will be reflected in the way he sees Allah in the dream. Seeing Allah in a dream is not like seeing him in reality. It may have different interpretations and meanings, referring to something. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, also said, Whoever sees Allah in a dream sees him in a form that corresponds to his state. If he is righteous, he will see him in a beautiful form, which is why the Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, saw him in the most beautiful form. Sheikh Abdul Aziz ibn Baz was asked about the ruling concerning the one who claims to have seen the Lord of glory in a dream. It was said, for example, that Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, rahimahullah, had seen the Lord of glory more than 100 times in visions. Sheikh ibn Baz, rahimahullah, said, Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah and others said that it is possible to see Allah in a dream. But what he sees is not reality, because there is nothing like Allah. May he be glorified and exalted. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, There is nothing like unto him, and he is the hearing, the seeing. Nothing in his creation is like unto him. A person may dream that his Lord is speaking to him. What kind of image he sees, that image is not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because nothing can be like Allah in any way whatsoever. Shaytan, Satan, may deceive a person and make him imagine that he is their Lord. It was reported that he made Abd al-Qadir al-Jilani rahimahullah see him. The Sheikh said, Once I saw a dazzling light which filled the entire sky. Then a human frame appeared therein and said, O Abdul Qadr, I am your Lord, thy God, I have made everything prohibited lawful unto thee. Abdul Qadr refused. He later reported he knew it was the enemy of Allah, because Allah's commands are not to be suspended for anyone. The means to know your Lord. If we cannot see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or hear him, how can we know of him? We want to know about Allah and learn about him. But we cannot see him. So we are left with two means, and one leads to the other. One, the magnificent creation. The first means to know our Lord is to ponder over the creation, which points to the greatness of the power of Allah and perfection of his creation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to use our senses and intellect to reflect upon the creation. The evidence is in many verses, ayat in the Qur'an, that invites us to travel on earth and to observe and ponder the creation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Indeed, in the creation of the heavens and the earth, and the alternation of the night and the day, are signs for those of understanding, who remembers Allah while standing or sitting or lying on their sides, and give thought to the creation of the heavens and the earth, saying, Our Lord, you did not create this aimlessly. Exalted are you above such a thing. Then protect us from the punishment of the fire. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the above verse, ayat, that we know our Creator through contemplating the signs in the universe. We also gain clarity about the purpose of creation and the attributes of their Creator through contemplating the creation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned qualities of lordship in these verses, that lordship involves creating everything and sustaining and ordering balance in the creation. Creation by our Lord is an attribute of perfection 
which involves an originated creation from nothingness. As humans do not create in any sense, but only reshape materials that were endowed existence by our Lord. This contemplation is a means to know our Lord if we do not restrict our thinking to the apparent, but extend our contemplation to the mighty attributes of Lordship. People of understanding utilize their senses, sight, hearing, and intellect to reach this conclusion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most merciful, guides us to this conclusion through Quranic verses, ayat, that enable us to acquire this great knowledge. Allah says about His signs in the universe, and of His signs is that He created for you from yourselves, mate, that you may find tranquility in them, and He placed between you affection and mercy. Indeed, in that are signs for a people who give thought. And of his signs is the creation of the heavens and the earth, and the diversity of your languages and your colours. Indeed, in that are signs for those of knowledge. And of his signs is your sleep by night and day, and your seeking of his bounty. Indeed, in that are signs for a people who listen. And of his signs is that he shows you the lightning, causing fear and aspiration. And he sends down rain from the sky, by which he brings to life the earth after its lifelessness. Indeed, in that are signs for a people who use reason. Guidance through these signs is only cultivated by those who have the intellect and are sincere to know our Lord. The disbelievers do not evaluate what they perceive in the universe beyond the realm of watching. They do not contemplate the Maker and the Creator. They have alienated themselves from the wisdom behind this creation. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, they know only the outside appearance of the life of the world, that is, the matters of their livelihood, like irrigating or sowing or reaping, etc. And they are heedless of the hereafter. Akhirah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said, Say, look, at what is in the heavens and on the earth. But what use are signs and warnings to people who will not believe? The evidence in the creation of Allah demands that we concede two principles. The first principle is that creation must have a creator. And the second principle is that we cannot originate anything in creation. This must be accepted as a fact intellectually because of complexity, balance, and interconnectivity present in the evidence of the creation. A failure to accept the reality of divine creation is resignation to one of two illogical premises which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned. Allah presented a question in the Quran. Is it that they are created by none, or are they themselves the creators? Both conclusions are irrational. Evidence drives the rational mind to assimilate to another principle. The attributes and qualities of the Creator, as identified in His sustaining and organizing of the creation, are far higher than the ability of humans to organize and create. This principle is also mentioned in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Then is He who creates like one who does not create, so will you not be reminded? The creation can neither fabricate a single grain of dust from nothing, nor organize or sustain anything by independent ability. We are deficient, while the Creator is self-sufficient. There is nothing in creation similar to the Creator. Everything in the creation is evidence of our Lord, the originator, the sustainer. His manifest Lordship is the cause for His right to be worshipped. Although he has no need and does not benefit from our worship, we are in need of worshipping him, who alone facilitates our success. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, O mankind, worship your Lord, who created you and those before you, that you may become righteous. Hence, the creed of Muslims is to worship the Creator, not the created. And the focus of Islamic monotheism 
Tawheed is to isolate the Creator in worship without associating any partners with Him. 2. Revelation The second means to know our Lord is to understand through revelation, through the Qur'an and the authentic Sunnah, prophetic tradition. These revelations speak directly about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His divine essence, actions of lordship, names and attributes. We cannot see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this world, dunya, nor is there an equivalent or similitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His creation. Therefore, we must learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from what He revealed to us. Understanding the names and attributes of Allah is challenging without the firmness of faith, iman, sincerity, and knowledge. Intellect alone is not security against misunderstanding our Lord. Many Muslims have gone astray concerning this subject. We learn from history that Muslims first differed regarding the definition of faith, iman, then later debated the issue of predestination, al-qadr, which is part of the lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As we will learn later on, insha'Allah, if Allah wills it, to know the qualities of lordship of Allah, we must gain knowledge of the names and the attributes of Allah, the way the three praise generation, as salaf al-salih, understood them. Part 2. Dimensions of Faith Iman Chapter 1. The Reality of Faith Iman In the previous two chapters of Part 1, we presented why we must know our Lord and the methods to acquire knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, especially the three effective methods, observation, logic, and revelation. In this chapter, we need to bring into light the relevant subject, that is, nature and reality of faith. However, we need to emphasize that the manifestation of the intended sound knowledge of Allah is that it must lead to faith, iman, certainty, yaqeen, and conviction. The verb know in know your Lord must reflect that the purpose of acquiring knowledge of Allah is not just to develop recognition, Instead, knowledge must lead to unshakable certainty, yaqeen, about Allah's divine existence and absolute affirmation through our actions. Consequently, we will strive to always display our heart's inner attestation in actions and sayings because faith must manifest virtuous actions. The nature and reality of the increase in faith Iman is a process that brings with the heart, followed by the tongue, and then the limbs. Therefore, it is essential to understand faith, Iman, as a concept before developing an action plan to draw nearer to our Lord. Just to reiterate, we are not discussing the six articles of faith, Arkan al-Iman, but instead we are explaining the nature of and reality of faith, as a path to establish perfect certainty, yaqeen, and submission to our Lord. The first condition of the universal declaration of faith, shahada, is awareness of our Lord with basic knowledge. Affirming His role in our lives negates ignorance and begins the path to certainty, yaqeen, then to acceptance and compliance. We must carry out our submission and compliance with certainty, truthfulness and love. The process begins with knowledge and follows with action. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, So be firm in your knowledge, O Muhammad, that none has the right to be worshipped except Allah alone, and seek forgiveness for your sin and for the sin of the believing men and women. And Allah knows of your movement during the daytime or in this world, and your resting place during the night or in the hereafter. In this statement, faith, iman, 
is portrayed with awareness of the most basic knowledge of our Lord. Know that there is no God worthy of worship but Allah. Action follows in seeking forgiveness, which is an action of the heart, and disavowal of ignorance by changing the action of the limbs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said, And those they invoke besides him do not possess power of intercession, shafa'ah, but only those who testify to the truth can benefit and they know. This verse, ayah, refers in part to angels who may intercede with Allah and mention to Allah the merits of believers while he already has knowledge of them. The believers are described as those who testify to monotheism, tawheed, the unique divinity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while they know with their hearts and finally they pronounce its meaning with their tongues. Hence, faith, iman, is not a mere testification in the heart but is a process that entails many aspects of securing certainty, yaqeen, not every Muslim who submits to Allah always has strong faith, Iman. Yet, there are still Muslims under the fold of Islam. This is explained by understanding that Islam and faith have subtle differences. We hope that knowing our Lord goes beyond recognizing Him and becomes knowing with a certainty, Yaqeen, of faith. The Relationship between Islam and faith. The true meaning of Islam is to submit to Allah, obey His commands, and perform outward actions as a Muslim. Hence, Islam is associated with external symbols, actions, or deeds of the limbs. Faith, Iman, is a set of beliefs instilled in the hearts manifested by Islam as an act of submission. Faith, Iman, is the panorama of beliefs revealed in the implementation of Islam. Several pieces of evidence emphasize the vital distinctions between Islam and faith if they are cited in the same context. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, The Bedouins say we have believed. Say, you have not yet believed, but say, instead, we have submitted. For Iman has not yet entered your hearts. And if you obey Allah and His Messenger, He will not deprive you from your deeds of anything. Indeed, Allah is forgiving and merciful. The Prophet ﷺ also differentiated between Islam and faith, Iman, as is reported in a well-known narration, Hadith, called the Hadith of Jibril, Gabriel. The angel Jibril السلام, appeared in the guise of a traveller and asked the Prophet وسلم, what is Islam? The Prophet وسلم, replied to worship Allah alone and none else, to perform the prayers, salah, to pay the obligatory charity, zakah, and to observe saum, fasts, according to Islamic teachings during the month of Ramadan. Jibril, Gabriel, السلام, also asked, O Messenger of Allah, what is faith? Iman. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied, Faith is to believe in Allah, His angels, the meeting with Him, His messengers, and books, and to believe in resurrection. Faith, Iman, has inherent qualities of certainty, yaqeen, and conviction in the heart, which guard and protect the Muslims. Having submitted in Islam does not necessitate the deep germination of faith, Iman, that secures one's heart. Amr bin Sa'd bin Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu reported from his father that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam distributed some wealth among some people and Sa'd radiallahu anhu was sitting among them. Sa'd radiallahu anhu said, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left out some of them, and did not give them anything, although they were better, more deserving in my view. I said, O Messenger of Allah, what about so and so? For by Allah 
I think he's a believer. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, or a Muslim, I kept quiet for a while. Then what I knew got the better of me. And I said, O Messenger of Allah, what about so and so? For by Allah, I think that he is a believer. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, or a Muslim, I kept quiet for a while. Then what I knew got the better of me and said, O Messenger of Allah, what about so and so? For by Allah, I think that he is a believer. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Or a Muslim, I may give to one man, although someone else is more beloved to me, for fear lest he be thrown on his face into the fire. This narration, hadith, tells us that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made a distinction between Islam and faith, Iman as it related to conviction in the heart. Secondly, the narration, hadith, tells us that the trials of wealth may be unmitigated in the heart of a Muslim, while the individual with faith, iman, can manage their affairs with dignity and moderation, even amongst the temptations of excess wealth. This material world has many tests which the believer is empowered to endure, if they have knowledge of their Lord, who guides their actions. Among the scholars, ulama, in the chain of narrators of the above narration, hadith, is Imam Zuhri, rahimahullah. He explained, you have not yet believed, but say instead, we have submitted. We think that Islam is the uttering of the universal declaration of faith, shahada, or kalima, and faith, iman, is the action. Definition of faith. The value of faith, iman, and its significance as a benchmark for spiritual health is apparent from many statements of the companions, sahaba, of the Prophet wasallam. These statements also reflect their vigilant and careful treatment of their faith, iman. They would learn faith, iman, from remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in good company. They understood that they might increase in faith, iman, by sitting with those who would increase them in knowledge or remembrance of Allah. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu and Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu used to invite the noble companions, sahaba, to sit together to increase their faith, iman. Mu'adh radiallahu anhu said to Aswad bin Hilal radiallahu anhu, one of his companions, let us sit for a while so that we may dedicate that period of time to faith, iman. We must also tend to our faith and we should begin with the correct concept of faith, iman, and then strive to hold it in our hearts. Faith, as understood by the three praise generations, as salaf al-salih, is further discussed here. Faith, iman, is to attest, make tasdiq, and affirm, make iqrar, something, which leads to having the concrete belief, al-itiqad, al-jazm. The mark of having such firmness in the heart upon a belief is to comply and submit, and then engage in actions to attest to that faith, such as actively submitting to fulfill the commands of Allah in the five pillars of Islam, Arkan al-Islam. Furthermore, we must protect our attestation, tasdiq, from doubts and suspicions through the fidelity of intention, near, before each action, amal. Actions that immediately follow the firmness of the heart are the statements of the tongue or the articulation of concrete belief by uttering the universal declaration of faith, shahada, with the tongue. The actions upon attestation extend beyond that of the tongue to fingers, limbs, and the entire body. Bodily actions begin with sincere intention, near, in the heart, followed by utterances of the tongue, and the actions of the rest of the body are facilitated by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Faith, iman, increases through compliance and submission and decreases due to not complying 
This is the definition that was known by the four Imams, Abu Hanifa, Rahimahullah, Malik, Rahimahullah, Al-Shafi'i, Rahimahullah, and Ahmad, Rahimahullah. And the scholars of the Sunnah, prophetic tradition, before and after them. Abdul Razak al-San'ani, Rahimahullah said, I met 62 shuyukh, religious leaders. Amongst them were Ma'mar, Al-Awza'i, Al-Thawri, Al-Walid ibn Muhammad, Al-Qurashi, Yazid ibn Al-Sa'ib, Hamad ibn Salama, Hamad ibn Zaid, Sufyan ibn Uyayna, Shu'ayb ibn Harh, Waki' ibn Jarrah, Malik ibn Anas, ibn Abi Layla, Ismail ibn Ayash, Al-Walid ibn Muslim, and those I have not named. All of them said, faith consists of speech and action. It increases and decreases. Muhammad ibn Abi Hatim, rahimahullah, the scribe of Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, said, a month before his death, I heard al-Bukhari say, I have written narrations, a hadith, from a thousand and eighty men. All of them reported narrations, a hadith, they all used to say, faith, iman, is statement, an action, it increases and decreases. Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, brought the principle of the people of the sunnah, prophetic tradition, and the community, that the religion and faith, iman, consist of sayings and actions, the sayings of the heart and the tongue, and the actions of the heart, tongue and limbs. Shaykh al-Fawzan, Hafidhahullah said, Belief requires confirming that was preceded with the tongue in being totally sincere in every act of worship, whether it is a physical action, a verbal one, or a matter of belief. Ibn Abi al-Izz al-Hanafi, Rahimahullah said, Malik, al-Shafi'i, Ahmad, al-Awza'i, Ishaq, Ibn Rahawai, the scholars of Ahl al-Hadith, and the scholars in Medina, may Allah bless them, as well as the Tahiris, and a faction of theologians, think that faith, iman, is to affirm, to make tasdiq in the heart, profess with the tongue, and to act with the body, proceeding towards faith, iman. The caller to Islam, called da'i, calling for da'wah, must identify and understand the stages of awakening which an individual will move through from the place of ignorance until the place of concrete belief al-i'tiqad al-jazm stages of awakening the heart the heart must wake up from its state of heedlessness since the heart is the first seat where faith iman begins faith in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins with attestation, tasdiq, which evolves into definite affirmation, iqrar, which we call the heart's concrete belief, which together make the statement of the heart. 1. To know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the first step that triggers. The heart typically develops attestation, thus leading to affirmation, when knowledge of the subject is made available. Hence, the first step towards the complete faith is to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to approach that knowledge, ideally through learning His names and attributes. 2. We may first acquire the necessary knowledge to instill in the hearts the attestation and definite affirmation by employing our intellectual faculties to reflect upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. 3. By reflecting upon the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in creation, we will conclude two key principles. The first is there must be a creator, and the second is that the creator's attributes and qualities must be superior to his creation. 4. The next step is to learn about the creator through his revelation and to formalize a means of following and organizing the heart, tongue, and limbs according to the revelation. 5. 
one believes in the statement of the heart without any shadow of doubt, suspicion or uncertainty. One believes in the six articles of faith, arkan al-iman. One believes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists as the Lord who created everything, the sovereign, the provider and the ruler. Our Lord has no equal or similitude to his divine essence, names and attributes. He is the one to be worshipped and obeyed without any partners and the only religion he will accept is submission to him alone. This statement of the heart with attestation is the foundation of belief or faith. 6. The heart's definite affirmation may read as follows. Allah created me to worship and comply with his commands by implementing the five pillars of Islam based on my firm belief in the six articles of faith. The statement of tongue, Iqrar al-Lisan. This is the articulation by the tongue of the universal declaration of faith for the one who wishes to embrace Islam and can speak. It is one of the conditions for the correctness and validity of faith. One, after developing the statement of the heart through the employment of the intellectual capacity, one must turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's revelation and signs to learn about the Creator, His names, attributes, actions, angels, jinn, books, messengers, the day of judgment, yawm al-qiyamah, and the predestination, al-qadr. Two, one begins recognizing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not create the heavens, the earth, and the servant aimlessly. Instead, one becomes sure that there is a purpose left behind in this world, dunya, and there will be consequences to how they conduct their lives. 3. He begins to say to himself the following, I am in this world for a short while, and after I die, there will be paradise, jannah, or hell, jahannam. What does it take to save me from hell, jahannam, and be admitted into paradise? 4. One responds to this query by turning to the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to the first of five pillars of Islam, Arkan al-Islam. This stage is the definitive affirmation of the tongue upon the universal declaration of faith. The action of the heart, tongue and limbs. One, in the next step, once the heart, which is the king of the body, is incited and mobilized to act, one will strive to become a good Muslim in this world, dunya, since it is the path to paradise. 2. One recognizes the compliance and submission to the commands of Allah, make him or her a true believer. 3. The heart begins to be sincere and truthful in adhering to the commands until it adheres due to love. 4. Once the heart is full, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love, fear and hope, it will mobilize the rest of the limbs to act and the tongue will begin imploring and glorifying Allah. The rest of the bodily parts will comply as well. Protecting the stature of the heart. The stature of the heart is regarded as the foundation of our faith. One who believes must protect the heart from three defects. One, delusion. It is the state of the heart oppressed by falsehood, delusion, or an incomplete acceptance of the articles of faith, arkan al-iman, illusion, al-wahm, is the inability to distinguish between what is real and what only seems to be real, often as a result of a disordered state of mind. In some cases, the heart completely lacks the knowledge of faith, iman, which is the requisite for attestation and affirmation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Jews utter the following statements without any basis. And they say, None will enter paradise, Jannah, except one who is a Jew or a Christian. That is merely their wishful thinking. Say, produce your proof, if you should be truthful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said, But the Jews and Christians say, We are the children of Allah and his beloved, say, then why does he punish you for your sins? Rather, 
You are human beings. From among those he has created, he forgives whom he wills, and he punishes whom he wills. And to Allah belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth, and whatever is in between them, and to him is the final destination. These qualities of self-praise are hindrances from developing true faith, because they are an ignorance of the articles of faith. These are statements that deny the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and belie knowledge of one of the articles of faith, which is the accountability on the Day of Judgment. 2. Doubt. Ashak. It is a state when the heart harbors attestation, mixed with ignorance. An individual will question the articles of faith out of a disorderly understanding by the use of rhetoric, philosophy, and conjecture. This is not a foundation that will reach affirmation or concrete belief. Doubt is the mental confusion that occupies the heart. About the articles of faith, this can be in the form of partial rejection or intellectual critical doubts and pillars such as belief in the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the day of judgment or the predestination. Doubt can result in a denial if it proceeds untreated. The devastating danger of doubt is that it easily leads to sin and the normalization of prohibited haram actions. In the state of doubt, the heart lacks the part which perfects attestation and establishes definite affirmation. Instead, the heart entertains doubts that hinder its ability to evolve to affirmation and al-itiqad al-jazm. The origin of doubt in a Muslim heart stems from learning monotheism, tawheed from deviant sects that emphasize philosophical thoughts and have strayed from the Qur'an and Sunnah. To save the heart from doubts, one must acquire knowledge of monotheism through trustworthy sources, the Qur'an and Sunnah, and the explanation, tafsir, of these pieces of evidence by the righteous predecessors of the Muslim community, Ummah. There are many Quranic verses, ayat, stating that believers should abstain from doubt. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Say, O Muhammad, shall I seek a judge other than Allah, while it is he who has sent down unto you the book, the Qur'an, explained in detail, those unto whom we gave the scripture, the Torah, and the Injil, know that it is revealed from your Lord in truth, so be not you of those who doubt. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said, If you people have any doubt about what we have revealed to you about the Day of Judgment and other matters of belief, ask those who read the book that was revealed to the prophets who lived before you. The truth has certainly come to you from your Lord, thus do not doubt it in your hearts. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said, The believers are only the ones who have believed in Allah and his messengers, and then doubt not, but strive with their properties and their lives in the cause of Allah. It is those who are the truthful. The essential knowledge of the religion is knowable, and those aspects of the articles of faith, arkan al-iman, which are unseen in a knowable, are not essential to the state of heart in which one recognizes the concrete belief. Those who accept the article of faith but have uncertainty with conjecture have fallen into an error of the heart involving the mixing of truth with falsehood. One still does not have firm, convincing beliefs regarding the articles of faith. His definite affirmation, iqrar, in the articles of faith may range from falling short of certainty to an almost complete lack of conviction or knowledge. An example of this is one says, I do believe in the articles of faith, but still have some reservations. The individual then rationalizes missing components to resolve his doubts. This can have devastating consequences because conjecture is a deviant methodology not based on revealed evidence. The method and the conclusion based on conjecture 
may both be in opposition to the Qur'an and Sunnah, even if it arrives at some aspects of reality. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Verily, those who believe not in the hereafter, name the angels with female names, while they have no knowledge thereof, they follow but a guess, and verily, guess is no substitute for the truth. Allah also said, And when it is said, Lo, Allah's promise is the truth, and there is no doubt of the hour's coming. Ye said, We know not what the hour is, we deem it not but a conjecture, and we are by no means convinced. Chapter 2 Conjecture in Faith was the first deviation. Despite the abundance of clear evidence regarding the definition and nature of faith, the subject was the first upon which Muslims differed and disputed. Abu Sufyan Farid ibn Abdul Wahid Haybatan rahimahullah, wrote in the translator's notes of causes behind the increase and decrease of Iman about the devastating consequences of cherishing a corrupt perception of faith. He wrote that the nature of deviant innovation is that the individual is content with what they have established, and they will neither build knowledge on increasing faith and obedience to our Lord, nor will they avoid what weakens faith and displeases our Lord. Two extremes fomented among those who held a corrupt perception of faith one group held that since faith does not increase and decrease, actions do not affect it, and hence they concluded that sins have no bearing upon one's faith whatsoever. The other group held that faith is affected by actions. However, since they did not recognize that faith was of levels and parts, they believed that a person who committed a major sin was no longer a Muslim and that he would reside in the fire forever, since his faith completely vanished on account of the sin, as it cannot decrease, according to their false belief. Look at how shaitan deceives and plots against humankind to drive them towards disobedience in belief and action. We seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's protection from the constant bombardment of his whispers. Waswas. Faith is the greatest of all blessings, the source of true happiness in this world, and the leading cause of success on the Day of Judgment, Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Sufficient it is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes the heart strong and content wherein faith dwells, and with it one can taste its sweetness. Those with faith receive guidance from Allah as He takes them from darkness into light. He defends them and provides them with protection. Faith is the source of the good life that people are seeking in this world. Also, success in the hereafter is contingent upon having faith. The Prophet ﷺ's companions, Sahaba, used to pay close attention to the correct type and level of their faith. Many narrations report how they regularly checked on their faith, inspected it, and advised one another regarding its quality. This is a comprehensive sense of faith that goes beyond the accumulated system of belief surrounding the six articles of faith. The first subject Muslims disagreed upon was the definition of faith. Hence, it is crucial to understand the meaning of faith according to the Qur'an and Sunnah, as the righteous predecessors understood. Misguided definitions of faith in early Islamic history have caused several problems that persist even now. However, our righteous predecessors had a clear understanding of faith, which we must adhere to as well. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, said, Faith is affirmation, and not merely the attestation Affirmation includes the words of the heart, 
which is belief without any shadow of a doubt, and the actions of the heart, which is compliance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specified that faith of the heart necessitates overt work. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, But they, the hypocrites, say, We have believed in Allah and in the Messenger, and we obey. Then a party of them turns away after that, and those are not believers. And when they are called to the words of Allah and His Messenger to judge between them, at once a party of them turns aside in refusal. But if the right is theirs, they come to Him in prompt obedience. Is there disease in their hearts? Or have they doubted? Or do they fear that Allah will be unjust to them? Or His Messenger? Rather, it is they who are the wrongdoers. That is, the unjust. The only statement of the true believers when they are called to Allah and His Messenger to judge between them is that they say, We hear and we obey. And those are the successful. Despite clarity in the definition of faith, we still find and misguided and distorted descriptions of it, which were introduced by different sects. The twisted definitions are centered around two elements. The first element is whether actions are part of faith or not. The second element is whether faith fluctuates or if it is fixed and constant. Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah define faith as attestation, affirmation of the heart, affirmation of the tongue, speech, actions of the limbs, including, including the heart and tongue, subject to increase and decrease. One cannot be a believer until he assimilates his understanding of faith to these qualities. This position is supported by the Quran and Sunnah based on the understanding of the Prophet ﷺ. His companions, Sahaba, and the first three generations, Salaf al-Salih. Affirmation of the heart. The evidence that affirmation of the heart is an essential condition of faith is based on Quran and Sunnah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, O Messenger, let them not grieve you who hasten into disbelief of those who say we believe with their mouths but their hearts believe not and from among the jews they are avid listeners to falsehood listening to another people who have not come to you they distort words beyond their proper usages saying if you are given this take it but if you are not given it then beware but he for whom allah intends fitna never will you possess power to do for him a thing against Allah. Those are the ones for whom Allah does not intend to purify their hearts. For them in this world is disgrace, and for them in the hereafter, akhirah, is a great punishment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said, Whoever disbelieves in Allah after his belief, except for one who is forced to renounce his religion while his heart is secure in faith, but those who willingly open their breasts to disbelief upon them is wrath from Allah and for them is a great punishment. Statement of the tongue. The evidence that statement of the tongue is an essential condition of faith lies in the saying of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Say, O believers, we have believed in Allah and what has been revealed to us and what has been revealed to Ibrahim and Ismail and Ishaq and Ya'qub and the descendants, Al-Asbat, and what was given to Musa, and Isa, and what was given to the Prophet from their Lord. We make no distinction between any of them, and we are Muslims to him. So if they believe in the same as you believe in, then they have been rightly guided. But if they turn away, they are only in dissension, and Allah will be sufficient for you against them and he is the hearing, the knowing. Actions of the limbs The evidence that actions of the bodily limbs are essential condition of faith is in the saying of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, O you who have believed, bow and prostrate and worship your Lord, and do good that you may succeed. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said, And that is paradise, Jannah, which you are made to inherit for what you used to do. Furthermore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala associated some actions, such as prayer, with faith, as in the following verse, And never would Allah have caused you to lose your faith. The meaning of the above verse is that the reward of prayers towards Bayt al-Maqdis, Jerusalem, before the changing of the direction of prayers, Salah, towards Mecca, would not be lost with Allah. The association between faith and action is known from the Sunnah. Abu Hurairah anhu, narrated that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Faith, Iman, has 70 odd or 60 odd branches, the best of which is saying La ilaha illallah and the best of which removing something harmful from the road and modesty is a branch of faith. Sectarian differences Al-Khawarij and Al-Mu'tazila have agreed with Ahlul Sunnah that actions are part of faith. However, they differed in ruling on a man who commits a major sin. The Khawarij regarded him as an apostle in this world, but he could return to Islam by repentance. The Mu'tazila said that in this world, the person who committed a major sin is in a place between disbelief and faith unless he repents. However, both sects agree that this person will be in hellfire forever. Al-Khawarij was the first sect to emerge in the Muslim world and they had a presence during the time of the Prophet Dhul Khuwaisira al-Tamimi was a man from Banu Tamim who objected to the Prophet ﷺ for his method of distributing wealth. Dhul Khuwaisira said, Fear Allah, O Muhammad. The Messenger of Allah ﷺ said, Who will obey Allah if I disobey him? Would he trust me in the people of the earth, but you do not trust me? Then the man turned and left. Dhul Khuwaisira was the ideological forefather of Al Khawarij. They follow a belief that any deficiency in deeds causes a Muslim to be an apostate, kafir, and out of the fold of Islam. Muslims today who have inherited this ideology are called takfiri, which means those who excommunicate without right. The original Khawarij are long gone, but the ideology persists, and its dangers towards faith are quite real. Al-Mu'tazila, they emerged towards the beginning of the second century. The founder of the sect was Wasil bin Atta, who was a student of Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah. Wasil separated from al-Hassan rahimahullah after a discrepancy that appeared between them on the fate of the one who commits a major sin. Wasil held a position taken from Hellenic philosophy Greek philosophical inventions known as the speculative speech, ilm al-kalam, rather than Quran and Sunnah. Al-Mu'tazila propagated many innovations, which they adopted from other sects. Takfiri over sinful action, denial of the divine will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His creation of the servant's actions and denial or distortion of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Actions, Amal, and Faith The next differing position regarding faith, Iman, is the nurture, an unfounded belief that actions are not part of faith. It is a belief held by the numerous sects, all of whom have a common error called Irja, which refers to delaying or holding back from attributing actions to faith. The names of the sects may be obscure to the average American Muslim. However, regardless of the naming, it is incumbent on every Muslim to identify the correct definition of faith because the majority of Muslims may be in the fallacy of irja and knowingly and party to the beliefs of these sects. The innovated beliefs of these sects are many and diverse. Below is a summarization only of their errors in understanding faith. Al-Murja'ah 
The murja appeared at the end of the first century, after migration, hijra, in Kufa. The group is guilty of severe religious innovations, bid'a. Its name might have been derived from the first innovation that affects the definition of faith, since they excluded the acts of worship from the reality of it. Abu Amina Ilyas wrote, Their intention was to make the religion more ecumenical in the face of extreme partisan infighting. But their creed, besides lacking basis in scripture, diluted the concept of faith to the point that it was nearly meaningless. Aspects of their creed which deviated were their claim that acts of worship are a result of faith, but not an element of it. They also claim that faith does not increase or decrease. Abu Hassan Ali ibn Ismail al-Ash'ari rahimahullah in his book Al-Ibana an Usul Iddiyana named several primary sub-sects of al murja based on the way they defined faith. One, al jahmiyyah were the followers of Al-Jahm bin Safwan, the head of the Jahmiyyah sect. They defined faith, Iman, as a mere acknowledgement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the heart, while disbelief is the state of being ignorant about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is irja. They believed every other acknowledgement, such as a statement of the tongue, affirmation and submission of the heart, love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, are not part of faith. They claimed that faith and infidelity are in the heart, not in words and deeds. According to their definition, Abu Talib, Shaytan, and the Pharaoh were perfect believers. 2. al karamiyah were the followers of Abu Abdullah, Muhammad ibn Karam al-Sijistani. They went further in misguidance with the definition of faith, as the spoken testimonial, while an acknowledgement in the heart is not necessary. According to them, hypocrites, munafiqun, who confess the universal declaration of faith with their tongues while concealing disbelief, are perfect believers. 3. al ashariya The foundation of their belief is derived from Abdullah bin Sa'id bin Kullab al-Qattan al-Basri, who lived in the time of Imam Ahmad rahimahullah. He was the leader of those who practiced European dialectics and rhetorical debate to approach speculative theology. The school of thought later followed Abu al-Hassan al-Ash'ari rahimahullah, who went through various religious phases. When he was young, he studied Mu'tazali theology with his stepfather, Abu Ali al jubay He then repented from it when he noticed his distance from the way of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. He openly announced repentance, Tawbah, by saying that the Qur'an was not created and he swore to refute the teachings of the falsehood. Al-Ash'ari rahimahullah, wrote, We have now argued for the validity of our belief that the Qur'an is uncreated. We have not found any scholar who ranks as an authority believing that the Qur'an is created. Al-Ash'ari rahimahullah, also wrote, The belief we hold and the religion we follow are holding fast to the book of our Lord, to the sunnah of our Prophet, and to the traditions related on the authority of the companions and the successors and the imams of the hadith, to that we hold firmly, professing what Abu Abdullah Ahmad ibn Muhammad ibn Hanbal professed, in avoiding him who dissents from his belief. However, his followers defined faith, iman, as mere attestation, tasdiq, with no need for definite affirmation. They also claimed that faith, iman, neither increases nor decreases. 4. al murja Al-Fuqaha Hanafiya are among the jurists from Ahlus Sunnah wal Jama'ah of the Hanafiya school of thought. They adopted the murja definition of faith and exclusion 
of actions. They also claim that faith does not increase or decrease, and is acknowledgement in the heart accompanied by a declaration of the tongue. Of the four classes of the murja, namely Jahmiya, Karamiya, Ash'ariya, and murja al fuqaha Hanafiya. This latter is of a lesser degree of irja, but is widespread among the Muslims today. However, their interpretation was not known among the four Imams or the orthodox scholars of the Islamic belief system, Aqidah, before or after them. 5. al maturdiya have similar belief to the Murja. They are the followers of Abu Mansur, who was also influenced by Ibn Kullab. The Maturdiya say faith is affirmation of the heart only in some added speech of the tongue. They negated that faith increases and decreases. They believe in knowing our Lord based on reason as precedence before textual evidence. As for Islam and faith, the Maturdiya view them as the same with no difference between them. Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah must follow the Quran and Sunnah upon the understanding of the first three praise generations of Muslims, as Salaf as Salih. This means they will stand between the extremism of the Murja'ah and the Khawarij. Deeds are essential to faith, such that a person who never acted at all on their belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, while having the ability and time to do so, never had faith to begin with, while at the same time, a deficiency in deeds or presence of many sins does not necessarily nullify the faith, iman of a Muslim. The strength of a Muslim's faith is equivalent to the inward and outward good deeds they perform. Faith fluctuates. Faith increases and decreases. This is the last area of faith upon which deviant groups differ, and it is essential to affirm because it increases through obedience and decreases through sin and disobedience. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made this clear in the Quran and Sunnah. Allah said, The believers are only those who when Allah is mentioned, their hearts become fearful, and when his verses are recited to them, it increases them in faith, and upon their Lord they rely. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said, And Allah increases those who are guided in guidance and the enduring good deeds are better to your lord for reward and better for recourse and whenever a chapter is revealed there are among the hypocrites those who say which of you has this increased faith as for those who believed it has increased them in faith while they are rejoicing allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said those believers and to whom the people, hypocrites said, Verily, the people have gathered against you a great army. Therefore, fear them, but it only increased them in faith. And they said, Allah alone is sufficient for us, and he is the best disposer of affairs for us. Evidence from the Sunnah supports the reality of fluctuating faith. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu anhu, reported, that he heard the Prophet ﷺ say, Whoever among you sees an evil action, let him change it with his hand. If he cannot, then with his tongue. And if he cannot, then with his heart. By hating it and feeling it is wrong. And that is the weakest of faith. Faith, Iman, can become weak and diminished to the size of a small seed. But it is still present and capable of growth. This is mentioned in an authentic narration after Allah puts the people of the fire into the fire, Jahannam. He will say to the angels, Look, and whomever you find with a mustard seed's weight of faith in his heart, bring him out. They will bring out people who have been burned like charcoal. Then they will be thrown into the river of life or rain from which they will emerge like seeds sprouting at the banks of the flood. The three praise generations considered that recognizing the fluctuations of faith is a condition of the correctness and validity of faith. The major imams and jurists agreed that faith 
fluctuates. Bukhari, rahimahullah, wrote in his book of faith, faith increases and decreases, followed by pieces of evidence to support his statement. Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, said, faith increases by acts of obedience and decreases by acts of disobedience. This means that a Muslim who has a pure intention and performs regular good deeds will increase his faith, whereas a Muslim who is spiritually ill and does not perform good deeds will have weak faith. What is equally important is to not dismiss a Muslim who appears to have weak faith, as he is still a Muslim, contending with the unique challenges of his experience, and thus his good qualities should not be dismissed. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu reported that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, The strong believer is better and more beloved to Allah than the weak believer, although both are good. This relative position of faith in the life of a believer is a fact that was made crystal clear in the Quran and reliable narrations from the Sunnah. Despite this, deviant beliefs existed and still exist amongst Muslims, such as faith, iman, is solid, fixed and constant. Faith does not increase or decrease. Faith is not made up of parts. Every Muslim holds the same amount and quality of faith. The heart is the place where our faith increases and decreases. To be specific, it is in the statement of the heart, which refers to both the attestation and the affirmation. And these two are combined to be called the heart's concrete belief. Hence, our concrete belief may increase and decrease in the three domains, namely delusions, doubts, and suspicions. Therefore, we must be vigilant regarding any elements of the articles of faith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, The believers are only the ones who have believed in Allah and His Messenger, and then doubt not, but strive with their properties and their lives in the cause of Allah. It is those who are the truthful. As seen above, concrete belief is not fixed, but a believer is not deterred by doubts because of his consistent efforts and sincerity. The heart has strong faith, iman, which may go up and down between the following three levels, which we call levels of certainty, yaqeen, as known from the position of Ahlus Sunnah wal Jama'ah concerning hellfire. 1. Ilmul Yaqeen Knowledge of certainty is merely hearing a description of the paradise or hellfire and believing because it is sure knowledge revealed from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and related from His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, No, if you only knew with knowledge of certainty. 2. Aynul Yaqeen Visualization of certainty or certainty of sight is actually to see the horrors of hellfire. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, then you will surely see it with the eye of certainty. 3. Haqqul Yaqeen Truth and absolute reality with certainty or experiential certainty in the true reality of the hereafter which is the final stage when we enter paradise and taste its pleasure to enter the suffering and hellfire and we seek refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the hellfire. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Indeed, this is true certainty, yaqeen. Knowledge and sound belief cannot go below the first level without risking supplantation by suspicion, doubts or delusion. Loss of an article of faith by one of the three critical failures may take a person out of the fold of Islam. Those critical failures we mentioned once again are delusions, doubts, and suspicions.
Now that we know what faith Iman is, we can take this conversation to the next level, which is to analyze what it means to believe in our Lord. Faith, Iman, in our Lord requires four necessities, the knowledge of which are essential for invitation of those who are sincere in searching for our Lord. 1. The belief that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists with His divine essence above the throne, Al-Arsh, in a manner that suits His Majesty. 2. Belief in His actions of Lordship, such as He created, He is the provider, and He is the absolute ruler and owner of creation. 3. Affirmation that no one is equal to Him or like Him when it comes to His divine essence, names, attributes, and actions of Lordship. 4. Affirmation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as sovereign has ordained life for all of the children of Prophet Adam alayhi salam will cause death, will resurrect the death on the day of judgment and is the only judge who will admit whom he chooses into paradise by his mercy. The evidence for the above four points is in chapter Al-Fatiha and the details of application of Fatiha to these four points is in the known interpretation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, In the name of Allah, the entirely merciful, the especially merciful, all praise is due to Allah, Lord of the worlds, the entirely merciful, the especially merciful, sovereign of the day of recompense. It is you we worship, and you we ask for help. Guide us to the straight path, the path of those upon whom you have bestowed favor, not of those who have evoked your anger or of those who are astray. Once the heart has developed concrete belief upon the above four points, one must articulate affirmation of the shahada with the limb of the tongue and then submit the rest of the bodily limbs and heart to what entails of the divine guidance. The example of Prophet Ibrahim, Abraham alayhi salam. Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam went through a process of affirming belief in our Lord while in discourse with his father and people. In this rendering of the discourse, he assimilated the four necessities of faith in our Lord. Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam disowned the association of other than Allah in worship and disassociated from them in an action called al-bara, disavowal or disassociation. His story is mentioned in the Quran. He said, Then do you see what you have been worshipping, you and your ancient forefathers? Indeed, they are enemies to me. Prophet Ibrahim salam, negated worship of false deities. Then he affirmed his loyalty and association to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in another action called al-wala, loyalty or association. He said, Indeed, they are enemies to me, except the Lord of the worlds. Then he established the evidence, mandating the action by referring to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by actions of his lordship. Prophet Ibrahim, Abraham alayhi salam affirmed that it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord of the worlds, who created me, and he it is who guides me, and it is he who feeds me and gives me drink, and when I am ill, it is he who cures me, and who will cause me to die and then bring me to life, and who I aspire that he will forgive me my sin on the day of recompense. Finally, Prophet Ibrahim salam, established the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through making supplication, which is the essence of worship. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa mentioned, Prophet Ibrahim salam, prayed, My Lord, grant me authority, and join me with the righteous, and grant me a mention of honor among later generations, and place me among the inheritors of the garden of pleasure, and forgive my father, 
Indeed, he has been of those astray. And do not disgrace me on the day they are all resurrected, the day when there will be no benefit, anyone, wealth or children, but only one who comes to Allah with a sound heart. From this example is an essential point that if we invite a doubter or denier to acknowledge the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we should establish the logical and intellectual evidence. However, when talking to someone who believes in our Lord but fails to establish monotheism, such as the Christians, their cognitive failure lies in misattributing the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to other than Him. For this person, the invitation needs to begin with the names and the attributes of Allah to draw them closer to our Lord, while not becoming distracted, trying to prove how our Lord exists. This is the difference between talking to an atheist and talking to the people of the book, namely the Christians and Jews. Building a foundation of monotheism, tawhid, faith and monotheism are synonyms in some contexts and differ in others with semantically obligated hierarchy. They are like the cognate terms faith and Islam or obligatory charity and voluntary charity. Hence, the monotheist is a believer and the believer is a monotheist. The semantically obligated hierarchy between faith and monotheism indicates a need to define monotheism, which means unifying, making something one or asserting oneness. The word tawheed comes from the Arabic verb wahada, which itself means to unite, unify, or consolidate. However, when the term Tawheed is connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then this is monotheism, or asserting the indivisible and unique solitary essence of our Lord without any partner or similitude. Monotheism, Tawheed, is the concrete belief by believing that 1. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one in Lordship without a partner in his dominion and his actions. 2. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one, without similitude, in his essence and attributes. 3. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one, without rival, in his divinity, as the only real focus or concerter of worship. Conceptual Categories of Monotheism Monotheism falls into two categories. The first category is knowledge or information about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which includes both his actions of lordship and his names and attributes. The second category is monotheism in worship, which includes both intention and pursuant action. Derivation of the meaning of monotheism into two conceptual categories forms the basis into which the science of monotheism has been traditionally divided. We must realize that conceptually categorizing monotheism into two, three, or more descriptive classes does not divide monotheism or the essence of divinity, but rather organizes our perception of divinity. The conceptual categories overlap to such a degree that whoever omits any aspect has failed to complete the requirements of monotheism and is guilty of polytheism, which is the opposite of monotheism. To know our Lord, it is essential to develop a complete and correct understanding of them both. The main mission of the messengers Despite the broad implications of the first category of monotheism, of knowledge, qualities of Rububiyyah, correct knowledge of our Lord is not sufficient to fulfill our obligatory duty of establishing monotheism and eschewing polytheism, the complements of Tawheed al uluhiyyah and Tawheed al asma wa Sifat accompany Tawheed al rububiyyah Consequently, the most important aspects of monotheism, Tawheed, is that Tawheed al uluhiyyah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala emphasized the importance of directing worship to Him alone by pointing out that this was the primary purpose of the creation of humanity and the essence of the message brought by all the prophets. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and I did not create the jinn and mankind 
except to worship me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said, We surely sent a messenger to every community, saying, Worship Allah and shun false gods. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent all the messengers to call people to implement worship of the one true Lord, Tawheed al Look how much significance this expression of monotheism holds. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Serve Allah and shun false gods. Then some of them, there were whom Allah guided, and some of them, they were upon whom error had just told. Do but travel in the land and see the nature of the consequence for the deniers. Common Misconceptions There are several misconceptions Muslims have regarding the subject of monotheism, Tawheed. These misconceptions manifest delusions, doubts, and suspicions, resulting in gradual and orchestrated negligence of teaching the subject of monotheism and striving to learn it. Sometimes, the Orientalists generate some of these misconceptions to confuse Muslims about Islam's most important topic. One of the devices Orientalists use is to portray the Qur'an as mere literature and then evaluate it through anthropological theories. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, And among them are those who listen to you, but we have placed over their hearts coverings, lest they understand it, and in their ears deafness. And if they should see every sign, they would not believe in it, even when they come to you arguing with you. Those who disbelieve say, Those who disbelieve say, This is not but legends of the former peoples. Among the misconceptions of monotheism are those raised by Christian polemicists and some poorly informed Muslim apologists who claim that categorizing monotheism into three categories violate the concept around it and think that it is likened to the Trinitarian schema in Christianity. The Christian Trinity speaks of three separate entities, Father, Son and Holy Ghost, all of whom express a share of the attributes of divinity. Tawheed is the purest form of monotheism in which divinity is indivisible and belongs only to the one creator. Division of descriptors of monotheism into three classes clarify the solitary nature of divinity as the one and only divine essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Among the critics of the study of monotheism are modernists who claim that since the word Tawheed was not mentioned literally in the Qur'an, it is an unsubstantiated or innovative reference. To refute this misconception, the Qur'an is replete with monotheism. Every verse in the Qur'an has a direct or indirect reference to it. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah said, For indeed, every verse in the Qur'an comprises of monotheism or as an attestation of it, a caller to it. Indeed, the Qur'an is 1. Either information, news regarding Allah and of His names and His attributes and His actions. So it is the monotheism of knowledge and that which is informative regarding Him. 2. Or it is a call to worship Him alone and not attributing any partners to Him as well as to reject everything that people may worship besides him. So, it is monotheism of intention and pursuant action. 3. Or it is command and prohibition and a requisite of having obedience to him in his prohibitions and his commandments. So, it is the rights of monotheism and fulfillment of it. 4. Or it is information regarding the dignified esteem of the people of his monotheism and obedience to him, and that which occurred with them in the life of this world, as well as that which Allah will grant them in the hereafter. So, it is the reward of having monotheism concerning him. 5. Or, it is information regarding the people of polytheism and that which occurred with them in the life of this world by way of exemplary punishment 
as well as that which will descend upon them in the retribution by a form of punishment in the hereafter. So, it is information concerning the one that exited from the ruling of monotheism. Hence, all the Qur'an is about monotheism and of its rights and its reward, as well as of the affair of polytheism and its people and their recompense. A model of monotheism, Tawheed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Say, He is Allah, who is one. The above is the opening verse, ayah, of chapter Surah Al-Ikhlas. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah wrote, Despite a small number of its letters, Al-Ikhlas is equivalent to a third of the Qur'an because within it is monotheism. Thus, now we know that all the verses, ayat, of monotheism, tawheed, in the Qur'an are superior than others. Also, Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah described monotheism as a third of the content of the Qur'an. He said it is equivalent to a third of the Qur'an due to it comprising a third which is monotheism. Since the Qur'an's verses, ayat, monotheism, commandments, and stories of past prophets. Monotheism, tawheed, is emphasized in the sunnah as seen in the statement of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he said Mu'adh bin Jabal radiallahu anhu to Yemen. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told him, you are going to some of the people of the book. So let the first thing to which you call them to be the worship of Allah, the mighty and sublime alone. If they acknowledge, if they acknowledge Allah as one, then tell them that Allah has enjoined upon them five prayers to be offered every day and night. Categorizing monotheism, Tawheed, is not innovation, bid'ah. Indeed, categorizing monotheism into aspects of lordship, worship, and names and attributes was not done by the Prophet ﷺ and his companions. There was no need for such an approach because even the polytheists at the time understood the nature of monotheism. Regardless, one will find the foundations of the categories of monotheism implied in the verses, ayat of the Qur'an, and the explanatory statements of the Prophet ﷺ and his companions. Scholarly work is a response to ignorance, and scholars of Islam are mandated to develop effective instruction to shatter ignorance without establishing innovation in the religion. It is appropriate for a scholar to use wisdom to simplify complex concepts of monotheism, for the layman provided that the source of this methodology is the Qur'an, an authentic sunnah, according to the understanding of the first three praise generations. It should be noted that there was no original need for the first generations to apply such a categorization of monotheism because the meaning of revelation was known to those who lived amongst the Prophet ﷺ and the monotheistic legacy of Prophet Ibrahim ﷺ was remembered in the vicinities of the Kaaba. The necessity for an analytical approach to the principles of monotheism arose after Islam spread into Egypt, Byzantium, Persia and India and absorbed the cultures of these regions. It was only natural to expect that when the people of these lands entered the fold of Islam, they would carry some of the remnants of their previous beliefs. Therefore, the scholars of Islam taught the Qur'an and the fundamentals of monotheism in a structured manner that could be universally understood. This specific categorization of monotheism is also vital for the work of inviting others to Islam. It is effective for calling others to monotheism because it differentiates between an atheist and those who believe in the existence of some deity or God. If we call an atheist to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we exclusively talk about his existence, which is part of his lordship. We isolate the evidence that points to Tawheed al-Rububiyyah. However, 
if we are calling someone who believes in the existence of a deity like a Christian or a Jew, we know they have a concept of monotheism. But it has been distorted and influenced by cultural interpretations and philosophical inclusions. Consequently, we focus on presenting the names and the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to restore the correct understanding of his characteristics. This is the approach that will be used in this book, insha'Allah, if Allah wills it. Chapter 4 Enjoining the Significance of Monotheism Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, and his student Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, were two scholars who excelled in explaining the concept of monotheism and calling people to it. From their scholarship comes a reminder for the Muslims who have strayed or who have favored a cultural interpretation of Islam which is in violation of some aspects of monotheism. These reminders are organized into 13 lessons. 1. Islam has two fundamental principles. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah said, Allah built the religion of Islam upon two fundamental principles. The first is that Allah is to be worshipped alone and that nothing is to be associated with him. And the second is that no one has the right to be worshipped except Allah, and he is to be worshipped only according to that which he legislated as conveyed by the tongue of his prophet. 2. Monotheism, Tawheed, is the first and last affair. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah said, The beginning of the religion and its end and its outwardness and its inwardness is monotheism and making the whole of the religion sincerely for Allah. It is the actualization of the statement La ilaha illallah. Ibn al-Qayyum rahimahullah said, Monotheism is the first thing that is entered into Islam with and the last thing one departs with from the life of this world. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Whoever's last words are La ilaha illallah will enter paradise. Therefore, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Prompt your dying ones to Say La ilaha illallah. It is easier to die upon what has been known and practiced in this life. Hence, we are advised to keep one's lips wet with La ilaha illallah and one's actions consistent upon the statement. 3. Monotheism, Tawheed, is the basis of good. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah said, Monotheism is the basis of the welfare of the people. And committing polytheism is the basis of their corruption because justice is associated with monotheism and because monotheism is the origin of justice. In contrast, desiring elevated status is associated with corruption because it is the origin of oppression. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah also mentioned the basis of good is monotheism and faith. And the basis of corruption is polytheism and disbelief. He also stated, Indeed, the foundation of the religion is enjoining the good and forbidding the evil. In the peak of good is monotheism, and the peak of evil is polytheism. He also said, Polytheism is the greatest corruption, just as monotheism is the greatest good. The products of manifest polytheism is destruction and failure. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah reminds us of the words of Allah. Had there been within the heavens and earth gods besides Allah, they both would have been ruined. Or, monotheism, tawheed, and seeking forgiveness. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah said, monotheism is the aggregation of the religion, which is its foundation and its branches and its essence and it is good, all of it, and seeking forgiveness removes evil, all of it. So, from these emanates all good, as well as the cessation of all evil. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah also mentioned, whoever actualizes monotheism and seeking forgiveness, then evil 
must be removed from him. It is due to this that Yunus evoked his lord with monotheism while in the belly of the fish. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, He called out within the darkness, There is no deity except you. Exalted are you. Indeed, I have been of the wrongdoers. Also, Prophet Nuh, Noah, alayhi salam, called his people to monotheism, to seek forgiveness, to remove harm from falling upon them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reported that Prophet Nuh, alayhi salam, said, Worship Allah, fear him, and obey me. He, Allah, will forgive you of your sins and delay you for a specified term. Indeed, the time set by Allah when it comes will not be delayed if you only knew. Monotheism is enjoined along with the seeking of forgiveness, istighfar, in multiple places in the Quran, such as the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So know, O Muhammad, that there is no deity except Allah, and ask forgiveness for your sin and for the believing men and believing women. And Allah knows of your movement and your resting place. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah stated, Monotheism removes the origin of polytheism. In seeking forgiveness, istighfar erases its branches. So, the most profound praise is saying, There is no God but Allah. La ilaha illallah. And the most profound supplication, dua, is saying, I seek Allah's forgiveness. Astaghfirullah. 5. Great emphasis was given to monotheism. Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, said, The Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet would actualize monotheism, tawheed, to teach it to his ummah, such that a man said to him, As Allah wills, and as you will. So he said, Have you made me an associate with Allah? Rather, as Allah alone wills. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah said, Indeed, the Prophet guarded the aspect of monotheism with the most exceptional protection. For example, he forbade Muslims from the observance of the voluntary prayer for Allah, the glorified, at the rising of the sun and its setting, so that it should not be a means to the resemblance of the worshippers of the sun, those that prostrate to it in these two circumstances. Likewise, by his obstructing the means to polytheism, shirk, by prohibiting prayer after Asr and the Fajr, due to the connection of these two timings with the two timings in which the polytheists prostrate for the sun. 6. Monotheism Tawheed expands the chest. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah said, Nothing expands the chest more than monotheism, Tawheed, and this expansion varies according to the completeness of monotheism, Tawheed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, So whoever Allah wills to guide, he expands his breast to Islam, and whomever he wills to send astray, he makes his chest tight and constricts as though he were climbing into the sky. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah said in Zad al-Ma'ad, as monotheism, tawheed, and guidance are amongst the greatest causes of an expanded chest. Polytheism, shirk, and misguidance are among the greatest causes of a constricted chest. The light of faith, iman, also expands the chest and pleases the heart. Consequently, one who is deprived of this light is imprisoned. 7. Monotheism repels worldly afflictions. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah said, Nothing prevents the misfortunes of the world like monotheism. That is why the supplication of distress is done with monotheism. And as an example of this, we remember the supplication, dua, of Dhun Noon, Yunus, Jonah, and mention the man of the fish when he went off in anger and thought that we would not decree anything upon him, and he called out within the darkness, 
there is no deity except you. Exalted are you. Indeed, I have been of the wrongdoers. The supplication is so empowered with the virtues of monotheism that no distressed person used to supplicate with it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala drove his distress away. On the other hand, nothing causes great distress like polytheism, and nothing saves man from it except monotheism. Therefore, it is the refuge and the fortress of all creation. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah said in Zad al-Ma'ad, as for the supplication, dua of Dhan Noon, Yunus, Jonah, then indeed there is within it from the perfect completion of monotheism and declaring the Lord, the mighty and majestic, of being free of imperfection and deficiency, as well as an acknowledgement of the servant of his wrongdoing and sin, that which is from the most far, reaching supplications of distress and anxiety and grief. It is likewise the most far-reaching of means to Allah, the glorified in securing one's needs. 8. Monotheism Tawheed couples with safety and security. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah said, Monotheism, Tawheed, is the greatest bastion of Allah, which whoever enters it, then he is from those that are secure. He stated that it means fear is always alongside polytheism and safety is always alongside monotheism. Actualizing monotheism is essential to those who seek security. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah also said, Monotheism, Tawheed, is from the most potent of factors for protection from fears, and polytheism is from the most potent of factors for the occurrence of fears. 9. Monotheism is shelter from distress. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah said, Monotheism is the refuge of its enemies and its supporters. It saves its enemies from the distress and misfortunes of the life of this world, meaning that the people of polytheism will call out to Allah alone when in distress. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may answer them, but He also knows they will return to polytheism. Refuge for them is transitory in this life, unless they die upon monotheism. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful and accepts sincere repentance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, And when they board a ship, they supplicate Allah, sincere to him in religion. But when he delivers them to the land, at once they associate others with him. As for the beloved servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, an emphasis on monotheism during times of trial saves its supporters from the distress and misfortunes of this world. In the hereafter, that is why Prophet Yunus salam, resorted to it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved him from the darkness of the whale's belly. Monotheism brings ease as a matter of perspective and a matter of reality. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's way with his servants. Nothing prevents the misfortunes of this world like monotheism. Nothing causes great distress like polytheism. 10. Monotheism and the sins of the servant. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah said, when speaking about the varying forms of sins, a servant upon sound monotheism mixed with lesser sins is better than an individual who has only the sin of polytheists, shirk, and is without any other sin. He also wrote, monotheism that has with it lies is better than polytheism that has with it truth. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah said, The greater the monotheism of the servant, then the forgiveness of Allah is complete. So whoever meets him, not having associated anything with him at all, then his sin will be forgiven for him, all of them, whatever they may be. And Allah will not punish him due to them. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah also said, So the Muslims, their sins are the sins of a person of monotheism, that monotheism erases their traces in totality. Otherwise, that which is with them from monotheism will exit them from the fire 
if Allah is to punish them on account of their sins. As for polytheists and disbelievers, then indeed their polytheism and their disbelief thwart their good deeds. So, they will not meet their Lord with a single valid act from which they hope for salvation, and nothing from their sins will be forgiven for them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Indeed, Allah does not forgive association with Him, but He forgives what is less than that for whom He wills. And He who associates others with Allah has certainly fabricated a tremendous sin. Therefore, polytheists or disbeliever will be bereft of benefit in the hereafter, because the benefit of lesser good is nullified by the tremendous injustice of polytheism. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, On the day they will see the angels, no glad tidings will there be for the mujrimun, criminals, disbelievers, polytheists, sinners, that day. And they angels will say, all kinds of glad tidings are forbidden to you. None will be allowed to enter paradise except the one who said La ilaha illallah and acted practically on its legal orders and obligations. And we shall turn to whatever deeds they, disbelievers, polytheists, sinners did. And we shall make such deeds as scattered floating particles of dust. Monotheism is the key to paradise. There is an appropriate means for everything which is desirable and the individual with wisdom who desires to enter paradise will apply the appropriate means to attain it. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah said, Allah, the glorious, has made for every desired matter a key to open it. He made purification the key of prayers. In the same way, the key of the pilgrimage is entering into the state of ihram the key of piety is telling the truth. The key of paradise is to believe in the oneness of Allah. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah stated, similarly, that without monotheism, there is no expectation of gaining paradise. For indeed, monotheism is the key to its door. So whoever does not have a key with him, then its door will not open for him. Likewise is the case if he came with a key that has no teeth for it, the opening will not be possible with it. 12. The devils have no authority. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah wrote that the devils have no authority over the hearts of the people of monotheism. This is a testament to the might of that which monotheism attributes. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah mentioned likewise, when monotheism becomes manifest, the devils flee and are rendered futile and diminish. So, they become manifest in places wherein the influence of monotheism is hidden. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah said, The enemy of Allah came to know that Allah, the highest, does not allow him to gain ascendancy over the people of monotheism who possess sincerity. The following verse, ayah, reveals shaitan's statement. Iblis said, by your might, I will surely mislead them all, except among them your chosen servants. This is evidence that the devils have no authority over the people of monotheism, as the enemy of Allah knew that whoever adheres and has recourse to Allah, the mighty and majestic, and makes himself sincere to him and places his resilience upon him, that he will be unable to lead him astray and misguide him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said, And when guidance comes to you from me, whoever follows my guidance, there will be no fear concerning them, nor will they grieve. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said, Indeed, there is for shaitan no authority over those who have believed and rely upon their Lord. 13. Inviting to monotheism is inviting to our Lord. The statement of monotheism, La ilaha illallah, meaning, there is no one worthy of worship except Allah, is a statement incumbent on all of the creation among those who are sincere to know their Lord. It means that the science of monotheism is undetachable from those who pursue our Lord in love and sincerity. 
Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah said, The earth and the heavens were founded. The creation was created. And by way of it, Allah the Most High sent His messengers and revealed His books and legislated the prescriptions of religious law. And because of it, the scales were erected and the registers were set up and the souk of paradise and the fire came to arise. And by way of it, the creation was divided into the believers and the disbelievers and the righteous and the wicked. The calling to this is a calling to accountability and the acknowledgement that our Lord has a divine right to judge and that the dispensing of justice neither benefits nor harms him. Rather, the significance of fidelity to monotheism is for our own benefit and calling to it is a mercy. Part 3. Belief in Allah's Lordship Chapter 1. Evidence of Our Lord It is sad to consider that the fastest growing ideology in this world right now is atheism. The breeding ground for atheism is materialist doctrine in the education system and the moral failure of educators in school and universities. Imagine a human being who was born a Muslim, then placed into an environment where the slogan is a separation between God and life. Judeo-Christian democracies may have referred to this as separation of church and state, and by it they are meant to protect the individual right to choose and follow any faith without compulsion or persecution. According to this ideal, faith lies solely between man and his God. This theory is a breeding ground for disbelief, kufr, as without guidance and reminder. Even free individuals are at risk of losing faith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inferred the institution of teaching, reminding, and establishing principles of faith. The believing men and believing women are allies of one another. They enjoin what is right and forbid what is wrong and establish prayer, and give charity, and obey Allah and His Messenger. Those, Allah will have mercy upon them. Indeed, Allah is exalted in might and wise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, And let there be arising from you a nation, inviting to all that is good, enjoining what is right, and forbidding what is wrong, and those will be the successful. This is the condition Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala requires for his servants to come to know him. Unfortunately, faith is absent from the lives of most individuals when they live under the doctrine of autonomy from a faith community and detachment from moral cultivation. The message that is instilled day in and day out is that our Lord is not part of our life. It should be no surprise that the core message of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah is the antithesis to this. We call to community and we call to morality by inviting towards our Lord. Calling such individuals back to the natural states they were born into is the mission of every Muslim living in this environment. But we must realize that we must start from the fundamentals of faith. We must prove to self-identified atheists that there is God while doing so, we should be aware that the use of revelation as evidence is usually only effective after they acknowledge that God exists. In this chapter, we will furnish intellectual and logical pieces of evidence in five categories, each of which establishes the existence of our Lord. These are areas of emphasis for the caller to Islam. Da'i 1. The Intuition al fitra. 2. The intellect. 3. The invocation. Dua. 4. The guidance. 5. Miracles of the messengers. The intuition. Al fitra. The natural state in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created humankind 
is called the fitra. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu reported that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, There is no child who was not born in a state of fitra. Then he said, Recite. Allah's fitra, with which he has created mankind, no change let there be in khalqillah, that is a straight religion. The Prophet sallallahu informed us that every child is born on the fitra. This means that he or she is free from wrong beliefs and is prepared to accept monotheism and the inherent truths and in recognizing our Lord. The fitra does not mean that the people embrace Islam and adhere to its rulings from birth. Another report of the above narration from Abu Muawiyah radiallahu anhu included the wording, There is no child who is not born in a state of fitra until he begins to speak. The meaning may be that he or she remains in a state of fitra until they have learned from their parents the religions, symbols, and testifications of Judaism, Christianity, or other beliefs instead of Islamic monotheism. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, They will say, Our Lord, we obeyed our chiefs and elders, and they caused us to go astray. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said, In the same way, whenever we had sent a messenger before you to warn a town, the rich ones therein said, We found our fathers following a certain belief, and we follow in their footsteps. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah explained that humans have inherent capacity to understand submission to the Creator. He defended a position in which mankind naturally perceives Tawheed al rububiyyah just as our eyes are created to perceive light. The natural order inherent in the creation is to know the Creator. Those who go astray from the correct response to Tawheed al rububiyyah worship other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of deviant enculturation. Amazingly, every human being has Islam inside them. Unfortunately, parents, the educational system, the social norms, or cultural practices divert this natural state. Moreover, most human beings throughout history and across religious traditions have affirmed the existence of the Almighty Creator. It is merely part of our nature to recognize these signs because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us this way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, So direct your face toward the religion, inclining to truth. Adhere to the fitra of Allah, upon which He has created all people. No change should there be in the creation of Allah. That is the correct religion, but most of the people do not know. The Quran and Sunnah, prophetic tradition, tell us that this natural state in which all humans were born is reconciled in our enculturation when we go through two extreme moments, excessive joy or intense sorrow, distress. For example, Anas ibn Malik عنه, reported that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, Allah rejoices moreover the repentance of his servant when he repents to him than one of you who was on his mount in the wilderness. Then he lost it, and his food and drink are on it, and he despairs of finding it. He goes to a tree and lies down in its shade, having lost hope of finding his mount. And while he is like that, there it is standing in front of him. So he takes hold of its reins and say, Because of this intense joy, O Allah, you are my servant and I am your Lord, making this mistake because of his intense joy. This narration shows how distress reminds us of the fitra, natural state of belief in which we were born. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with our return to fitra and provides us with the experiences of excessive sorrow and desperation as the liquid which polishes the fitra on which we were born. This is exemplified in the story of Ikrimah radiallahu anhu. 
who had been one of the fiercest opponents of the Muslims. On the day of the conquest of Mecca, Ikrima travelled by sea, and he was caught in a storm. The crew of the ship said, Turn sincerely toward Allah, for your false gods cannot help you at all in this situation. Ikrima said, By Allah, if nothing came to save me at sea, except sincerity towards Allah, then nothing else will save me on land. O Allah, I promise you that if you save me from this predicament, I will go to Muhammad and put my hand in his, and I am sure that I will find him generous and forgiving. So he came and accepted Islam. Understanding this element of fitrah is essential in calling others to Islam, because everyone is declined to submit to our Lord. It can be nurtured by calling them to Islam, where the role of the caller is to awaken the ignorant to their fitrah. It is similar to when installing new software onto our computers. The purchased software typically searches inside the central processing unit for a matching component. Likewise, for Islam to be assimilated and functional, there is a fitrah inside everybody and needs nurturing. So continue calling people to Islam. Never give up on them and do it in the best manner possible. Intellect Some modernists malign the sunnah, prophetic tradition, as something unsophisticated and negligent of humankind's intellectual capacity. This is wrong. Revelation defines where intellect may be very beneficial and where it has no benefit at all. In some circumstances, intellect could become an obstacle if it belies revelation. Here is the essential subject in proving that the Almighty exists. The default is to use the intellect. Confirmation that a creator exists is in the creation, which points to his greatness and perfection. Then ask yourself the following question. Who created all of what we perceive in its complexity? There must be a creator. Otherwise, you will have to conclude the two intellectually false conclusions. Either the creation was created out of nothing, or it established itself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Have they been created from nothing, or are they themselves their own creators? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said, Does man not remember that we created him before while he was nothing? The universe must necessarily have a creator because it is impossible for the world to have created itself or to have spontaneously originated as energy in mass from nothing. Therefore, there must have been a creator who provided the initial force and energy needed to set the universe in motion. It is sometimes called the cosmological argument or argument from existence. A well-known narration has been reported in various forms that Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, used the motion of the universe to establish the existence of the Creator in his debate with the atheists. While the validity of the narration comes under question, the method of rational thought is brought as a means of knowing your Lord. Ibn Abu al-Iz reported, This familiar anecdote, Abu Hanifa, may Allah have mercy on him, was approached by some speculative theologians who intended to discuss Allah's Lordship and Oneness. He said, Before we discuss this question, tell me what you think about a boat in the Euphrates which goes to shore, loads itself with food and other things, then returns, anchors, and unloads all by itself without anyone sailing or controlling it. They said, This is impossible. Abu Hanifa said, If it is impossible with a boat, how is it possible for the world to move by itself in all its vastness? Ibn Kathir rahimahullah, mentioned a classical formulation of this argument. Once a Bedouin was asked about the evidence of the existence of Allah, he responded, All praise is due to Allah. The camel's dung testifies to the existence of the camel, and the track testifies to the fact that someone was walking. 
a sky holds the giant stars, a land that has fairways, and a sea that has waves. Does not all of this testify that the most kind, most knowledgeable exists? Ibn Kathir further commented, As Shafi'i said, the leaves of a berry bush all have one taste. Worms eat it and produce silk. Bees eat it and produce honey. Boats, camels and cows eat it and deliver offspring. Deer devour it and produce musk. Yet all of these come from one thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to the diversity in creation from a common source as evidence of his divine plan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, And within the land and neighboring plots and gardens of grapevines, and crops and palm trees, several from a root or otherwise, watered with one water, but we make some of them exceed others in quality of fruit. Indeed in that are signs for a people who reason. The first intellectual argument, a caller to Islam, must use that there must be a creator because of the evidence of creation. The second argument is an assumption of the nature of the creator based on qualities and attributes which must be of higher status than those of the creation. To learn intellectually about the qualities and characteristics of the creator is beyond our grasp. Use of intellect is limited to experiential and perceptual competence but our Lord is greater than what we can experience and perceive in this life. Instead, revelation is necessary to comprehend and conceptualize our Lord as He describes Himself. The Invocation Dua Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers the supplication of the distressed, whether they are believers or otherwise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks, the disbelievers about their own experiences in the Qur'an. Are the idols worthier, or the one who answers the prayers of the distressed ones, removes their hardship, and makes you the successors in the land? Is there any Lord besides God? In fact, you take very little heed. In this verse, ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it clear to the disbelievers that when they sincerely asked Him, for help at times of distress or dire need, they felt a certainty that there is a higher power out there ready to help when invoked. This higher power is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the divine. Hence, every human being will call out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during times of calamity, as it is an innate instinct to turn to the Creator in times of distress. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Say, who rescues you from the darkness of the land? And see, when you call upon him imploring aloud and privately, if he should save us from this crisis, we will surely be among the thankful. When the distressed sincerely calls to the Creator, he answers, Who then can deny Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Lord and Sovereign over our affairs except those who reject guidance. Therefore, the individual who is sincere in her or his search for our Lord need only ask him for guidance to gain a clear understanding of who our Lord truly is, in which religion he intends for humanity. The Guidance Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us with a deliberate design. He revealed the manual guidelines and manuscript for us to implement and if we choose to do so we will become content with our lives in this world and thriving high in the hereafter if we refuse guidance out of arrogance contentment will be elusive this is a legacy of wisdom known since the time of our parents prophet adam salam, and our mother hawa the story is mentioned in the Qur'an as Allah said, Descend from paradise, all your descendants being enemies to one another. If there should come to you guidance from me, then whoever follows my guidance will neither go astray in the world nor suffer in the hereafter. Akhirah. How many people live in dysfunction and self-abuse? Many may be smoking and consuming drugs 
or alcohol or have many other behavioral problems. Once they start implementing guidance from their creator, their lives will improve and they will gain ease. There is a profound example in Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu before and after Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and is one who was dead. And we gave him life and made for him light by which to walk among the people like one who is in darkness, never to emerge therefrom. Thus, it has been made pleasing to the disbelievers that which they were doing. Ease will certainly come after asking for guidance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and those who are guided, he increases them in guidance and gives them their righteousness. Divine guidance is extended to all of humanity, but it is upon the individual to recognize it and follow willingly. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may ease their further process. Such is the case with moral inclinations, which are constructs of divine guidance for those who are aware. Human nature recognizes the existence of the Creator by recognizing objective moral values shared across religions and cultures throughout time. This is known to philosophers as the natural law of the Creator. This is sometimes called the moral argument. Recognizing that the moral argument or natural law is proof of a Creator is only one part of success. The second necessity to achieve success is to follow the authentic guidance from that Creator. Since morality is not relative, nor can it be interpreted by the whims of sectarianism, true loss is to recognize that the moral argument is evidence for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then distort or reject the evidence. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to the moral argument. Every soul will be held in pledge for its deeds. Moralists recognize that action or inaction has an effect on self and environment and the accountability for this effect can only be universally rendered by al-wakil the one who is free from accountability and the disposer of all affairs of creations the miracles of the messengers allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent down miracles revelations and messengers to give clear proof that he exists and more importantly what well, we should do once we come to this realization. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent prophets and messengers with many proofs throughout the ages. These were expressly designed for people to see clearly with their own eyes. Miracles were also sent to their other senses to help mankind experience them as evidence that Allah exists. Miracles of prophets and messengers have come to people through the ages, Prophet Musa, Moses salam, showed many wonders to the Pharaoh and the children of Israel. Plagues, locusts, water turning to blood, his stick becoming a snake, the voice in the burning bush, and the parting of the Red Sea are manifest miracles of the people of his time. Christians, among the people of the book, Ahl al-Kitab, acknowledge that Allah sent Prophet Isa Jesus السلام, the son of Maryam bint Imran, with miracles as evidence for the people of his time. He spoke from the cradle while he was still a newborn infant, animated birds from clay, cured the sick, gave sight to the blind, and raised the dead man back to life, all clear signs by the permission and empowerment of Allah to direct the people to know that Prophet Isa Jesus salam, was a messenger of our Lord, as was Prophet Musa, Moses salam, before him. Prophet Muhammad wasallam, was the last and final messenger of Allah and sent him with the evidence of all humankind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent him wasallam, with several miracles, but the one miracle which stands out with continuity is the Quran. If someone who did not see the other physical wonders is to ask, what is his miracle? The Quran 
is the answer to anyone even after the time of the Prophet ﷺ. The nature and qualities of the Qur'an as evidence of the existence of our Lord are voluminous. It suffices to invite to our Lord using his own words so that the sincere and intelligent seekers may discover the exalted through his own attributes. Chapter 2 Monotheism and Allah's Lordship As mentioned in Part 2, Chapter 3, scholars initially explained monotheism, Tawheed, with two categories, and later subdivided one of the two categories. The subdivision is an organization of the information about the oneness of Allah, which includes both his actions of lordship, at Tawheed al rububiyyah and his names and attributes. The second category, monotheism of intention and pursuant action, is known as monotheism of worship, at Tawheed al uluhiyyah Description of monotheism, Tawheed, in three semantic classes has become standard. These three categories are 1. Tawheed al rububiyyah which points to actions of Lordship of Allah. 2. Tawheed al asma wa sifat which elucidates names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 3. Tawheed al uluhiyyah which describes our actions of monotheistic response to his lordship. The caller to Islam, Da'i, must understand the division of monotheism into two classes because the first logical step of the call is to understand our Lord before acting on our knowledge. Secondly, monotheism is taught by different means to different groups of people. Therefore, there is practicality in organizing this knowledge in separate categories. Calling to Tawheed al rububiyyah Christians and Jews, who are the majority of the people of the West and North America, are familiar with the use of the term Lord. Their understanding of the term refers to something other than a complete monotheistic understanding. Their understanding varies in accuracy, but the majority of Christians, for example, ascribe divinity to Prophet Isa, Jesus alayhi salam by referring to him as Lord. They are sincere in seeking to understand monotheism. Still, they have an incomplete understanding of the qualities of lordship, and this has led them to infidelity. Lack of knowledge of polytheism, shirk, can ultimately lead to it. This is why Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman radiallahu anhu said, The people used to ask Allah's apostle about good, but I used to ask him about evil, for fear that it might take over me. Hudayf ibn al-Yaman radiallahu anhu then reported that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said that evil would come in which a people who appeared ostensibly to be from the Muslims would be leaders calling to other than the teaching of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Therefore, knowing our Lord according to the Quran and Sunnah should come before calling to Islam. Calling the people of the book Away from evil is calling them to our Lord through the use of the Qur'an and Sunnah. This chapter furnishes the knowledge which refers to the oneness of his Lordship, known as Tawheed al rububiyyah The term Rabb has many linguistic meanings, but the Islamic meaning comes under these four primary aspects. 1. The Creator, who precedes all his creation. 2. The Owner, who alone has complete sovereignty. 3. The Provider, who nourishes and sustains creation. 4. The Absolute Ruler, who alone has the right to legislate. Asserting Tawheed al-Rububiyyah can only be achieved by singling out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the sole creator, the owner, the provider, and the one who has the right to rule and legislate. Acknowledgement of some of these qualities independent of complete acceptance of all the qualities of lordship is in complete faith in the lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Moreover, Tawheed al rububiyyah also necessitates denying the above qualities 
as absolute attributes of anyone or anything from among the creation of Allah. Under the four main actions of Lordship, there are other characteristics, all of which are distinct qualities that cannot be possessed by anyone or anything in the creation. He alone is the originator of everything, the possessor of everything, the controller of all affairs, the sender and facilitator of mercy, the one who can administrate the needs of his creation, the one who can do everything, who knows everything, is the subjugator over his creation and the only absolute ruler capable to rightfully judge and to do so with complete justice. The sole creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is the creator of everything and the originator of everything from non-existence, while an individual human may assemble an item from existing parts of creation. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can bring a thing out of non-existence. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Originator of the heavens and the earth, when he decrees a matter, he only says to it be, and it is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Allah is the creator of all things, and he is over all things disposer of affairs. One may wonder why there is so much emphasis in the Quran regarding this issue, while the disbelievers at the time never denied the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or his attribute as the creator of everything. There are two reasons for it. First, the Quran is the last guiding revelation from Allah to mankind until the day of judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his eternal knowledge and wisdom knew that generations would come like our own who will be the product of an educational system which denies Allah his attribute as the creator of everything. Hence Allah emphasized the subject we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had foreknowledge of everything before creating anything and wrote preordainment in the preserved tablet. He willed to bring to creation what was preordained and he created it with the command B. Secondly, At-Tawheed al-Rububiyyah, including the belief in predestination, Al-Qadr, is part of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's lordship. All things happen by the decree of Allah. The four aspects of predestination are 1. Divine Knowledge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge encompasses everything. He knows what has occurred, what will happen, and all that which has not happened yet. He knew everything about his creation before he created them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, And with him are the keys of the unseen. None knows them except him, and he knows what is on the land and in the sea. Not a leaf falls, but that he knows it, and no grain is there within the darkness of the earth, and no moist or dry thing, but that it is written in a clear record. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said, Indeed, Allah is knower of the unseen, of the heavens and earth. Indeed, he is knowing of that within the breasts. 2. Pre-recording The belief that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recorded everything in the preserved tablet. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Do you not know that Allah knows what is in the heaven and earth? Indeed, that is in a record. Indeed, that for Allah is easy. Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu reported, that he heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, Allah decided the decrees of creation 50,000 years before he created the heavens and the earth. 3. Divine Will The belief is that no action from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or from his creation can occur without his permission. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, And your Lord creates what he wills and chooses, not for them, was the choice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said, And you do not will except that Allah wills. Indeed, Allah is ever knowing and wise. 4. The creation, the belief that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created all that exists, all the effects, attributes and actions of creation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, 
Is not he who created the heavens and the earth able to create the likes of them? Yes, it is so, and he is the knowing creator. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, He has created all things with precisely accurate planning. Also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, On the tongue of Prophet Ibrahim, Abraham alayhi salam, addressing his people, While Allah created you, and that which you do. The creation is the fourth aspect of predestination, al-qadr. Any individual who rejects, denies, or is deviant in these attributions of predestination and his lordship has rejected all four elements of it. External knowledge, the writing, the divine will, and then the creation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Indeed all things we created with predestination. Lordship is ownership. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala indicated his creation as evidence of lordship to challenge those who associate others in worship with him. This is the creation of Allah. So show me that which those whom you worship besides him have created. Nay, the Zalimun are in plain error. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said, And you will see the mountains and think them solid, but they shall pass away as the passing away of the clouds. The work of Allah, who perfected all things verily, He is well acquainted with what you do. Also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, It is Allah who has made for you the earth as a resting place, and the sky as a canopy, and has given you shape, and made your shapes beautiful and has provided for you sustenance of things pure and good. Such is Allah your Lord. So glory to Allah, the Lord of the worlds. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said, Who perfected everything which he created and began the creation of man from clay, creation of humanity. The surface meaning of the following verse may cause one with little knowledge to consider that there are other creators, which is a violation of Tawheed al rububiyyah This verse is also an indication of the necessity to gain knowledge of the Quranic language to understand our Lord. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, So blessed be Allah, the best to create. First, linguistically, the nominative adjective ahsanu modifies the nominative to become the best of creators. Many among humanity can create something in the sense of assembling or making, but among those who assemble or make, only one can be the best, and that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone as creator in lordship. The attribute of being the best among other creators is incomparable in a theological sense because the context of creation in chapter Al Mu'minun verses 12 to 15 is the creation of life out of death and then the creation of death itself in this sense what isolates allah in lordship is his ability to bring something into existence from nothing this is distinct from others who create only in the sense of assembling things together an analysis of the semantic class of the phrase best of the creators taken from the context of these verses makes this distinction clear. 1. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates life from nothing, and humanity makes or assembles from what Allah created. 2. Allah creates what He knew, wrote, and willed to come into existence. Meanwhile, human creation have defects and deliberation and is not preordained and perfect. 3. The creation of Allah is in pairs, male and female, and Allah placed inside each a gamete, which contributes with its alternate to become a new creation, a zygote, and only Allah can cause this to have life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has absolute control and sovereignty over his creation, including the end of the creation and death. While humans may lose life, and the human control of life is only perceptual, while they cannot control death. 5. Allah provides a manual 
for what he created before creating, while the human assembler develops the manual after making and still has defects. These qualities are inherent in the expression best of the creators and are essential distinctions to know our Lord and call others to him. An interesting story. At one time, an atheist professor was teaching a class that included a group of Muslim students within an educational system that promoted atheism and materialist thought under the banner of academics. By the permission of Allah, the Muslim students were well grounded in their Islamic belief system. The professor wanted to confuse them and raise doubt about Allah. He brought a jar and placed inside it pieces of dead meat and dirt and closed it very tight and he left it for three days inside the classroom. After three days, the professor opened the jar and found it full of worms. He looked at his Muslim students and said, I created worms. One of the students stood up and started interrogating the professor. She said, O oh, professor, how many worms, parasites are inside the jar? How many of them are males? And how many of them are females? And how long will they live? The point here is that the qualities of Creator which Allah has are unique to Him alone in His Lordship. These qualities, as indicated in the story, were divine knowledge, preordainment, divine will, and the ability to create life from nothing by deliberation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the manuals for what He created before bringing them into existence. Consider the sequence in chapter Surah Rahman. The Most Merciful taught the Qur'an, created man, and taught him eloquence. This order may signify that Allah spoke the Qur'an before the events which it describes were experienced by those who witnessed revelation. Ibn Abbas anhu reported, Allah sent the Qur'an down all at one time from the preserved tablet to the house of might which is in the heaven of this world. Then it came down in parts to the Messenger of Allah based upon the incidents that occurred over a period of 23 years. The reality is certainly true that revelation came as guidebook for the companions and for us before we were created. And its accuracy and efficacy in our lives are real. Moreover, the greatest virtue of the revelation is the guiding of the servant to our Lord for those who have understanding. The concept of recall. Another reality which we experience in the modern world is product recalls. Frequently, car manufacturers build a car model and after selling many fleets of it, they may find a defect in one or two parts. In such a case, they recall the parts to fix or replace them. Have you ever heard of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recalling the elements of his creation to revise or redesign? Everything in the creation of Allah is in perfect balance, precisely designed and holistically integrated at both a macro and micro level. Consider the precision of the design of our solar system. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, And the sun runs on its fixed course for a term, that is the decree of the Almighty the all-knowing, and the moon we have measured for it mansions to traverse till it returns like the old dried curved date stalk. It is not for the sun to overtake the moon, nor does the night outstrip the day. They all float, each in an orbit. Earth has been placed at a favorable average distance of 150 million kilometers, around 93 million miles from the heat of the sun, to sustain life. Any closer and humans would burn, and if any further, all life would freeze. The precision in the force of gravity is perfectly implemented to allow humanity to grow and propagate lifestyle and culture. Any increase or decrease in the force of gravity would make life as we know it burdensome or impossible to contend. The above verses also mentions the sun running on its fixed course floating in orbit, 
critics and doubters of the Qur'an have pointed to the claims in these verses are erroneous. However, recent scientific observations have shown that the sun is not in fact the center of the solar system. A new discovery claims the planets and the sun actually orbit around a common center of mass. And for the first time, a team of astronomers has pinpointed the center of the entire solar system down to within 100 meters, the most precise calculation yet. Atheists boastfully promote a theory of an accidental universe. Not only is this claim incorrect, but it is also illogical. Wahid al-Din Khan cited the American scientists Tracy Morrison, who proposed that accidental development of the universe is statistically impossible. Suppose you take 10 pennies and mark them from 1 to 10. Put them in your pocket and give them a good shake. Now try to draw them out in sequence from 1 to 10, putting each coin back in your pocket after each draw. Your chance of drawing number 1 is 1 to 10. Your chance of drawing 1 and 2 in succession is 1 in 100. Your chance of drawing 1, 2, and 3 in succession would be in a 1,000. Your chance of drawing 1, 2, 3, 4 in succession would be 1 in 10,000. And so on, until your chance of drawing from number 1 to number 10 in succession would reach the unbelievable figure of 1 chance in 10 billion. The object in dealing with so simple a problem is to show how enormously figures multiply against chance. It is logically impossible for a greater complexity such as life in the universe to happen accidentally or haphazardly. What we observe of creation must be the work of an ever-knowing, all-aware, an ever-innovating creator who decreed everything and guides every creature to all that benefits and sustains life, the sole owner of everything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, All praise is due to Allah, creator of the heavens and the earth. He who originated the universe from nothingness is the creator. He is the owner of what he created. One may say, we own things which Allah created. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will inherit everyone and everything in the end. Because after you possess material in this world, one of two things will happen. Either Allah will take it away from you or will be taken away from it by death. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not die while all of creation is perishable. Hence, he will inherit us all. Al-Akhir, Al-Warith. On judgment day and in between the two blows of the trumpet, everyone will perish. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, everything will perish, save his countenance. His is the command and unto him ye will be brought back. Without any doubt, the day will come on which Allah will ask the following questions. Where are the people who used to be kings in this world? Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Allah will grasp or hold the whole planet of earth in his hand and will roll up the heaven with his right hand and then he will say, I am the king. Where are the kings of the earth? Ponder over the saying of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Malik of the day of recompense. In an acceptable rendering from the Hafs recitation style can be the shortened A sound in Warsh style of recitation. Malik of the day of recompense. One can identify a remarkable layering of meaning in which both pronunciations of Malik and Malik are taken into consideration. Al-Malik is more comprehensive than Al-Malik with regards to the organization of the universe because the meaning of Al-Malik may exclude the action of control. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala named himself with both Al-Malik and Al-Malik and thus the meaning becomes more profound and exclusive. This exclusivity is part of monotheism and his lordship. Hence, the worst name in the sight of Allah is someone who calls himself the king of kings. Abu Huraira 
radiallahu anhu narrated that Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, The most perfidious, awful name with Allah on the day of resurrection will be that of a man calling himself Malik al-Amlak, King of Kings, the sole provider. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created everything. He knows everything and he sustains, nourishes and provides for all creation. Indeed, one of the greatest actions of the Lordship of Allah is the attribute of provision without any loss. We benefit from internalizing the belief that Allah is our sole provider. Contemplating ar razaq puts our hearts to rest and incite ourselves to sincerely rely on the providence of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, O mankind, remember the favor of Allah upon you. Is there any creator other than Allah who provides for you from the heaven and the earth? There is no deity except him. So how are you deluded? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said, Indeed, it is Allah who is the continual provider, the firm possessor of strength. These Quranic verses, ayat, are a reminder for us that Allah is the one who provides for us. Generally, we assume that provision is only for material things, especially money. The attribute of Allah's provision is immense, and it reveals that Allah is the provider of everything, including spiritual guidance and bestowment of wisdom. Provision from Allah includes all material things, such as money, food, water, air, shelter, and protection. Besides meeting our physiological needs, Allah also provides for our psychological needs. Sometimes He gives us love through the love of others. Sometimes by means of isolation and loneliness, He gifts us tranquility in a sense of His nearness. By giving us responsibilities, He fulfills our needs for autonomy and competence. We are not self-sufficient, but we rely on Him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us with a body and a soul. He sends down the rain to sustain and nourish the body, and sends down the revelation to nurture the soul. And He taught us a balance between our body and soul through asking for provisions as a means of our continuous deprivation to Him. So we always return to Him in supplication, dua. The Absolute Ruler Allah alone has the right to legislate. Logically, if Allah creates, owns and provides, then He has the right and power to legislate. In chapter Surah Al-A'raf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Indeed your Lord is Allah, who created the heavens and earth in six days, and then established himself above the throne. He covers the night with the day, chasing it rapidly. And he created the sun, the moon, and the stars, subjected by his command. Unquestionably, his is the creation and the command. Blessed is Allah, Lord of the worlds. The point of reference in this verse, ayah, is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about himself. This infers that because to him belongs all the creation, he alone has command of the right to legislate. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said, Legislation is not but for Allah. The emphasis of this point is what some call Tawheed al hakimiyah which means that Allah alone has the right to legislate. The meaning of the right of Allah is to legislate the same, whether it is known as a separate fourth category of monotheism, or through a two- or three-term categorization. Political-minded individuals championed the phrase Tawheed al hakimiyah and they classified it as a separate category based on its importance. Nevertheless, it is a part of Tawheed al rububiyyah because it is a quality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's lordship. The disbelievers affirmed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's lordship the disbeliever affirmed the lordship of Allah according to several pieces of evidence. Sheikh Salih al-Fawzan, Hafidhahullah, wrote, Even Iblis, who is the head of disbelief, said, My lord, 
for allowing me to stray, and by your glory I will certainly mislead them all. So he confessed the lordship of Allah and took an oath by his might. Similarly, all the disbelievers confess the lordship of Allah, like Abu Jahl, Abu Lahab, and other heads of disbelief. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about the polytheists, Mushrikun, and if you ask them who created them, they would surely say, Allah, so how are they deluded? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also mentions some of his qualities of lordship and the response of the polytheists to a tawheed al it is in the form of a discourse that the caller to Islam, Da'i, may invite to monotheism. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Say, in whose hand is the realm of all things? And he protects while none can protect against him. If you should know, they will say, All belongs to Allah. Say, then how are you deluded? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said, Say, who provides for you from the heaven and the earth? And who controls hearing and sight? And who brings the living out of the dead? And brings the dead out of the living? And who arranges every matter? They will say, Allah. So say, then will you not fear him? Yet, if the polytheists and rejectors acknowledge his lordship, but refuse to establish monotheism, tawheed of worship, we may invite them to consider the temporal and delicate nature of our existence. It was mentioned in part 3, chapter 1, that Ikrima bin Abu Jahl, radiallahu anhu, had been among the enemies of Islam who knew Allah as Lord, and he was from a people who recognized Tawheed, al-Rububiyya. He fled from the Muslims at sea until his ship encountered a life-threatening storm. Had he perished at sea while believing in the Lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he would have been like the Pharaoh. Pharaoh rejected the invitation of Prophet Musa, Moses alayhi salam, and persecuted the Muslims of the time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Pharaoh and his soldiers pursued them in tyranny and enmity until when drowning overtook him, he said, I believe that there is no deity except that in whom the children of Israel believe, and I am of the Muslims. Now, and you had disobeyed him before and were of the corruptors? Pharaoh's belief was incomplete. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, The people of Pharaoh were enveloped by the worst of punishment, the fire, Jahannam. They are exposed to it morning and evening. In the day the hour appears, it will be said, Make the people of Pharaoh enter the severest punishment. Ikrima, radiallahu anhu, reformed his concept around monotheism. He purified himself with an act of worship by calling out to our Lord in the storm. Furthermore, he repented as an action of Tawheed al and went to the Prophet wasallam as an action of belief of the limb. He lived the remainder of his life in service for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and died in a battle for the sake of Allah. Belief in lordship alone is insufficient. Whoever believes and affirms only the lordship of Allah does not enter Islam and will not be saved from the fire. For instance, it is known from the historians in the life of the Prophet, Sira, that the disbelievers of Mecca who persecuted the Muslims acknowledged Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's lordship. But this position did not enter them into Islam. Neither did it inviolate their blood and wealth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called them disbelievers and polytheists, mushrikun, while they admitted he alone was their creator. And Allah affirmed that they will be in the fire, Jahannam, despite their belief in his lordship. Take as an example the following verse. Indeed they who disbelieved among the people of the scripture and the polytheists will be in the fire of hell, abiding eternally therein. Those are the worst of creatures. The grouping in this verse, ayah, of disbelievers among the people of the book, Ahl al-Kitab, 
is significant. It is known that the people of the book, Ahl al-Kitab, affirmed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the creator. It did not remove them from disbelief. However, the polytheists of Mecca knew their Lord, but endorsed the worship of idols alongside him. This is a crucial point to raise when calling the people of the book Ahl al-Kitab, and it necessitates knowledge and courage. Calling those who claim Rububiyyah to establish Uluhiyyah was the mission of all the messengers. And those who associate others with Allah say, if Allah had willed, we would not have worshipped anything other than Him, neither we nor our fathers, nor would we have forbidden anything through other than Him. Thus did those do before them. So is there upon the messengers accept the duty of clear notification? And we certainly sent into every nation a messenger, worship Allah and avoid Ta'ut. And among them were those whom Allah guided, and among them were those upon whom error was deservedly decreed. So proceed, travel through the earth, and observe how was the end of the deniers. Sheikh al fawzan Hafidhahullah wrote, It becomes manifest the mistake of those writers who follow the philosopher's way when they explain monotheism to mean affirming the existence of Allah and affirming that Allah is the sustainer, etc. Allah did not send the messengers just to ask people to declare that Allah is the creator, the sustainer who gives life and causes death because this is not enough and does not save one from the punishment. While asserting the Lordship of Allah is insufficient in itself to save one from the fire, it is the ground upon which Allah demands His rights of worship upon people and is the common ground to call the hearts to return to our Lord. Monotheism, Tawheed, concerning the Lordship of Allah, the Almighty, can be achieved through the guidance of the Qur'an, which urges us all to ponder. It makes the realization of Tawheed al contingent on the recognition of monotheism concerning the Lordship of Allah, the Almighty. This is why the caller to Islam, Da'i, must emphasize the imperative to know your Lord. Chapter 3 Polytheism, Shirk, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's Lordship. The study of monotheism is incomplete without the study of its opposite, polytheism. It is a critical failure, an infidelity, and consequently a topic of importance which Allah attested to in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Verily, Allah forgives not that partners should be set up with him in worship, but he forgives except that anything else to whom he pleases. And whoever sets up partners with Allah in worship, he has indeed invented a tremendous sin. Linguistically, shirk means a partnership, sharing or associating from the Arabic roots shara Islamically, it refers to the act of assigning partners to Allah in whatever form it may take, whether implicit or explicit. The meaning in common English usage is as a transitive verb to go stealthily or to evade the performance of an obligation for the purpose of calling others to Allah. This is useful as mankind has a responsibility to fulfill in asserting monotheism implementing its benefits in our lives and calling to it with patience. Polytheism, shirk, in Rububiya is to believe that others, besides Allah, create or share control over His creation. This belief means that someone other than Allah can bring them benefit or protect from harm. A simple example of this type of polytheism is to believe an item or object brings good luck. 
people often have good luck rings or similar items they think will instigate good in their lives. Others tie unique strings around themselves or their children, believing that if they recite the Quran over the strings, the talisman will protect them from evil. However, only Allah can protect us from what we identify as evil, and we must seek His protection in ways He mentioned in the Quran. Or the means which the Prophet ﷺ taught us in the Sunnah, prophetic tradition, because seeking protection is an act of worship. Types of polytheism, shirk in Rububiya. One must identify two categories of polytheism concerning Rububiya. They are as follows. 1. Polytheism, shirk by negation, ta'til. This is to deny the existence of Allah, either explicitly or implicitly. In some cases, atheism is the expression by an individual of purported non-existence of Allah, while the reality of his existence may be internalized in the individual. In other instances, his existence is claimed, but how an individual assimilates an understanding of Allah negates his existence, such as in pantheism. This is apparent in the saying, Mother Nature, or actions based on perceived luck, divination, or astrology. Polytheism, by negation, exists in assertions of the European philosophical traditions, in those who subscribe to them, in the nihilism and infidelity that resulted. They build they build various intellectual innovations on the premise that attributes ascribed by theists to God are attributes derived either from human consciousness or from nature, and that God has no existence apart from the existence of human consciousness and of nature. In essence, this belief is the human worship of self. There are a few ancient religious systems in which God does not exist. Buddhism today has more than 500 million adherents. It is a movement that evolved from Hinduism with social reform characteristics. It was founded in the 6th century BC during the same period as Jainism. In the 3rd century BC, it became the state religion but was assimilated by Hinduism as an act to reduce the Hindu loss of social political influence. Buddha himself then became one of the idols in the Hindu pantheon. Buddhism disappeared from India but became dominant in China and other regions of Asia. Most forms of Buddhism are built on the doctrine that there is no permanent creator who superintends creation and takes care of his creatures. A doctrine of fundamental importance within Buddhist religious philosophy rather than a mere accretion acquired through historical accident. The pharaonic model is a negation of Allah by an individual claimant who has the material power and influence to install upon his or herself the rights of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran that Pharaoh negated the existence of God and claimed to Prophet Musa, Moses alayhi salam, and the people of Egypt that he was the only true Lord of all creation. He said to Prophet Musa, Moses alayhi salam, Pharaoh said, If you take a God other than me, I will surely place you among those imprisoned. And said, I am your most exalted Lord. Polytheism, shirk by association, is to believe that God or a supreme being exists, while believing that other lesser gods Spirits, mortals, heavenly bodies, or created objects share in his dominion or partner in his function. Such beliefs are commonly referred to by the theologians and philosophers as either monotheistic, having one god, or polytheistic, having more than one god. Although both forms are partnerships without right, polytheism, shirk, by association, is apparent 
and many subtle examples. 1. The Arab polytheists, Mushrikun. The polytheists of Arabia believed in Allah as the sole creator and inherited his foundation from Prophet Ibrahim, Abraham salam. But they thought that intermediaries, idols, could bring them closer to Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us that they said, We only worship them that they may bring us nearer to Allah in position. Indeed, Allah will judge between them concerning that over which they differ. Indeed, Allah does not guide he who is a liar and confirmed disbeliever. 2. Hinduism Hinduism recognizes a supreme being whom they name as Brahman. He is omnipresent, omnipotent, but impersonal and abstract to the point of being unapproachable. Assuming Brahman is a name in reference to Allah, Hinduism falls into infidelity of polytheism, shirk in Rububiyya, by describing and delegating Allah's creative, destructive, and preservative powers to a trinity of Brahma, Shiva, and Vishnu. As for Hindu, polytheism, shirk, and worship, they assert that comprehension and approach of divinity can only be through intermediaries, because Brahman is incomprehensible to human capability. Swami Sivananda said, The mind which knows the external objects through the avenues of the senses cannot know the Atman or Brahman, because Brahman is the source for the mind also, and the mind is gross, inert and finite. How can the finite know the infinite? The gross, impure mind cannot approach Brahman. Hindus use idols or lesser gods as a means of approaching an unapproachable divinity and a means of focusing in worship on what is uncontainable by the intellect and unfathomable by human reference. 3. Christianity Christianity has many permutations which divide Allah into several entities, shaking in duality or trinity. Stricter monotheistic sects identify Allah as one and indivisible, but ascribe to him a son who inherits divinity. This is, of course, polytheism, shirk. 4. Extreme Mystic Sufis The veneration of saints, awliya, is not too far removed from Hindu beliefs through their statement and actions. These extremists establish that individual saints among the most pious can create life, decree death, and govern the earth and the universal functions along with Allah. Some of these extremists believe the souls of dead saints and other righteous humans can affect the affairs of this world even after their deaths. Adherents call upon the souls of the saints to fulfill their needs, remove calamities and render aid to the supplicant. Their claim is that as individuals who are not pious, the means of approaching Allah is done through the pious, whether dead or alive. 5. Grave worshippers Grave worshippers deserve this epithet because of their veneration of the inhabitants of the grave. This deviant belief is common in Hinduism, Christianity and extreme Sufis who attribute to a human soul the divine ability to cause events in this life even from its grave. Grave worshippers call on the dead and attribute to them knowledge and ability which only Allah can possess. The dead are unable to help their own selves. As for helping the affairs of the living, Allah does not need any intermediaries to hear or respond to the cause of his supplicants. Furthermore, what the grave worshipper ascribes to the dead of sentient awareness and interaction with the living is false. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and not equal are the living and the dead. Indeed, Allah causes to hear whom he wills, but you cannot make hear those in the graves. 6. Al-Qadariyya The Qadariyya deserve the label of polytheists because they remove from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala some of his attributes and ascribe it to humanity. This is a deviation in the area of preordainment. Their methodology in the first consists of negating preordainment over the actions of the servant, and they say that human desire and ability are independent of the ability of Allah. Their head was Ma'bad ibn Abdullah al-Juhani from Kufa in the last part of the praised era, the era of the first three praised generations. He learned denial of predestination, al-Qadr, from a Majan, Majusi, a man from al-Basra. The Qadariya were two main groups that become more than 22 sects. One group denies Allah's knowledge, and the other believes that everyone creates his own acts. This is contrary to what Allah said, while Allah created you and that which you do. To Allah belongs everything, the good and that which we identify as bad. They have been described as similar to the Majans, Majusi, because of the duality which they use to describe the good and evil from preordainment. 7. People who claim the knowledge of the unseen. The claim of knowledge of the unseen is an act of polytheism, shirk, because an individual ascribes for his or herself an attribute that only Allah can have. They have given themselves some part of divinity. The Prophet ﷺ described involvement with a fortune teller as an affront to the natural order, and he disassociated himself. He said, Whoever has intercourse with a menstruating woman or with a woman in her rare, or who goes to a fortune teller and believes what he says, he has disbelieved in that which was revealed to Muhammad. This person has earned a share of disbelief by transgressing what Allah affirmed in the Quran, that the knowledge of the unseen, ghayb, is exclusive to him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Say, none in the heavens and earth knows the unseen except Allah, and they do not perceive when they will be resurrected. Unseen refers to knowledge of the created things that we cannot see in this life, such as angels, and knowledge of the unseen, future, which belongs only to Allah. The claim of having knowledge of the unseen is so serious that if a Muslim consults an individual who claims this attribute, his or her worship may be nullified. The Prophet ﷺ said, Whoever goes to a fortune teller and asks him about something, his prayer will not be accepted for forty nights. This warning comes in a statement that does not contain the condition that the Muslim asks and believes the fortune teller. 8. The Belief in the Stars Zayd bin Khalid radiallahu anhu, reported, from the Prophet ﷺ that Allah said, This morning some of my servants believe in me and some disbelieve. As for the one who said, We got rain by the bounty and mercy of Allah, he is a believer in me and a disbeliever in the stars. But as for the one who said, We got rain by virtue of such and such a star, he is a disbeliever in me and a believer in the stars. 9. Worship of Jinn Allah referred to the crime of establishing the worship of jinn as a partner alongside the worship of Allah in the following verses, ayat. On the day he gathers them all together, he will say to the angels, Was it you these people worshipped? They will reply, May you be exalted. You are our supporter against them. Really, they worship the jinn. Most of them believed in them. 10. Other forms 
Many other acts of forms of worship are considered part of polytheism because of violation of Tawheed al rububiyyah such as reading horoscopes, coffee cup readings, palm readings, and belief in luck or omens. In the absence of knowledge, unfortunately, every culture produced its own set of mediums which indicate their polytheism, shirk, and Allah's lordship. The monotheistic position. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Allah has not taken any son, nor has there ever been with him any deity. If there had been, then each deity would have taken what it created, and some of them would have sought to overcome others. Exalted is Allah above what they describe concerning him. This exceptional argument has bright and precise wording. The true God must have the attributes of creating and doing, giving benefit to his servants, and protecting the servant from harm. If there were another God with Allah sharing his kingdom, then it too would be creating and doing. In this case, the partnership would be unacceptable. A power struggle would ensue in which one would be dominant, or one would withdraw with his part of creation, as the kings of the earth do when retreating and fortifying the lands they control. Then this scenario requires one of three possibilities, that each god withdraws with his creation and authority. Two, that one of them defeats the others. Three, that any and all lesser creators would be under the control of one who does with them as he wills, and the others would have no say in the matter. One would be their god, and they would be his servants, lorded over and subdued in every sense of the word. Such possibilities of partnerships or hierarchies in divinity, which are suggested in the man-made and deviant religions mentioned above, would certainly result in chaos, disorder, and instability in all of creation. The creation, however, has an order, intricate balance, and no uncertainty. Instead, everything is perfectly administered with a singular purpose. Administration of the affairs of the creation is evidence of the might and power of Allah. It is also evidence that there is no God of creation other than Him. The creator of the universe is one, Al-Khaliq. There is no Lord other than Him and no God equal to Him. Just as the world can't have two similar creators, it is also inconceivable that there would be two gods to be worshipped. Assertion of oneness of lordship necessitates that we worship our Lord without associating any partners in worship of Him. Among the greatest means of securing and protecting Tawheed al-Rububiyyah and establishing monotheism, Tawheed of worship is to know and use our Lord's names and understand His attributes. Part 4 Allah's Names and Attributes Chapter 1 Calling to the Names and Attributes A caller to Allah, Da'i, should begin with attracting those who are sincere by teaching them about our Lord. They should employ their intellectual capacity to prove the existence of the Lord, the Creator, the Sovereign, the Disposer of the Affairs, and the Absolute Ruler over his creation. After acknowledging his singular lordship, they should invite the non-Muslims to the imperative of worshipping only our Lord. Now the next step is to turn to the revelation, to secure the turning hearts into submission to our Lord. The caller to Islam must know more about Allah through his names and attributes. Growth is a word that we usually quote in several contexts, such as growth in wealth, children, and status growth. But there is a vital forgotten context of growth, 
our knowledge of Allah. The most crucial thing in this world is to grow in our knowledge of Allah, as this is the lasting benefit. The greatest value should be given to the greatest of knowledge. Sheikh Saleh al-Usaymi rahimahullah wrote, The amount of knowledge that a person gains is dependent upon the amount that his heart reveres it and honors it. This is a reason why we first call to Tawheed al rububiyyah to find the sincere hearts which are ready to gain knowledge of Allah. Imam Nawawi rahimahullah said in his book, Etiquette of the Qur'an, The heart is made wholesome for knowledge, just as the earth is made wholesome for cultivation. Actualizing the names and attributes of Allah in our daily lives is the best way to grow our knowledge of Him. We must affirm what Allah and His Messenger وسلم, affirmed from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from His names and the attributes. We only negate what Allah and His Messenger negated from the names and attributes of Allah. We must strive to understand the names and attributes of Allah the way the Prophet وسلم, and his companions understood them. We must place the names of Allah into action by imploring, exalting, glorifying, and invoking Him through His beautiful names. Finally, we must remember that each of the names of Allah has a respective servitude relevant to its meaning. We must submit ourselves to these meanings and implement this in our lives. The question arises, why must we learn, know, and grow our knowledge of our Lord? Importance of the Names and Attributes Below is a list of a few reasons out of many why we take a scientific approach towards the names and attributes. 1. We are about to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are all on an inevitable journey to meet Allah, the Creator, the Glorified and Exalted. We believe this meeting, as it is declared in the Qur'an and Sunnah, prophetic tradition, that we must believe in it without any shadow of a doubt. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, O man, verily, you are returning towards your Lord with your deeds and actions, good or bad, a sure returning, so you will meet, that is, the results of your deeds which you did. Adi bin Hatim radiallahu anhu reported that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, There will be none among you but his Lord will speak to him and there will be neither any interpreter nor any screen between them to screen. The question here, should we get to know Allah, the one we are about to meet? Is this not important? 2. The purpose of the whole creation Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the entire universe and subdued its elements to us to come to an explicit knowledge that He is Allah, the all-knowing, all able, all wise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, It is Allah who has created seven heavens, and of the earth, the like of them. His command descends among them, so you may know that Allah is over all things competent, and that Allah has encompassed all things in knowledge. 3. The knowledge of Allah is the essence of monotheism, tawheed, Knowing his actions of lordship, creation, sustainment, nourishing, and rule, his names and attributes is the foundation on which we built our conviction. This is because the unique qualities of his actions of lordship, names, and attributes, necessities that we worship him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, And those beings whom some invoke besides God, have it not in their power, to intercede on Judgment Day for any but such as have in their lifetime borne witness to the truth and have been aware that God is one and unique. 4. The Foundation of the Knowledge of Islam If we took 
at the corpus of knowledge in Islam, we find it has two main parts. One, knowing Allah, which means knowing Him based on what He revealed about Himself, believing it with a full acceptance and acting upon that knowledge. Philosophers went astray in this area by using their intellect to redefine the names and attributes of Allah. Two, worshipping Allah, which means to worship Him with sincerity, truthfulness, and loving Him while following the method of worship He revealed for our guidance. Extreme Sufis went astray in this area. They innovated their own culture of worshipping Allah based on emotions, dreams, and the esoteric which often contradicts what has been revealed. There is a clear connection between knowing Allah and worshipping Him. The one who knows Allah with the correct knowledge will have the path of acceptable worship facilitated with ease. 5. 30 Commandments in the Qur'an To know Allah Allah gifted us with more than 30 direct commands to know Him. These verses are tools for contemplation and avenues for engaging non-Muslims in learning about their Lord. As an example, Allah said, Know that Allah is severe in penalty, and that Allah is forgiving and merciful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said, Inform my servants that I am the forgiving, the merciful. 6. The noblest of all science. Studying Allah's names is the noblest of all sciences, because what dictates the nobility of science is the virtue of the subject matter. The subject matter here is Allah, the one who created us and provides for us. And there is no nobler subject than this one. Of the most important of all subjects is his spoken word. Therefore, those inviting others to Allah should be using the Qur'an. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intended the Qur'an to be his words organized to open hearts. Some key aspects of the science are a contemplation of Surah Al-Fatiha, the greatest chapter, Surah of the Qur'an, the central theme of which is monotheism, Ayatul Kursi, the greatest verse in the Qur'an. The focus of this verse is on the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Surah Al-Ikhlas equals a third of the Qur'an. This chapter, Surah, focuses exclusively on understanding the nature of Allah. It is considered one-third of the Qur'an because technically one-third of the content of the Qur'an is information about Allah. Therefore, this chapter, Surah, has summarized that content. Aisha radiallahu anha narrated the story of the companion who loved this chapter. Aisha radiallahu anha related that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam placed a man in command of an expedition. He would finish every recitation with Qul huwa Allahu Ahad, Surah Al-Ikhlas. When they returned, the companions mentioned this to the Prophet. So he said, ask him why he does that. He said, because it is the description of the most merciful, Sifat al-Rahman, and I love to recite it. The Prophet ﷺ said, inform him that Allah loves him. 7. Forgetting Allah will lead to forgetting oneself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, And be not like those who forgot Allah. So he made them forget themselves. Those are the defiantly disobedient. The central concept of the above verse is if someone forgets Allah, it will result in neglect of self and loss of reward in this life and the next. This is the wisdom for which chapter Al-Hashr closes the final three verses with a reminder of numerous names and attributes of Allah. When we remember Allah is Almighty, we will see ourselves as vulnerable. And if we know Allah to be the richest, we will see ourselves as impoverished. If we know Allah to be the possessor of pride and dignity, we will find humility. Allah, the possessor of pride 
and dignity said, He is Allah, other than whom there is no deity, knower of the unseen and the witnessed. He is the entirely merciful, especially merciful. He is Allah, other than whom there is no deity, the sovereign, the pure, the perfection, the bestower of faith, the overseer, the exalted in might, the compeller, the superior, exalted as Allah, above whatever they associate with him. He is Allah, the creator, the inventor, the fashioner. To him belongs the best names. Whatever is in the heavens and earth is exalting him, and he is the exalted in might, the wise. 8. Calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah instructed us to invoke him using his names, and we can praise him as well using his names. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, For Allah, there are the most beautiful names, so call him by them, and leave those who deviate in the matter of his names. They shall be recompensed for what they have been doing. The best example of how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used the names and attributes of Allah is in the supplication of al-istikhara, which refers to seeking advice and guidance from Allah when making decisions. It is the best manifestation of how the Prophet ﷺ taught us to associate the proper name with the respective request. O oh Allah, I consult you as you are the all-knowing and appeal to you to give me power as you are omnipotent and ask you for your great favor, for you have power, but I don't, and you have knowledge, but I don't have, and you know all hidden matters. O oh Allah, if you know that this matter is good for me in my religion, my livelihood, and for my life in the hereafter, or said for my present and future life, then do it for me. And if you know that this matter is evil, not good for me in my religion, my livelihood, and for my life in the hereafter, or said for my present and future life, then keep it away from me, and take me away from it, and choose what is good for me, wherever it is, and please me with it. The Prophet added that then the person should name mention his need, matter. One can see that learning the names of Allah will facilitate the use of the right name, which best fits the need, and this is the correct etiquette to approach Allah and the most beautiful means by which to obtain our needs. The beauty of it is that supplicating is a form of remembrance of Allah, and it is the best way to praise Him through His names and attributes which He has affirmed for Himself. 9. Means to invite others to Islam. Da'wah. Focus on the names and attributes of Allah while inviting others to Islam is the noblest act one may do. Living in the West is a golden opportunity for many of us to call others to Islam. As mentioned above, the invitation of an atheist to Islam must begin with establishing the pieces of evidence for the existence of Allah. Invitation to someone from the people of the book begins with Tawheed al rububiyyah and his names and attributes. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu reported that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent Mu'ad radiallahu anhu to Yemen and he said to him, You will go to the people of the scripture, Jews and Christians. So when you reach there, invite them to testify that la ilaha illallah, none has the right to be worshipped but Allah and that Muhammad is Allah's messenger, Islamic monotheism. And if they obey you in that, tell them that Allah has enjoined on them five salat, prayer, in each day and night. And if they obey you in that, tell them that Allah has made it obligatory on them to pay the charity, zakat, which will be taken from the rich among them and given to the poor among them. If they obey you in that, then avoid taking the best of their possessions and be afraid of the curse of an oppressed person 
because there is no screen between his invocation and Allah. 10. A means to enter paradise. Learning the names of Allah will bring abundant reward in the hereafter. The Prophet ﷺ said, Allah has 99 names, 100 less one, and he who memorized them all by heart will enter paradise. To count something means to know it by heart. 11. To avoid deviation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded us to avoid deviation regarding our understanding of his names and attributes. The only way for us to do so is to learn the different types of deviation and how someone may end up falling into error. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in chapter Surah Al-A'raf, And to Allah belong the best names, so invoke him by them and leave the company of those who practice deviation concerning his names. They will be recompense for what they have been doing. Occupy oneself with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names. There is a heavily circulated narration believed to be a hadith qudsi, meaning a statement related to having come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whoever is diverted by remembering me from asking of me, I would grant him the best of what I grant those asking. The account is inauthentic according to the many of the experts of narration. The scholars, ulama, have degraded this narration because the surface meaning of the content appears to misrepresent the concept of remembrance of Allah, which is a form of invocation in this context. The surface meaning suggests that supplication is less virtuous than remembering. However, on the contrary, the narration emphasizes the significance of praising Allah through his names and attributes. Of course, the adequate understanding of these names and attributes will undoubtedly increase the reverence and exaltation we have in our hearts towards Allah when articulating them during the supplication. Secondly, remembrance of his names while expecting the best from him may be more powerful for the seeker than asking from him without referring to his unique attributes. Consider what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, the most beautiful names belong to Allah, so call on him by them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells his servants to ask him by his beautiful names. This manner of asking is superior to the supplication which is bereft of his praise. Below are three pieces of evidence to establish that simply praising Allah through his names and attributes is a form of supplication. 1. The supplication on the day of Arafah. The Prophet ﷺ said, The best of supplications is the supplication of the day of Arafah, and the best of what I and the Prophets before me have said is, None has the right to be worshipped but Allah alone, without partner. To him belongs all that exists and to him belongs the praise, and he is powerful over all things. The significance of this piece of evidence is that the statement the Prophet ﷺ quoted is not in the form of what would be known as the supplication of request. It is a statement of remembrance invoking Allah by reference to five of his names. Yet, the Prophet ﷺ inferred that it is the best of supplications at Arafah. It supports the meaning of the Hadith Qudsi, whoever is diverted by making remembrance of me from asking of me, I would grant him the best of what I grant those asking. 2. The supplication of distress. The supplication, one should say at times of distress, according to the Sunnah, prophetic tradition, is not in the form of a supplication of request. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu said that Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to say at times of distress, none has the right to be worshipped but Allah, the majestic, the most forbearing. None has the right to be worshipped but Allah, the Lord of the heavens and the earth, and the Lord of the tremendous throne. Again, the virtues of calling these words when in distress are consistent with the meaning 
of the Hadith Qudsi, whoever is diverted by making remembrance, dhikr, of me, from asking of me, I would grant him the best of what I grant those asking. This stresses the virtue of calling out to Allah using his names, expecting the best from him, in the knowledge that he is aware of the servant's needs, and he responds to the one who worships him. 3. The Supplication Dua of Prophet Yunus Jonah salam. The supplication of Prophet Yunus is a third example of the virtues of remembering the names and attributes of Allah and the preference of this upon the one in need. Prophet Yunus salam, called out in distress from the darknesses, There is no deity except you. Exalted are you. Indeed, I have been of the wrongdoers. Now we understand the fact that when we praise Allah using his names and attributes, it is a type of supplication because technically Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows our needs. So we do not have to name them. Allah knows what we need even if what we ask of him differs. Sometimes we ask Allah to give us things which will be of harm to us in the long term, like wealth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, And if Allah had extended excessively provision for his servants, they would have committed tyranny throughout the earth. But he sends it down in an amount which he wills. Indeed, he is of his servants acquainted and seeing. If one takes time and exerts their efforts to understand the names and attributes of Allah, it is to be considered a form of worship, very similar to supplicating. Now that we understand this, we must avoid deviation in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names and attributes when calling upon Him. Because worship must be according to the Qur'an and Sunnah. Learning the names and attributes of Allah is a gate to remembering, glorifying and magnifying Him with a deep understanding of these names and attributes. The virtue in striving to achieve through remembering Allah by his names is exemplified in a story of Prophet Musa, Moses salam, who spoke to Allah at Mount Sinai for the first time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded him to go to the Pharaoh to call him to Islam. Prophet Musa, Moses salam, asked Allah for four things to enable him and his brother to glorify and remember Allah and to increase their remembrance of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us, Go to Pharaoh. Indeed, he has transgressed. Moses said, My Lord, expand for me my breast with assurance and ease for me my task and untie the knot from my tongue that they may understand my speech and appoint for me a minister from my family. Harun, my brother, Increase through him my strength, and let him share my task, that we may exalt you much, and remember you much. Indeed, you are of us ever seeing. Allah said, You have been granted your request, O Musa, Moses. In the next statement, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala advises Prophet Musa salam, to continue praising and magnifying him, and he will respond by providing for the Prophet salam, without the premise of him mentioning his needs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, When we inspired your mother with that which we inspired saying, Put Musa, the child, into the tabut, a box, a case or a chest, and put it into the river Nile. Then the river shall cast it up on the bank, and there an enemy of mine and an enemy of his shall take him. And I endued you with love from me, so that you may be brought up under my eye. When your sister went and said, Shall I show you who will nurse him? So we restored you to your mother, that she might cool her eyes and not grieve. Then you did kill a man, but we saved you from great distress and tried you with a massive trial. Then you stayed several years with the people of Madian. You came here according to the fixed term I ordained for you, O Musa, Moses, and I have istana'atuka for myself.
Chapter Two: Concepts in Faith. Iman. The previous chapter presented several sources of motivation for Muslims to engage in growing their knowledge about the names and attributes of Allah. This chapter expounds on two significant reasons why our understanding must have the correct theological basis, without which the names and attributes become obstacles away from the straight path. Those two reasons are one, the names and the attributes of Allah are the one of the means to enter paradise, Jannah. Two, the proper understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names and attributes will protect us from falling into deviation. They are the means to enter paradise, Jannah. Our goal of paradise has one path which relies on the expectation of the best from Allah. He has not abandoned us or made the narrow path difficult. Rather, Allah has given us many means of understanding Him so that we might perfect our worship and improve our hearts to meet Him. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu narrated, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah has 99 names, 100 less one, and He who memorize them all by heart, will enter paradise. To count something means to know it by heart. This narration, hadith, may cause those with poor understanding to limit the names of Allah to 99. This is an example of why a student should be guided on the path of knowledge by a scholar. The first point is that counting something does not limit its volume. The verb ahsaha, which is normally rendered as count, can be seen as a verb with continuity. In that sense, continuing to count means to secure without restriction or actualization, such as in the phrase count your pennies, which means to save and continue to accumulate. The proper translation in this connotation is to actualize these names in our lives by using them and keep on increasing their use until they are well known and assimilated. Enumeration of the names. We know for a fact that the names are far more numerous than 99 just by counting those which are mentioned in the revelation. We also know from other accounts that the names of Allah are immeasurably extensive. The following are two pieces of evidence to support this statement. 1. Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu reported that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, There is no one among you who, when he is stricken with distress and grief, says, But Allah will remove his distress and his grief and will give him joy instead. O Allah, I am your servant, son of your servant, and son of your maid servant. My forelock is in your hand. Your command over me is forever executed, and your decree over me is just. I ask you by every name belonging to you, which you named yourself with, or you taught to any of your creation, or revealed in your book, or you have preserved in the knowledge of the unseen with you, that you make the Qur'an the life of my heart, in the light of my breast, and a departure for my sorrow, and a release for my anxiety. Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, said concerning this narration, This, the text of the supplication, indicates that Allah has more than 99 names. In fact, the number of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names are unknown to us and known only to Him alone. 2. There is a lengthy narration, hadith, regarding the great intercession, Shafa'a, on the Day of Judgment, Yawm Al-Qiyamah, the Prophet wasallam said, I will ask for my Lord's permission, and it will be given, and then He will reveal to me to praise Him with such praises as I do not know now. So I will praise Him with those praises, and will fall down 
prostrate before him. Then it will be said, O Muhammad, raise your head and speak, for you will be listened to, and ask, for you will be granted your request, and intercede, for your intercession, shafa'a, will be accepted. Those who are unskilled in interpreting the divine texts may be confused when there is an apparent contradiction, like the case we have here. We have multiple narrations regarding the matter. One narration says his names are 99, and the other says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names are immeasurably extensive. But the two can be reconciled. Sheikh ibn Uthaymeen rahimahullah said that the narration of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu does not limit Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to 99 names. Rather, it means that whoever learns these 99 names of his names will enter paradise. This is like when the Arabs say, I have 100 horses which I have prepared for battle. This does not mean that the speaker has only these 100 horses. Rather, these 100 are prepared for this purpose. Out of the totality of the number of names of Allah has, we might actualize what has been revealed of them, and by His mercy, enter paradise. We have another controversy regarding this subject. In one narration, in Sunan al-Tirmidhi, there is a report of 99 definitive names. Numerous scholars of the narration are of the opinion that they are not from one inclusive narration, but one of the sub-narrators Al-Walid bin Muslim and Abdul Malik bin Muhammad have added names from various Quranic verses and narrations. The narration is considered weak by most, although the author of Fatul Majid wrote that it is Hassan Gharib and Ibn Hajar rahimahullah, classed the chain found in Tirmidhi to be the closest chain to authenticity. The content is correct in that all of the names mentioned are in other sources of the Quran and narrations. However, the narration is problematic because by the standards of narration science, it is unacceptable and also because the content suggests Allah has only 99 names. These 99 names are culturally pervasive. These names are accepted by the masses, which may keep them hanging on the walls of family rooms or added at the end of the Quranic scriptures, but they are not authentic, definitive 99 names of our Lord. Numerous scholars have identified more than 99 or 100 to 104 names or more using various systems of classifying the acceptability of evidence. Therefore, we must continue to encourage the Muslims to understand, actualize, and implement all of the authentic names of Allah to coincide with the intention of reaching 99. If we struggle with this goal, we may enter paradise by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, insha'Allah. This struggle is similar to our resolve in Jannah in identifying Laylatul Qadr, night of power, which scholars agree may be any one of the last ten nights of the month of Ramadan. To be sure, we observed that auspicious night we must strive throughout the last ten nights of the month, and not just the odd nights or the twenty-seventh night. Incipient Deviation il had The proper understanding of the names and attributes of Allah will protect us from deviation. il had Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the word il had in chapter Al-A'raf, verse 108, which has been quoted throughout this book in different contexts. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, And to Allah belong the names. So invoke him by them and leave the company of those who practice deviation concerning his names. They will be recompensed for what they have been doing. Deviation is the opposite of the proper understanding of the names of Allah. Like polytheism is the opposite of monotheism. 
It is essential to first understand the negation before the affirmation to clarify the expected scope of understanding. If we look at the universal declaration of faith, there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah, it begins with negation. So, the individual can close the door on what could nullify monotheism before explicating the rightful qualities. Likewise, it is necessary to understand what will distort or deviate the names and attributes of Allah. Owing to the nobility and great importance of the subject of the belief system, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, gave more considerable attention to explaining it than he did with any other matter. For this reason, we find that the companions did not disagree concerning any of these matters. At the same time, there was some permissible disagreement amongst them concerning some of the religious rulings and legal ordinances. After the death of the Prophet wasallam, the Muslim community started declining from theological clarity and certainty. The first subject the Muslims began to debate was the nature and reality of faith. This was incipient in those of poor constitution or weak scholarship, even though the Qur'an and the Sunnah clearly defined the Islamic belief system and scholars of the first three praise generations remained firmly grounded. The question of the nature of faith was discussed in the opening sections of this book to define what belief in our Lord entailed. As Islam spread across the greater expanses of geography, the various ideologies of those who reverted to Islam affected and influenced the thinking of Muslim society. Consequently, those who were not well guided started entertaining the idea of redefining a semantic subject like the definition of faith. Throughout history, the innovators belittled and de-emphasized perpetrating deviation in properly comprehending and interpreting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names and attributes following the path of the righteous predecessors from among the first three praise generations. It is imperative to possess the proper knowledge about our Lord and never compromise it in any form or shape under manipulative unity calls. Scholars must emphasize the devastating consequences of deviation regarding the understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names and attributes through highlighting and detailing the following facts. The subject of knowing our Lord through his names and attributes is regarded as the foundation of monotheism. Monotheism has two main branches. The first is knowing Allah and the second is singling out in our actions. Consequently, we find the most significant chapter of the Qur'an is Al-Fatiha, which is centered around Allah's names and attributes. Also, the most significant Qur'anic verse is one known by the verse of the throne, Ayatul Kursi, which comprises 19 of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names and attributes. Furthermore, chapter Al-Ikhlas equals a third of the entire Qur'an. The Universal Declaration of Faith states that there is no deity worthy of our worship except Allah. It begins with negation, so the individual can close the door on what could nullify monotheism before explicating the rightful qualities. Likewise, it is necessary to understand what will distort or deviate us from the proper understanding of Allah's names and attributes before we affirm them. The following three historical disputes are evidence that the first generations of Muslims, namely the companions and their successors, took the subject of negating, denying, distorting or manipulating Allah's names and attributes with utmost 
seriousness and they never tolerated the perpetrators. These three incidents display the companions and their successors' consistent position to those who attempted to manipulate the subject of Allah's names and attributes. 1. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu an's position of the negator of predestination, al-Qadr. The doctrine of the predestination is based primarily on the belief in Allah's beautiful names and attributes such as divine knowledge, writing, divine will, and the divine ability to create, hence denial of any of these attributes will nullify our belief in predestination. Early Muslims denied Allah's prior knowledge of what happens, and they claimed that Allah only knows things after occurring, which incited the following response by Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anhu. It is narrated on the authority of Yahya bin Ya'mur radiallahu anhu that the first man who deviated from predestination was a man in Basra named Ma'bad al-Juhani. Yahya radiallahu anhu and Humayd bin Abdul Rahman Himyari radiallahu anhu set out for pilgrimage or Umrah and said, Should it so happen that we meet one of the companions we shall ask him about what is talked about divine decree. They met Abdullah bin Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu anhu while he was entering the mosque. Yahya radiallahu anhu said, Abu Abdul Rahman, there have appeared some people in our land who recite the Quran and pursue knowledge. Such people claim that Allah does not ordain any such thing as a divine decree and events. Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anhu said, When you happen to meet such people, tell them that I have nothing to do with them and they have nothing to do with me. And surely they are in no way responsible for my faith. Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anhu swore by Allah, if any of them does not believe in the divine decree, had with him gold equal to the bulk of of the mountain Uhud and spent it in the way of Allah, Allah would not accept it unless the man affirmed his faith in the divine decree. Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anhu then reported the narration of angel Jibril, Gabriel alayhi salam, which affirms the correct belief and predestination. 2. Imam Malik rahimahullah's position on divinity, attributes of Allah, Affirmed, modality unknown. Abdullah bin Nafi'ah, rahimahullah, reported, Malik, rahimahullah, was asked about the saying of Allah Almighty, the most merciful rose above the throne. The man said, how is his rising? Malik, rahimahullah, said, the rising is acknowledged, its modality is unknown, and asking about it is an innovation. I see you are a man who intended evil with this question. Ibn Abdul Barr, rahimahullah, said, The people of Sunnah, prophetic tradition, agreed upon affirming the divine attributes as related in the book and the Sunnah, interpreting them as reality and not as a metaphor, except that they do not ask how the modality of any of that is. 3. Imam Ahmad's Inquisition Present-day Muslims may periodically hear about the saga of the creation of the Qur'an, which was widespread in the Muslim world in the 3rd and 4th century at the hands of Jad ibn Dirham and Jaham. And al-Jaham ibn Safwan, heads of Jahmiya sect, however, they never connect the tale of Allah's names and attributes. The Jahmiya sect stated that Allah does not speak, that the Qur'an is created, and that he did not speak to Musa, nor does he ever speak. Allah created a talk and a speech. Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, realized the gravity of the saga and stood firm against it, enduring all types of chastisement at the hands of the imperial power, the Abbasid.
who adopted the distorted and misleading position of the early Jahmiya sect's position. Imam Ahmad rahimahullah argued that the Quran is part of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge must be co-eternal with God. Deviation and its types. Linguistically, ilhad refers to inclination, to turn aside and to deviate. It is used in this and other context to denote inclining towards some falsehood. Deviation suggests a fatal error. Technically, deviation from the belief system concerning the names of Allah is to deviate from the correct beliefs concerning them. The correct understanding of Ahlus Sunnah wal Jama'ah is to refer issues of the belief system to what was revealed to the Prophet وسلم, and the explanation of revelation from him and his companions. They believed that attributes of Allah are actual and not representational. They are true attributes and free from imperfections or deficiencies. His attributes are not similar to the creation and there is no resemblance or similitude even when a common linguistic referent may be used. The correct belief in Allah's names and attributes are as follows. We affirm whatever names and attributes Allah has established for himself in his book and we affirm whatever the Messenger وسلم, described of him. The affirmation must be without deviation, whether subtle or intellectually intriguing. We affirm his attributes without the following. 1. Negation 2. Distortion 3. Corrupt interpretation 4. Questioning their nature and reality 5. Making resemblance and likeness to creation There are four major classes of deviation. 1. Negation, rejection and denial It means to negate, reject or deny some or any of Allah's names and attributes. The people of ignorance use to reject the name Ar-Rahman from the names of Allah because it was culturally incongruous to them. Another error or negation is to recognize the name but deny the attribute it infers. The people of innovation say, Allah is a Samir, all hearer, but without some hearing. An example relevant to calling others to Islam in the West are people of the book, who also claim that God is one, but without giving him the unique qualities of monotheism. Who? Designations of names without evidence. It means to refer names to Allah which he did not affirm for himself. This is considered deviation because the names and attributes of Allah are derived from the Quran and the Sunnah. No one can assert or deny distinguishing characteristics or nominations of Allah without evidence from revelation. It is impermissible for anyone to designate a name to Allah which he did not assert for himself. For example, philosophers have named Allah the actual cause. The Masons have named Allah the great architect of the universe. And Christians call him the father to distinguish Allah from other embodiments of shared divinity to which they profess. 3. Making resemblance of likeness with the creation. Tamthil means to ascribe qualities of the creation to the names which Allah asserted for himself. It is considered deviation as well. Ibn Uthaymeen said, Whoever believes that the names of Allah denotes likening of Allah to his creation, then he has made the words of Allah and his messenger infirm unbelief. This is unbelief because it is a rejection of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said. There is nothing like him. He is the all-hearing, the all-seeing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said, Do you know of anyone equal to him? Al-Khuza'i rahimahullah said, Whoever likened Allah to his creation, then he has disbelieved. And whoever denied the attributes by which Allah qualified himself with, then he has also disbelieved. And the names by which Allah named himself 
as well as the attributes by which he qualified himself, will not be called tashbih, declaring Allah to be like his creation. This infers a correct middle position, wherein we do not refer to the attribute of Allah to be like an attribute of a human. Neither do we deny the attribute of Allah to remove it from any possible resemblance to a human attribute. 4. Designating the names of Allah to the Created The pagan Arabs were notorious for committing this error. They rendered the names Allah, Al-Aziz and Al-Mannan into names of their idols as Allat, al uzza and Al-Manat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, So have you considered Allat and al uzza and Manat the third, the other one? The basis is that this is considered deviation, is that the names of Allah are particular to him. Ibn Uthaymin rahimahullah said, It is not allowed to ascribe the meaning denoting these names to any created being for the sake of offering him that which only Allah deserves from worship. Historical Evolution of Deviation We must emphasize that the subject of predestination is associated with the matter of Allah's names and attributes. Predestination was described above as having four categories, the knowledge, the writing, the divine will, and the creation. These four categories are related to the attributes of Allah. The denial of predestination denies some or all these four categories. Therefore, the response of the scholars of the three praise generations to deviation from predestination and other early deviations of belief system was to organize and teach the correct understanding of the names and attributes of Allah. According to Muslim historians, the first Muslim to deny predestination was an Iraqi convert from Christianity named Abu Yunus Sinbuya or Abu Yunus al Asawari. Christianity in its time was infected by denial of predestination because of the Hellenic influence of the European philosophers. Sinbuya later reverted back to Christianity but not before infecting his student Ma'bad bin Khalid al-Juhani from al-Basra. Ma'bad spread the teachings of his master until he was stopped as he met his demise by execution, which alone tells us the gravity of his deviation. During that time, the younger companions of the Prophet wasallam, who remained alive, like Abdullah ibn Umar, radiallahu anhu and Abdullah bin Abi Awfa radiallahu anhu advised the people not to attend to the funeral of Ma'bad. That also tells us the seriousness of his deviation as the companions shunned those who deviated from the belief in predestination. Philosophical innovations in the doctrine of free will continued to find new supporters which in part lead to spreading the denial that Allah has knowledge of what he created. One of the aspects of predestination, Al-Qadr. Ghailan bin Muslim from Damascus studied under Ma'bad and championed the cause of free will until he has brought before Caliph Umar bin Abdul Aziz rahimahullah. He recanted his beliefs publicly, but on the Caliph's death, he again resumed teaching free will. The spreading philosophy of free will not only led a reinterpretation of the Quran-based Neoplatonic philosophy, but also an open denial of some of the attributes of Allah, like his seeing and hearing. Jam bin Safwan inherited the torch of the Hellenic method and promoted it until his execution by Nasr bin Sayyar in 743 CE. From the above historical background and the evolution of deviation in Allah's names and attributes, we can specify three elements that contributed greatly to the spread of corrupt beliefs in later generations. 1. The corrupt rulers. 
early generations of Muslims organically resisted the growth of innovation because they lived closer to the time of the companions. Evidence from the Quran and Sunnah was embodied in the culture that they nurtured. Early leadership was quick to arrest the spread of deviant teachings by corporal or capital punishment. Individuals such as Abu Yunus bin Buya, Ma'bad bin Khalid al-Juhani, Ghailan bin Muslim, and Jaham bin Safwan were managed as criminals of the most catastrophic proportion. In later generations, the leader supported and encouraged research into philosophy and rhetoric and even persecuted the people of the Sunnah for opposing the innovations, Bid'ah. 2. Decentralization Early generations united behind their caliph, based on an understanding of opposition to division. The early community, Ummah, was centralized around Medina. The Sunnah was standardized in Medina, and its students were dispatched from Medina to call mankind to Islam. The affairs of the people were united around the inherited leadership in Medina. The people of the Sunnah eschewed, rebelling against leadership, even when the leadership, after the first four righteous caliphs, decayed to brutality, because the understanding was to unite upon the Sunnah in patience and perseverance. After the Umayyad dynasty gained the reins of power, internal pressures and sectarian resistance grew. Persians and other groups began to contribute to complex political machinations which were not based on the Sunnah, partly because of resistance to xenophobic Arab favoritism. Foreign concepts of philosophy were used as rallying points to manipulate the political emergence of decentralized power. Special interest groups began to write theology that enforced Machiavellian manipulators of regional powers and changing confederacies. 3. Abandoning knowledge Early generations were closer to the origins of knowledge. The companions lived amongst revelation. The tabi'un learned about the revelation. Their students documented and organized, but those that came afterward abandoned the knowledge. As greater numbers of diverse people accepted Islam, the Muslim community spread and absorbed increasing numbers of outlying nations. The influence of foreign concepts became a growing threat. The spread of knowledge and the respect for its pursuit became lost among the common Muslims. Execution and corporal punishment were abandoned as a means of controlling deviancy because the higher aim of holding to the Sunnah and destroying innovation was not supported or spread as a standard of nation building. Neither was a decentralized government able to standardize Islamic teachings based on the Quran and Sunnah as the companions understood them. The task of opposing growing innovations became the responsibility of a dwindling group of scholars of the Sunnah who could only oppose innovation through intellectual struggle, preaching and patience. They challenged the spread of deviant theology by categorizing innovations, identifying intellectual errors and affirming the principles of theology as found in the Quran and the Sunnah. They demonized any approach to speculative thought or innovation in theology, although they had no executive power to enforce restraint against deviant teachings. Imam al-Shafi'i, rahimahullah, said, My ruling regarding the people of theological rhetoric is that they should be beaten with palm leaves and shoes and be paraded among the kinsfolk in the tribes with it being announced. This is the reward of the one who abandons the book and the sunnah and turns to theological rhetoric, kalam. Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, said to his son about the people of theological rhetoric, such as those who manipulate and deviate the names and attributes of Allah, that they are from amongst those 
you will see that they used to be upon one word and one religion until shaitan came between them. So now you find amongst them enmity and differing. So be upon clarity. In short, the spread of deviation in the understanding of the belief system is from the loss of the method of the praise generations. Defense of monotheism is through returning to the understanding of our Lord, which the companions were upon. In these times of growing strife, the way of the praise generations in the understanding of the names and attributes of our Lord is the benchmark of a minority of Muslims who stand apart from the great masses of Muslims. That means the scholars of monotheism and the students of knowledge are the strangers referred to by Imam Malik rahimahullah when he said, Nothing will rectify the last part of this ummah except that which rectified its first part. Chapter 3 Monotheism, Tawheed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names and attributes. Monotheism regarding the names and attributes of Allah is perhaps the most important area of monotheistic study. This is because the nature of innovation that arose surrounding the theology involved intangible and unknowable details. The essence and true reality of our Lord, the clarity in understanding our Lord must involve distinguishing between his names and attributes to establish structural rules that prevent delving into fabrications and constructs. There are four differences between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names and his attributes. 1. The names of Allah refer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself and one or more of his intrinsic perfect attributes such as names which can refer only to Allah himself and his qualities of power, knowledge, wisdom, hearing and sight. 2. We may derive attributes from the names but we cannot derive names from the attributes. Allah affirms the attribute of plotting to himself when he said, And remember, when the disbelievers plotted against you, to imprison you, or to kill you, or to get you out from your home, that is Mecca, they were plotting, and Allah too was planning, and Allah is the best of the planners. Hence, we cannot derive the name the plotter from the attribute because he did not refer to himself as such. The Prophet Muhammad ﷺ described Allah with the attribute of descending. Abu Hurairah anhu reported that the Prophet ﷺ said, Our Lord, the blessed, the superior, comes down every night on the nearest heaven to us during the last third of the night. And he says, Is there anyone who invokes me? demands anything from me so that I may respond to his invocation. The descending is affirmed and we believe it. But we cannot derive the name the descender for Allah from this evidence. This would be a deviant innovation because it is naming Allah without textual evidence. This differs from denoting an attribute from a name that has been textually affirmed. 3. Our knowledge of the attributes of Allah is greater than that of his names, since each name refers to textual evidence of at least one attribute, but not all his attributes can refer to a name. This means that many actions are referred to Allah in textual evidence, such as his coming, going, taking, catching, and using force. We believe these actions are attributable to Allah in a manner that befits his majesty. But because we do not ascribe names to him based on those attributes, the number of authentic attributes are greater than his names. 4. We may call upon Allah using his names directly, but if we call upon him by use of his attributes, we must be inclusive of supporting language to avoid implying an innovated nomination Say, for example, O oh Allah, by your knowledge of the unseen and your power over creation, keep me alive so long as you know that living is good for me and cause me to die 
when you know that death is better for me. You may not say, O、oh, you, the designer of my life, keep me alive, because it is shaped on referent to attributes that are used as nominals. Establishing monotheism in the names and attributes of Allah necessitates to affirm, negate, and to refrain without distortion, resemblance, or similitude only by use of the Quran or on the tongue of His Messenger. This is done by acknowledging the textual evidence depicts a manner of perfection which suits His Majesty and greatness. One must avoid speculative theology on the nature of the attributes. The first necessity, affirmation. We affirm with complete submission everything which Allah affirmed for Himself in His Book, on which His Messenger declared for Him without the fatality of the following errors. One negation, taatil. Negation refers to cancelling the names and attributes of Allah. By refusing to affirm them, whether entirely or partially, Ibn Al Qayyim, rahimahullah, stated, "The source of polytheism and its foundation is negation, and it is of three categories. These three categories are understood from explanations of numerous reliable scholars based on an inherited scholarship. The negation of the Creator completely." Such as the negation expressed by the atheists, they deny the existence of the Creator, the Sovereign, the Controller, the Provider, and the Absolute Ruler. Our response to atheism was introduced in Part Two, Chapter Three. Now we begin by reference to the evidence of the complexity of creation. The negation of Allah's names and attributes is the diminution. Of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, the One who is free of all imperfections and most perfect. Negators may affirm His existence, but negate His names, attributes, and actions by denying them or attributing them to the created beings. Such negation is done by the grave worshippers who deny Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala an attribute, but give the quality to the interred saints, the Shiite, Shia. To their imams and the extreme Sufis, to the head of their spiritual path, the negation of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala's worship, instead of directing it to other than Allah, such as is done by the grave worshippers today, or the pagan Arabs at the time of the Prophet, those who negate worship refuse to conduct themselves with Allah in a manner obligatory upon the servant. From the actualization of monotheism, which is the manifestation of La ilaha illallah, there are two main types of negation. Complete negation is to completely strike out Allah Subhanahu wa Taala's names and attributes, such as that of the Jahmiyyah, who deny the names and attributes entirely. The first person to be known for negation in this Muslim community was Jad bin Dirham, and then his disciple. Jam bin Safwan, the reader should take warning that one may belong to this sect by adopting their intellectual method, even without deliberately opting to be a blind follower of them. Partial negation is to accept some of the names and attributes of Allah, and deny others selectively to support a fabricated ideology. This is evident in the selective negation of the Mu'tazila. And Zaidia, Rafida, and the Ibadiyya—all of them use speculative theology to negate attributes while affirming the names. Another type of partial negation is practiced by the majority of the Muslims of the Shari and Maturdi sects. They affirm the names and negate the attributes, with the exception of only seven attributes, including ability, knowledge, divine will, life. Hearing, sight, and speech. The Shari and Maturdi have partially negated the balance of attributes by distorting their meanings from the contextual revealed meanings. Two, distortion. The second error is partially or completely distorting the meaning of the names and attributes of Allah. 
It means to change the words from their correct meanings to innovations based on ignorance, desire, and speculation. Scholars call this ta'wil al-fasid, which means corrupt or distorted interpretation. An example of this is the distorted interpretation of the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be his power or generosity. Distortion is a form of deviation in interpreting the divine names and attributes. The meaning taken from the texts is not the apparent meaning, nor is it supported by explanations from the praise generations. It is impermissible to interpret a hidden meaning without evidence. The sects which engage in distorting the meaning claim that they are changing the meaning from one probable understanding to one that is more probable, based only on the intellectual suppositions of men while belying revealed evidence. Among those who fall into this error are those who are sincere yet ignorant. The Ash'aris begin by assuming a verse establishes resemblance between Allah and the creation. This is problematic because they change the meaning of the verse to disassociate from resemblance. The premise they suggest is that Allah put forth a resemblance or that his language is arbitrary and symbolic. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refuted this false interpretation with a decisive statement. There is nothing like unto him, and he is the hearing, the seeing. Therefore, we must understand the attributes based on this premise without denying or distorting them. He sees, but not like anything else may see. There are three types of distortion. A. Alteration refers to altering the wordings of names and attributes by adding to them or subtracting from them. The Jahmiya sect changed the Arabic word istawa to rise above or to istawla to take over in the following verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, The most merciful who is above the throne, al-arsh, established. The Jahmiya distorts the meaning of istawa to rise above. The result is a change in our understanding of who our Lord is from the understanding known by those who witnessed revelation, the companions, sahaba. One can also see a difference between the belief system of the righteous predecessors who inherited the understanding of the companions and the people of distortion by reflecting on the response of Imam Malik rahimahullah to the attribute of istawa, to rise above. The most merciful who is above the throne, al-arsh, established. Ibn Wahb, rahimahullah, reported, A man asked Imam Malik, O Abu Abdullah, Ar-Rahman ala al-arsh istawa. How is his istawa? Malik lowered his head and began to sweat profusely. Then he lifted up his head and said, Ar-Rahman ala al-arsh istawa, just as he described himself. One cannot ask how. How does not apply to him, and you are an evil man. A man of innovation. Take him out. The man was led out. Ibn Kathir rahimahullah mentioned, We follow the way that our righteous predecessors took in this regard, such as Malik, Al-Awza'i, Al-Thawri, Al-Layth bin Sa'ad, Al-Shafi'i, Ahmad, Ishaq bin Rahway, and the rest of the scholars of Islam in past and present times. B. Changing grammatical constructs is a distortion of the interpretation of the text to fit an unconventional meaning in support of deviant ideology. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, And Allah spoke to Musa, Moses, with direct speech. The innovators declined to affirm the attribute of speaking to Allah. Rather, they render Moses spoke to Allah. This is a form of negation through distortion because the changing of the grammar negates the speech of Allah. C. Metaphorical distortion is the most deviant type as it interprets based on an ideological representation detached from the literal context which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presented. They render Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hand to represent his power or his bestowal of bounty because they intend to negate 
the contextual attributes. Imam Shafi'i, rahimahullah, established a position consistent with the understanding of the companions. He said, I believe in Allah and in what revelation talks about him, in the manner he intended. And I believe in the Prophet, peace be upon him, in the manner he intended. 3. Resemblance This error is to suggest a resemblance or likeness of Allah to his creation. It is an error in interpreting the meaning of the names and attributes to have similarities to things of the creation. It is to affirm the likeness with something, such as if a person were to say the hand of Allah is like the hand of a human. Subhanallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Most High, is above all this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is eternal, with no beginning or an end. Although we also have life, we cannot say Allah has life like ours. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a life which always existed, and no existence preceded Him. Our lives have a beginning and ending, while Allah does not die. The quality of our life, while we experience it, is not in any way like the characteristics of His living. Our life, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created, is short, limited, imperfect, and followed by our death. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stated, There is nothing like unto Him, and He is the all-hearing, the all-seeing. After Allah negated his likeness and resemblance to anything in creation. He affirmed for himself of hearing and seeing. We have hearing and sight, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created, and is limited in perception and weakens over time. Our perception cannot encompass except short distances in our present time and place. Allah is aware of everything at once, across time, and place while he is above the throne, Al Arsh. None of our attributes are comparable with Allah, the perfect, the most merciful, all powerful, and all knowing Creator. He is just as He has described Himself, the highest, and there is nothing like unto Him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, And there is none co equal or comparable unto Him. 4. Defining the nature. Takyif is to question or define how an attribute of Allah is, such as to consider the modality of the hand of Allah, to affirm the hand, and to identify it. Another example is to question the modality of the descent of Allah to the lowest heaven. A person does not intend to compare him to a specific created thing, but he delves into how he can perceive the divine attribute. This delving is forbidden. How an attribute is in the true nature of the attribute is not known except to Allah. Sometimes a person may combine this concept of defining nature with resemblance. He will question the nature of an attribute of Allah by using rhetoric only to describe it with linguistic qualities of the creation, such as suggesting Allah's modality is restricted by the verb descend, as the rain descends. Allah is the Most High and far removed from such descriptions that humans must know the how of the attributes of our Lord, how they take form or action in the absolute essence of our Lord. The student may remember this maxim which many of the major scholars of Islam have referred to as a refutation of asking how are the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As a basic rule, only Allah knows how Allah is. This is a principle called tafweed al kayfiyah leaving the modality of attribute to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. We believe these attributes have an actuality because we understand the reference of the Arabic language, but we do not dictate how the referent indicates, and we cut off all hopes to reach that. Also, remember this rule. It would be best if we cut off every hope and desire to discover the formation, nature, reality, 
and functionality of the attributes of Allah. Thus, we avoid gazing our sheep near the king's pasture by fortifying the mind against the production of Allah in attribute by image, spoken narrative, drawing, and painting. If shaitan comes to suggest a picture of Allah in any certain way, remember the rule. Only Allah knows how he is. Hence, we stop any inspiration from shaitan right away with a statement, Subhanallah, which means Allah is above that. Consequently, any insinuation shaitan gives to us into speculative theology regarding our Lord, we say, Amantu Billah, as a reaffirmation of our faith. Tafweed al kayfiyah has a correct and an incorrect method. It is correct to affirm the wording and the meaning of the attribute of Allah, which is in reference. However, we leave the knowledge of the nature, reality, and shape of these attributes. So, we affirm Allah's beautiful names and sublime attributes, and we acknowledge and believe in their meanings. But we do not know how they are. We affirm the wording and say that we do not know their meanings, other than what is apparent in our understanding of the Arabic language. What is incorrect is to abandon a position and ignore the linguistic reference. Consider the example we mentioned earlier. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, The most merciful, who is above the throne, Al-Arsh, established. However, incorrect tafweed al kayfiya is to affirm the attribute of istawa, to rise above and then claim that we abandon any meaning because only Allah can know. Indeed, we do know the meaning of the words, which gives us the attributes of Allah. Abandoning the meaning is worse than negation, because it suggests that Allah sent revelation which has no meaning or purpose. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, And we have sent down to you the book as clarification for all things, and as guidance, and mercy, and good tidings for the Muslims. We could not be judged on our submission to revelation if the revelation came without meaning and explanation. Allah is above that. The correct tafweed al kayfiya is to affirm the attribute of istawa to rise above in wording and meaning and refrain from dictating the nature of the attribute. We do not dictate how Allah does istawa to rise above. Istawa is known, but the how part of it is unknown. Moreover, believing in it is mandatory, and to ask about it is an innovation, bid'ah. The second necessity, negation. The position of what is affirmed of our Lord's attributes have been supported by evidence. Likewise, it is required to have evidence for what to negate from Allah. We rely on evidence to negate from Allah the attributes of deficiency which he has negated from attributing to himself. We affirm is contrary with the qualification of perfection. We refer to the Quran and Sunnah as parameters of what to negate from Allah because he knows better about himself and his messenger was the most informed of all the people about his Lord. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said regarding injustices, and the record of deeds will be placed open, and you will see the criminals fearful of that within it, and they will say, O oh, woe to us, what is this book that leaves nothing small or great, except that it has enumerated it, and they will find what they did present before them, and your Lord does injustice to no one. Allah has negated for himself in truth any negative quality, such as injustice. Denying these from Allah is obligatory, because Allah has denied them from himself. However, affirming their most perfect opposites for Allah is mandatory, since negation is not complete until it consists of an affirmation. Thus, it is obligatory to negate from Allah the attribute of injustice, while affirming the opposite for him, based on the most perfect perspective. Likewise, negation 
of death for Allah is necessary because death is a weakness in a sign of deficiency. This negation requires the affirmation of his perfect life. The third necessity to refrain. The path of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah regarding the attributes of Allah which must involve neither affirmation nor negation of texts is to refrain from any articulation or supposition. We never articulate or produce words such as to say Allah is an engineer or a designer. Our method involves three positions. If the intended meaning is false and opposes the Quran and Sunnah, then we reject it and free our Lord, the highest, from false ascriptions. Two, however, if the intended meaning is to follow the book in Sunnah, we will accept the explanation. Three, furthermore, we must refrain with regard to vague terms that we cannot find evidence for. Familiarity with these three positions is relevant to the caller to Islam. For example, the caller may be challenged with insidious questions. 1. Does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hear with two ears? 2. Does Allah hear without ears? We cannot confirm or deny of the above possibilities because we do not have evidence to establish that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ears. We affirm the attribute of hearing for Allah since he called himself the all-hearing, as samia Another application of our three positions to a controversial topic encountered during calling others to Islam might be, does Allah have a special direction? The caller to Islam should clarify the question before attempting any answer because we must refrain ourselves from vague and ambiguous concepts concerning the attributes of Allah. If the questioner says that she or he means, does Allah have a place which contains him, then we say that this is something false and rejected. And Allah is to be declared free from this. Allah is unrestrictedly above, as supported by multiple verses, ayat, and narrations. We affirm this position and oppose its negation. In summary, establishing monotheism in the names and attributes of Allah requires 1. Belief in the names and attributes established in the Quran and Sunnah without the four violations, negation, distortion, resemblance, and dictating or questioning the modality. 2. Placing Allah above any likeness to human beings and beyond any imperfections. In other words, no resemblance. 3. Refraining from what cannot be affirmed or denied while abandoning any desire to distinguish the form of attributes. 4. Belief that the names and attributes of Allah are in the perfect sense, expression and reality. Chapter 4. Polytheism, Shirk in Allah's names and attributes. Polytheism, shirk, in the names and attributes includes both the common pagan practice of giving Allah the attributes of his creation, as well as the act of giving created beings the divine names and attributes, which thus unite divinity with creation. These violations have different manifestations under three categories. 1. Anthropomorphism. 2. Deification. 3. Denial. Polytheism by anthropomorphism. Allah is perfect and above the transient and dependent nature of his creation. It is impermissible and grave infidelity to name Allah with names from his creation or attribute to Allah something from the characteristics of creation. Some examples of this are calling him the Father as the Christians do. The effective cause, as philosophers do, or using the label Mother Nature, while he is Malikul Mulk and the disposer of all affairs. These are examples of labeling Allah or his attributes with qualities that are imperfect and perishing. In another example, 
Allah informed us that a group of Jews violated his attributes when they said, They said indeed, Allah is poor, while we are rich. The above statement of the Jews is a tremendous example of gross infidelity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, And leave the company of those who practice deviation concerning his names. Ilhad means deviation, and in the context of the names and attributes of Allah, it is polytheism. Qatada radiallahu anhu stated that deviation refers to associating others with Allah and his names, such as calling an idol Uzza. This is based on the name of Allah, Al-Aziz. Mujahid rahimahullah said that to belie Allah's names includes naming an idol, Allat, a derivation from the name Al-Ilah. Alleged images of our creators are often painted, molded, or carved in the shape of human beings, possessing the physical features of those who worship them. This anthropomorphism is a destructive error because of three violations. One, it projects what Allah negated for himself. Allah said, So do not assert similarities to Allah. Indeed, Allah knows, and you do not know. With this statement, Allah negates attributes that amplify imperfection or fault in some way. For instance, that he has a son, that he has lineage, that he becomes tired, or that he sleeps, or has any resemblance to need or dependency of corporeal bodies. As we have seen, Allah has the right to assert and negate specific attributes to characterize himself. 2. It likens Allah to the created beings. When individuals refer to Prophet Isa, Jesus السلام, as the son of Allah, they have committed polytheism in Allah's attributes. Far removed is Allah from what they claim. Allah refers to this error by the Christians at the time of the Prophet. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Allah has not taken any son, nor has there ever been with him any deity. Contemporary Christians have a diversity of beliefs and many differing sects. Among the majority of Christians is a common belief that Prophet Isa السلام, was God incarnate, who became part of the creation so that he could understand and interact with people. This is polytheism, shirk, because of many grave errors. First, it makes a similitude between creator and creation. Second, it denies from Allah his sublime distinction, and it denies from Allah the ability to know and understand his creation from above the heavens. Western culture has standardized depictions of Allah as a Caucasian man with flowing white hair and beard, such as the iconic painting alleged to be of Allah and Prophet Adam السلام, by Michelangelo on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. These pictures have, in turn, been held by the Christian world in the highest of esteem. Those who depict Allah in image or sculpture have likened him to the creation which is polytheism because it is impossible for them to imagine or know the characteristics of Allah outside the realm of their experience. In this way, they have affirmed for Allah a likeness to creation, while Allah has negated or rejected that likeness from himself. Christianity falls into the error of anthropomorphism by portraying Allah with human qualities, while Buddhists and Hindus depict countless idols of humans and animals as depictive of Allah. The error is critical regardless of sincerity, even if it is implicit or explicit. 3. It denies Allah's names and attributes. Denying any of the names or attributes of Allah is also one of the fundamental violations of monotheism and names and attributes of Allah. It is clearly a violation to deny his names and attributes entirely, but it is a grave error to disbelieve in some of the characteristic attributes of Allah while claiming monotheism. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Indeed, those who disbelieve in Allah 
and his messengers and wish to discriminate between Allah and his messengers and say, we believe in some and disbelieve in others and wish to adopt a way in between. Those are the disbelievers truly and we have prepared for the disbelievers a humiliating punishment. It is imperative to believe in the complete revelation and accept with full submission everything that comes to us about Allah and His religion. Whatever Allah revealed concerning His names and attributes must be affirmed. Denial of even one quality is like denying the entirety which constitutes disbelief. Consider the example of Christians who ascribe the quality of divine mercy to Allah, but deny his attribute of judgment over their behavior. They instead say that substitutional atonement has removed the need for the actions to be brought to Allah on the day of accountability. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, So do you believe in part of the scripture and disbelieve in part? Then what is the recompense for those who do that among you except disgrace in worldly life? And on the day of resurrection, they will be sent back to the severest of punishment. And Allah is not unaware of what you do. Sheikh Abdul Rahman as Saadi, rahimahullah, mentioned the basis of faith and its foundational guidelines are belief in Allah, His names, and His attributes. The stronger one's knowledge of these while worshipping Allah, the stronger his monotheism belief. So when he knows that Allah is singled out by the perfect attributes, alone in his magnificence, majesty and splendor, there being no comparison to him in his perfection, then it becomes more realistic that by this means he will know and fulfill his belief that he is the true God and divinity other than his is false. So whoever denies any of Allah's names or attributes, he initiates what contradicts and nullifies monotheism, and this is a branch of disbelief. Polytheism by deification. This form of polytheism in Allah's names and attributes relates to errors wherein created beings or things are falsely assigned names or attributes which belong only to Allah. Below are some examples. 1. The ancient Arabs. It was the practice of the ancient Arabs to worship idols whose names were derived from the names of Allah. Their main three idols, Allat, al Uzza, and al Mannat, were named after three of the lofty and unique names of Allah. During the Prophet ﷺ's time, there arose a false prophet in a region of Arabia called Yamama, who took the name Rahman, which can only belong to Allah. 2. Shiite Shia Among the Shiite sects is the Nusayriya or Alawiya of Syria, who believe that the Prophet Muhammad wasallam's cousin and son-in-law, Ali bin Abi Talib, radiallahu anhu, was a manifestation of Allah, and they ascribed to him many attributes which can belong only to Allah alone. 3. The Ismaili sect. The Ismaili, also known as Aga Khanis, consider their leader, the Aga Khan, to be God incarnate. 4. Druze of Lebanon. The Druze of Lebanon believe that the Fatimid Caliph, Al-Hakim, bi Amrillah, was the last manifestation of Allah among humankind. 5. Extreme Sufis The claim of Sufi mystics like Al-Hajjaj is that they can become one with Allah and as such exist as manifestation of the Creator within His Creator. They are involved in multiple aspects of polytheism including the names and attributes of Allah. 6. Einstein's Theory of Relativity Einstein's Theory of Relativity states that energy is equal to mass times the square of the speed of light. This is taught in all schools and scientific truth. It is an expression of polytheism. 
and names and attributes of Allah. The theory states that energy can neither be created nor destroyed, but merely transforms into matter and vice versa. However, both matter and energy are created entities, and they both will be destroyed, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly states. And do not invoke with Allah another deity, and there is no deity except Him. Everything will be destroyed except His face. The theory implies that mass and energy are eternal, having no beginning or end, are uncreated and transform into each other. The mathematical relationship between these two is proven a reality, but their supposed independence from Allah's all-encompassing power is falsehood. Attributes of divinity belong only to Allah, and He alone is without beginning or an end. 7. Darwin's Theory of Evolution It is an attempt to explain that the evolution of life and the origin of all life forms is an adaptation from lesser matter without the intervention of divinity. One of the leading evolutionists of the 20th century, Sir Julian Huxley, went beyond scientific theory to dismiss divine origin altogether. Huxley inherited his secular scientific tradition from his grandfather, a contemporary of Darwin. Sir Julian said, Darwinism removed the whole idea of God as the creator of organisms from the sphere of rational discussion. 8. Malik al-Amlak, King of Kings Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu, narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, The most wretched person in Allah's sight is someone whose name is the King of Kings. Similar might be said about Judge of Judges or Strongest of the Strong. This is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone can possess the highest superlative. Such phrases are especially problematic when they involve derivatives from the unique names of Allah, such as Malik al-Mulk. Sheikh Sa'adi, rahimahullah, wrote, One is not to be called with a name that implies some type of partnership with one of Allah's names or attributes, like the judge of judges, the king of kings, etc., or the ruler of rulers, or Abu al-Hakam, the father of rule, etc. All of this is out of precaution for monotheism and Allah's names and attributes and defending against what leads to polytheism. 9. Al-Hakam, the judge. Definitive names, which refers to names and attributes that only Allah can possess, are impermissible names for anything of the creation. One of the companions, Sahaba, named Hani, who is remembered as Abu Shurayh, radiallahu anhu, received that kunya from the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Hani reported that this kunya was Abu al-Hakam. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to him, Allah is al-Hakam, the judge, and to him is the judgment. Then the Prophet gave Hani a new kunya after his eldest son, Shurayh. Chapter 5 Developing Knowledge of Allah's Names and Attributes A student of knowledge in the West who engages in calling others to Islam needs very little information to convey invitation if they restrain themselves only to what they know based on evidence. The principal rules are Invite to the Quran and Sunnah, prophetic tradition. Identify the audience. Truthfulness and sincerity. Following the Sunnah. Avoid argument and debate. Invite with wisdom, knowledge and beautiful means. All these points are known and elaborated in the Quran and Sunnah. Calling effectively to the people of the book, Ahl al-Kitab is more complex because they are people of rhetoric and speculative theology. The entirety of the contemporary Christian world everywhere has built its creed, rituals, and orthodoxy on hidden meanings, metaphoric thought, and changing or distorting evidence. What they have of benefit is a love for our Lord. Therefore, 
inviting the people of the book by use of the names and attributes of Allah is effective. Calling others to Islam by use of the names and attributes is complicated and requires more knowledge to avoid speculative theology. The nature of the topic is unreachable by the means that deviant sects and religions use to build their own theology. Therefore, this chapter is a summary of 12 foundational principles used to understand and explain the names and attributes without deviancy. The following chapter is a structured query system that can be used while calling others to Islam to negotiate controversial or difficult topics concerning the names and attributes. 1. The names and attributes are Tawqifiyya. Tawqifiyya means to provide evidence from the Qur'an and Sunnah only. There is no place for intellectual free thinking regarding the names and attributes of our Lord as they are contingent upon evidence from the Qur'an and Sunnah. The worst crime is to speak about Allah without knowledge and valid knowledge of our Lord is only what has been transmitted from revelation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Say, my Lord has only forbidden immoralities. What is apparent of them and what is concealed and sin? An oppression without right and that you associate with Allah that for which he has not sent down authority and that you say about Allah that which you do not know. Amongst the matters of the unseen are the things we do not know and from them are the names and attributes of Allah and he alone has the knowledge of the unseen and unknowable things are hidden from the creation. We must not employ our intellectual faculties to derive or invent a name or an attribute without revealed evidence. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and they cannot comprehend anything of his knowledge save whatever he himself pleases to reveal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said, and follow not that of which you have not the knowledge. Surely the hearing and the sight and the heart, all of these shall be questioned about that. Hence, we must refer to Allah for knowledge about himself without innovating names or attributes outside of what has been revealed. Furthermore, we cannot employ analogy to infer attributes of Allah. For example, to say that he has the attribute of strength, since it is similar to the attribute of might, or Allah has the attribute of compassion, since it is like the attribute of mercy. 2. The names and attributes are superlative. Allah's names and attributes, al asma wa sifat, are indeed perfect to the highest degree. Some humans may have beautiful names such as Karim, Rahim, or others that suggest virtue. Still, their character cannot comprehensively and completely reflect these attributes. All the names and attributes of Allah are the completion of majesty and perfection without flaws or deficiencies. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, And to Allah belong the best names, so invoke him by them. Al-Hay, for example, implies a complete life, one that was not preceded by nothingness, one that never climaxes, one that never needs sustenance or rest, and will never come to an end. And Al-Alim means the one who has a complete and perfect knowledge that was not preceded by ignorance, and that will never result in forgetfulness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us a valuable example of how to introduce the perfect nature of our Lord when calling disbelievers to him. Prophet Musa alayhi salam engaged with the Pharaoh regarding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Pharaoh said, So who is the Lord of you too, O Musa? He said, Our Lord is he who gave each thing its form and then guided it. Pharaoh said, then what is the case of the former generations? Moses said, The knowledge thereof 
is with my Lord in a record. My Lord neither errs nor forgets. 3. The number of names is immeasurable. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah has 99 names, 100 less one, and he who memorized them all by heart will enter paradise. The above narration made some people assume that the divine names are just 99, which is not correct. The names of Allah are not limited to a fixed and definite number. The use of the names to enter paradise is not through memorizing a specific 99. Use is through performing, ahsaha, a verb that infers struggling, to recognize, understand, implement, and call others by use of the knowledge of the names and attributes. The meaning of ahsaha is illustrated in the famous narration, which is narrated by the Prophet ﷺ, who said, I ask you, O Allah, by every one of your names, by which you have named yourself, or revealed in your book, or those which you have taught to one of your creatures, or appropriated for yourself in the knowledge of the unseen that is with you. The names and attributes of Allah can be actualized in a practical sense. It is not through esoteric means, such as a dream or inheritance from the heart or of a senior scholar. Neither is actualization from inspiration after the seal of the prophets. Prophet Muhammad has passed away. Rather, the practicality of knowing Allah through his names and benefiting from this is made easy by Allah by giving us information and revelation, and after this, through the explanations of scholars. Absorbing and assimilating the great meanings of his names are far more extensive than memorizing. Sheikh Muhammad bin Salih al Uthaymin rahimahullah said, What is meant by Ahsaha is not merely writing them on a piece of paper, then repeating them until you have memorized them. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah stated that performing Ahsaha of Allah's 99 names means three things. One, knowing the names and the number of names. Two, understanding the diverse meanings. Three, calling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by using them. Calling on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can simply be praise, worship, and asking for one's needs. From the above statements by several scholars, Ahsaha is to know the names by heart, to realize their meanings, to believe in them out of firm conviction, to deduce them from the Quran, to abide by them in one's actions, to make them part of the daily portion of remembering Allah, to reflect on them and to keep studying their meanings. Thus, the person who learns these names, implements their understanding, and connects to Allah through them, has truly fulfilled the minimum meanings of Ahsaha. 4. The apparent meaning must be maintained. We must refer to Allah according to how He and His Prophet وسلم, have described Him without explaining His names and attributes by giving them meanings other than their intended purpose. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, He has anger concerning the disbelievers and the hypocrites, and that He may punish the hypocrite men and hypocrite women and the polytheists men and polytheists women, those who assume about Allah any assumption of evil nature. Upon them is a misfortune of evil nature. And Allah has become angry with them, and has cursed them, and prepared for them hell, Jahannam, and evil it is as a destination. Thus anger is one of the noble attributes of our Lord. It is incorrect to change the meaning of anger in this verse to represent his punishment. Many misinterpret this verse based 
on the understanding that anger is a sign of weakness in humanity and is not befitting of Allah. What Allah has stated should be accepted with the qualification that his anger is not like human anger based on the evidence. There is nothing like unto him and he is the hearing, the seeing. The similarity between divine attributes and those of humankind is only in name and not in degree. When qualities are associated with Allah, they are to be taken in the absolute sense and free from human deficiencies. 5. Each confirmed name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is inclusive of an attribute, but the opposite is not the case. This rule is highly crucial to refute those who produce names for Allah by deriving them from attributes. It is incorrect, for example, to Allah, the deceiver, from the attribute of deception, and the plotter, from the attribute of plotting. Non-Muslims sometimes allege that they do not want to believe in a God named the deceiver or the plotter. We respond first by explaining that these names are not names Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave himself. These names are innovated by deriving them from the attributes of plotting and deceiving. If a caller to Islam is challenged in rebuttal that such attributes are not befitting to Allah, then we can refute their rebuttal. In the context in which Allah mentioned these attributes in the Quran, the hypocrites or the disbelievers are trying to deceive or plot against the believers, not realizing that Allah is guardian over the believers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is fully aware of their secret scheming and he will confront their limited human plans of deception with his divine plans to defend the believers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and they, the unbelievers, plotted against Isa, Jesus, but Allah caused their schemes to fail, for Allah is the best of all plotters. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said, surely the hypocrites try to deceive Allah, and he is deceiving them, and when they rise up for prayer, they rise up lazily, showing off to other men, and they do not remember Allah except a little. It is permissible to derive one or more attributes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's confirmed names. For example, the most merciful incorporates the attribute of mercy. The munificent al-karim incorporates the attributes of munificence and generosity. The subtle one al-latif includes the attribute of being gentle and all perceiving. Names must not be innovated from his attributes, such as his will, his coming, his ascending. We cannot derive the name the willer, the comer, the ascender, respectively. 6. The divine attributes of zatiyah or fi'liyah. We may categorize attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala into zatiyah, which refers to his divine essence or selfhood of Allah and fi'liyah, which refers to divine actions, in a third category which combines both. First, attributes that describe Allah in his selfhood are as sifat as zatiyah They are attributes ascribed to his self, which are part of his true nature. His selfhood never ceases and will always be consistent with these qualities. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is described with life, knowledge, ability, wisdom, highness, might, and power, and numerous more. Also included in this category are informational attributes called as sifat al khabariya which describe the self of Allah, such as two hands, two eyes, fingers, etc. These must not be interpreted with anthropomorphism. Second, attributes ascribed to his actions. Attributes that describe the actions of Allah are a sifat al fi'liya and are connected to his will. They are dynamic and not restrained to his self. Neither are they limited in any sense of occurrence 
intensity, or frequency. Examples that are all supported by evidence from Quran and Sunnah are the ascending, descending, and the coming. All of these are attributes describing his actions and connected to his will, which have the occurrence of varying frequency. They have a beginning and an ending because they are not Allah in selfhood, but are from Allah. The ability does not end when the occurrence ends, but the action is transient according to his will, and Allah is capable of all things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's descent to the lower heaven happens every night based on the following evidence. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu reported that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Our Lord, the blessed, the superior, comes down every night on the nearest heaven to us during the last third of the night and he says, Is there anyone who invokes me, demands anything from me, so that I may respond to his invocation? Is there anyone who asks me so that I may grant him his requests? Is there anyone who seeks my forgiveness so that I may forgive him? Allah's coming will not occur unless the judgment day is here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, No, when the earth has been leveled, pounded and crushed, and your Lord has come, and the angels rank upon rank. Third, as sifat as zatiya al fi'liya The scholars explain the category of attributes with the example of the speech of Allah. Speech is from the attributes of the selfhood of our Lord because He will never lose the ability. Humans may become ill or aged and our speech could ease due to pathology. But Allah will always have speech without any deficiency. Furthermore, His speech is an action that comes from Him and it will come from Him according to His will when He chooses transiently. 7. His attributes have unique reference. We established the impossibility of seeing the essence of our Lord in this world. Hence, we cannot describe what we cannot see. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Vision perceives him not, but he perceives all vision, and he is the subtle, the acquainted. Furthermore, just as Allah's divine essence or self is real, and does not resemble that, of other than him, then likewise it is characterized by actual attributes which also do not resemble the attributes of the creation. Divine attributes affirm his existence, but not how he exists. His speech regarding the names and attributes is a branch of the divine essence. What is revealed resembles representative speech of humans, but there is no arbitrary nature in the speech of Allah. He speaks what he wills, and the efficacy of his descriptors is unquestionable. We respond with varying degrees of understanding, so it is obligatory upon the servant to withhold and restrict himself to the speech of Allah and to the speech of his messenger, and to have a certain belief and faith in everything that is affirmed in the revealed texts regarding the names and attributes of Allah. Similarly, one must negate from Allah whatever Allah has negated from Himself, or what the Messenger وسلم, negated from Him of deficiencies and inadequacies. 8. Speech on some of the attributes is like the rest. This means we must not change the formula we use to classify and understand attributes. When Allah intends a metaphor, He describes it as such. Whoever affirms the attributes of Allah, such as hearing, seeing, and will, must also affirm Allah's loving, being pleased, His anger, and His hating, approval, and affirming of some of the attributes and rejection of others, is a following of individual desires, which results in a loss in this life, and the hereafter. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked the children of Israel, 
So do you believe in part of the scripture and disbelieve in part? Then what is the recompense for those who do that among you except disgrace in the worldly life? And on the day of resurrection, they will be sent back to the severest of punishment. Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, said, Whosoever differentiates between one attribute and another, despite their being the same with reasons for their being literal or metaphorical, then he contradicts himself, erroneous in his position, and resembling those who believed in a part of the book while disbelieving in other parts. 9. It is unlawful to give Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala human attributes. We must refer to Allah without giving Him the qualities of His creation. Western Judeo-Christian culture believes that Allah created everything in six days, then rested on the seventh. Such a claim assigns that Allah the attributes of His creation. This describes a man who tires after heavy work and needs sleep to recuperate. And Allah is above that. The following text was quoted from the Old Testament. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it He rested from all the work of creating that He had done. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not in need of rest. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in response to this. And we did certainly create the heavens and earth and what is between them in six days. And there touched us no weariness. So be patient, O Muhammad, over what they say, and exalt Allah with praise of your Lord before the rising of the sun and before its setting. Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah, mentioned that Qatada said, the Jews said that Allah created the heavens and earth in six days and then rested on the seventh day, which was the Sabbath. Therefore, they call it a holiday. Allah the Exalted then sent down denial of their statement and false opinion. Allah said, And nothing of fatigue touched us, indicating that no sleep, exhaustion or weariness affects him. Elsewhere in the Bible and Torah, Allah is depicted as repenting from his evil thoughts, in the same way that humans do when they realize their errors. Similarly, the claim that Allah is a spirit or has a spirit completely wrecks the concept of monotheism. There is no evidence in the Quran or Sunnah of Allah referring to himself as a spirit. On the contrary, Allah refers to the spirit as part of his creation. Knowing your Lord becomes impossible if we have ambiguous criteria of what constitutes an attribute of divinity. What man knows about the Creator is what little he has revealed to him. Therefore, man is obliged to stay within these narrow limits. When a man gives free rein to his intellect in describing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is liable to fall into errors by assigning Allah the attributes of his creation. 10. It is unlawful to attribute divinity to the created. We cannot provide the created things the qualities of Allah, which are his descriptors alone. An example of this which the caller to Islam contends with is the Christian attribution of divinity to Prophet Isa salam. While he had attributes of a human being, such as the need to eat food and the need to defecate, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, The Messiah, son of Mary, was not but a messenger. Other messengers have passed on before him, and his mother was a supporter of truth. They both used to eat food. Look how we make clear to them the signs. Then look how they are deluded. In the New Testament, Paul, raises the example of Melchizedek, king of Salem, from the Torah, and gives both him and Prophet Isa السلام, the divine attribute of having no beginning or end. This Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God Most High. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him, and Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, the name Melchizedek means 
king of righteous, then also king of Salem, means king of peace, without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest, but God said to him, You are my son, today I have become your father. And he says in another place, You are a priest forever, in the order of Melchizedek. Care must be taken to explain to the people of the book why they must not interpret knowledge of our Lord using invented metaphor. Christians will use the above verses and others to justify many symbolic constructs to support polytheistic Christian dogma. What is upon the collar to Islam is to explain the necessity of identifying traits of pure monotheism. The rule here is that creation cannot have the Creator's qualities. Similarly, most Shiite, Shia sects have given their Imam's divine attributes of absolute infallibility, knowledge of the past, the future, and the unseen, the ability to change destiny and control the atoms of creation. Likewise, extreme mystic Sufis attribute divinity to the head of their spiritual path. In so doing, they set up rivals who share with Allah in the unique attributes of divinity and establish their shuyukh as gods besides Allah. These errors were based on love and good intention to honor the nobility of those who had highly developed faith and knowledge. Without knowledge and good intention can lead the most noble astray. These errors have served to pave the way for the attributes of divinity on Prophet Isa salam. Once they created the Creator's concept as being like a human being, accepting Prophet Isa salam as God presented no real problem for them. There have been numerous cults in the modern age which followed the same critical path of error, such as the branch of Davidians or the nation of gods and earths. 11. Naming someone with one of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names. We desire a virtuous name for our children and seek honor within the beautiful words and names known in the Quran and Sunnah. Often, we choose an improper name with good intention, but without knowledge or guidance. We are advised by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to select one of the most virtuous names. Abu Wahab al-Jushami radiallahu anhu reported, that the Prophet ﷺ said, Call yourselves by the names of the Prophets. The most beloved names to Allah are Abdullah and Abdul Rahman. And the truest names are Harith and Ammam, one who is always thinking of an action. And the most reprehensible names are Arb, war, and Murrah, bitter. This guideline aids in choosing a name with reward and avoiding that which is blameworthy. From the virtuous names are also those which derive from the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The general rules for calling someone with one of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names are as follows. If the name has meaning or quality that only Allah is capable of, like creating, resurrecting, lordship, Rahman, mutakabbir, Jabbar, etc., then it is not permissible to call a human being by these names except by prefixing Abd, which means the servant of, before the name. If the name refers to a more general quality like hearing, listening, being generous, wisdom, etc., then it is permissible to call a person by that name. The permissibility requires the definitive Al to be removed from the name because the definitive implies uniqueness and exclusivity which belong only to Allah. Examples of this permissibility are Ra'uf and Rahim, proper names for men in their indefinite forms. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used some of them to refer the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There has certainly come to you a messenger from among yourselves Grievous to him is what you suffer. He is concerned over you and to the believers is kind and merciful. 
names like Abdul Rasul, Abdul Nabi, Abdul Hussein are forbidden. Based on this principle, the Prophet ﷺ forbade Muslims from referring to those put under their charge as Abd. 12. Cutting off hope in knowing how. We are required to believe in the names and attributes of Allah without inquiring after their nature and manner or investigating their essence. Attributes vary according to the self they characterize, but how they manifest themselves depends upon the subject and its actions. We know the meaning of these attributes as they apply to humans, because they are in the Arabic language, which we understand. We cannot inquire into the meaning of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's nature, His essence, and how His actions take place. We cannot ask about the nature of His attributes in detail. For this reason, when asked about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala settled on the throne, Al-Arsh, the praise generations, said, The rising, Istiwa, is known. The mana is unknown. Believing in it is an obligation and inquiring about it is a hearsay. We believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names and attributes by the three processes of affirming, negating, and refraining from vague terms. We declare that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is far above any similitude in His attributes and does not resemble any of the attributes of His creation. We cut off any hope that we can understand the true nature of these names and attributes because a human mind cannot encompass the Lord of all that ever existed. Part 5. Belief in Allah's Attributes Chapter 1. Allah's Attributes Structured Query The human mind is limited and deficient in contending with the attributes of Allah. In general, we cannot even approach an understanding of divine attributes without textual evidence to establish their existence. This is the same principle for attributes that may have shapes, such as the hands, the eyes, and abstract attributes that the human mind may infer as knowledge and wisdom. A classification system differentiates several types of attributes, such as the class of attributes, referring to the divine essence, another class which relates to his actions, such as laughing and anger. The third class is a combination of the former two. It is an attribute of the essence of Allah, such as his speech, which manifests into action as he wills and when he wills. Under the umbrella of the 12 principles is a guiding format, a structured seven question query, SSQQ, to apply when trying to understand and convey the divine attributes. SSQQ guidelines. The SSQQ is a format that can be applied to each of the divine attributes to understand them the way the Prophet وسلم, and his companions understood. To harvest the benefits of this understanding and to avoid transgression. The structured method is a query made of seven consecutive questions which simplify our understanding with the parameters of the Quran and Sunnah. Ibn al Qayyim, Rahimahullah, described the need for such a systematic approach in his book Al Fawa'id. He said, Being unaware of the way leading to Allah, its difficulty and purpose causes many problems and has little benefit. This simple system will establish a clear path for calling to monotheism through the divine names and attributes, seeking the face of Allah and averting errors and hardships. 1. Why must we affirm the attribute? The first question considers why every Muslim must affirm the attribute which Allah affirmed for himself in the Quran or his messenger affirmed in the Sunnah. Likewise, every Muslim must negate the attributes Allah negated for himself in the Quran or his messenger وسلم, negated 
in the Sunnah. Hence, to complete the first query, one must identify reliable evidence which affirms or negates the attribute. This involves considering the benefits of the evidence-based process as well as considering the consequences of refraining from the attribute without justification. 2. Can we affirm the attribute without negation and resemblance? Shaitan will begin his intense insinuating at this stage of the structured query, especially if the wording confirming the attribute is the same as the human, such as Allah's hands, face, finger, shin, or feet. These attributes are the ones of which a lack of knowledge can cause the greatest controversy among Muslims who are not well grounded or those who delve into philosophy. Shaitan will invite and incite contemplation of the attribute and human dimension, which is called resemblance. Shaitan will intend by it to convince you to abandon the textualization of the attribute by negation, to disassociate from the insinuated human form, to escape doubt and whispers produced by Satan, a structured query must recall the fundamentals of establishing divine names and attributes and the Quranic references which support them, avoiding negation. Step 1 for our query addresses avoiding negation. Evidence from the Quran and Sunnah establish the attribute. Hence, rejection or refusal to affirm it is belying the Quran and Sunnah, which can be blasphemous. Those with sincerity and an evidence-based method will be well prepared against doubt. Shaitan may then invite to a partial negation, as is done by many of the people of the speculative theology, to accept the majority of the attributes and negate the ones which linguistically infer human traits. This doubt is destroyed by recalling what Allah said when addressing the children of Israel. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, So do you believe in part of the scripture and disbelieve in part? Then what is the recompense for those who do that among you except disgrace in worldly life? And on the day of resurrection, they will be sent back to the severest of punishment. And Allah is not unaware of what you do. Avoiding the resemblance, tamthil and tajseem. To avoid falling into the sin of creating a similitude between Allah and His creation, one may take refuge in his own words, remembering, reflecting on, and reciting these two verses, ayat, arms a Muslim to defeat shaitan. Consequently, they are important verses for a caller to Islam to memorize and use a responses during outreach discourse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, There is nothing like unto him, and he is the hearing, the seeing. In the above verse, Allah uses two names from which we can derive attributes of hearing and seeing, which are also human faculties. However, at the beginning of the verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us to understand them under the rule that nothing in creation is like him. There is nothing like unto him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said, Say, he is Allah, who is one, Allah, the eternal refuge. He neither begets nor is born, nor is there to him any equivalent. One should recite loudly with a beautiful tone and take pleasure in the fact that these words are distressing to shaitan. One should reflect on the meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one and only. Nothing in creation is co-equal or comparable with him and his divine essence, names, attributes and actions. There is another tool to destroy doubt, which is logical reasoning. Logic can help you defeat the Satan-inspired desire to liken Allah to his creation. In this world, human beings have physical attributes shared with animals, such as the feet, tables and buildings, are also described 
with the word, through a fast mapping of semantic classes. We know that the feet of a donkey, a bird, a lion, a camel, a table, and a human do not look alike. Their essences are different. The divine essence of our Lord is unique and different from the human. If a fast logical process can identify and differentiate between Allah and His creation and essence, then it follows that any similitude of the attributes is in the linguistic reference only. 3. Can the attribute be personally interpreted? Shaytan will never abandon his task to mislead Muslims. Suppose he fails to incite a Muslim to commit the sins of negation, resemblance. In that case, he will appeal to the ego to delve into corrupted and misleading interpretation and inspire the intellect to innovate distorted and misleading interpretations of the divine attributes. For example, through his whispers, Shaytan will incite the belief that the hand of Allah must refer to his power and strength. The coming of Allah on the Day of Judgment refers to the arrival of Allah's command and the descending of Allah in the last third of the night relates to the descending of his mercy. Shaytan will inspire these distortions and cause a Muslim who follows them to believe that they are doing so to protect monotheism. Avoiding Corrupt Interpretation The danger of misinterpreting the attributes is like any other innovation because the foundational concepts appear pleasing and beautiful despite the great merit in associating beauty with our Lord. Innovation of any sort, even the most beautiful and appealing, interpretations of attributes are contrary to revelation. In principle, we must apply a foundational rule to our comprehension of any subject of theology which states that we cannot take a word from its apparent linguistic meaning to a hidden meaning without evidence. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rebuked the children of Israel for changing interpretation of meanings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, There are such among the Jews who pervert the original meaning of the words. They play with their tongues to form false concepts in regards to religion and to mean we hear and we disobey. Hear but do not be heard. And reina, limited in understanding. If they had said, we hear and we obey, hear, and undurna, watch over us, it would have been better and more correct for them. 4. How does the attribute look? After shaitan fails in his misleading facet attempts in the areas of negation, resemblance, distortion, and corrupted interpretation, he will incite the Muslim to consider the modality of attributes. He will tempt the intellect with the question how, eluding the question how. Adherence to the sunnah will remove a Muslim from the intellectual trial of questioning the modality of divine attributes. Abu Hurairah narrated that Allah's Messenger وسلم, said, Shaytan comes to one of you and says, Who created so and so? Who created so and so? till he says, Who has created your Lord? So when he reaches up to such a question, one should seek refuge with Allah and give up such thoughts. The wording in Sahih Muslim includes the Prophet ﷺ saying, Whoever experiences any of that, let him say, I believe in Allah. We must realize that Allah did not command us to discriminate the nature and the reality of his attributes. We are unable to discriminate why, since we are incapable of comprehending such a reality. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu narrated that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Reflect deeply upon the creation, but do not reflect upon the essence of the Creator. Verily, his essence cannot be known other than to believe in it.
Hence, the Prophet وسلم, advised us to reflect upon the creation of Allah. Aspects of the creation, such as the throne, the bearers of the throne, and the footstool, are evidence of his great attributes. The caller to Islam needs to remember the following rule. Only Allah knows how Allah is. We believe these attributes have essence and function based on what we understand from the Arabic language. But we do not dictate how they work and we cut off all hopes to reach that conclusion. We also need to remember this rule. What the above translates as is that it would be best if we cut off every hope and desire to discover the formation, nature, reality and functionality of Allah's attributes by producing an image through the mind, the spoken narrative or the drawing and painting skills. 5. What if Satan succeeds? Considering the consequences of the following interpretation or negation of divine attributes should strengthen the resolve to be steadfast upon the sunnah. If shaitan succeeds in making us visualize Allah's divine essence or one of his names and attributes in a certain shape, we must refrain and interrupt the insinuation and say, Subhanallah. The presence of whispering from shaitan is a sign that one is on the correct path because he despairs to beguile you. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu narrated that some companions came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam complaining about satanic insinuations. They said to him, we find ourselves something that is too awful for any of us to speak of it. He said, do you really find that? They said, yes. He said, that is clear faith. And Nawawi, rahimahullah, said in his commentary on the above narration that the companions were so afraid of speaking of the insinuations and believing them that it was a sign that they were free of doubt. Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, wrote that it means that the shaitan only whispers to those whom he despairs of tempting because he is unable to tempt them. As for the disbeliever, he can approach him in any manner he wants and is not restricted to whispering. Based on this, what the narration means is that the case of whispering is pure faith or that whisperings are a sign of pure faith. Seizing and desisting from shaitan. If shaitan comes to insinuate to you to picture Allah in a certain way, remember the rule, only Allah knows how he is. Hence, you stop the satanic inspiration immediately with the verbalizing of subhanallah. Consequently, one may use this invocation to purify our minds and hearts of every dictation of shape, nature and reality regarding the divine names and attributes. One may also say, I believe in Allah and his messenger. As exemplified in the following narration, Aisha radiallahu anha narrated that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, The shaitan comes to one of you and says, Who created you? And he says, Allah. Then the shaitan says, Who created Allah? Let him say, Amantu billahi wa rusulihi. I believe in Allah and his messengers. If that happens to any one of you, then that will go away from him. If a Muslim may aid oneself in avoiding wrongful contemplation of the attributes by being occupied with acts of worship and pursuit of knowledge that are known and explained by the praised generations who had an authentic understanding of our Lord and his attributes, this is to be certain of the following, the Sunnah, and is chewing shaitan. Imam Ibn Rajab rahimahullah, wrote, People who are under the influence of Satan's whispering are likely to obey his commands and reject the sunnah of the Prophet and his companions. Satan's control over 
such people has led them to obey him blindly. It is similar to the school of the speculative theologists who deny the facts of the creation and things which are perceptible through senses. It is all an exaggeration in their obedience to shaitan and acceptance of his whispering. So, whoever reaches this level of obedience to shaitan has achieved complete obedience to him. What are the benefits of affirmation? There are many benefits we gain from affirming the divine attributes without the five violations. Distortion, corrupt interpretation, resemblance and dictating the modality. They are a part of the noble reward for the seeker of knowledge. A Muslim should be bound to knowledge with a passion for pursuing and implementing it upon an evidence-based method. This keenness is a shield against innovation and the benefit of it is only with the help of Allah. Zeal for knowledge, purity of intention and integrity of method will prepare a Muslim to engage in calling others to Islam using the names and attributes of Allah. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Strive for that which will benefit you. Seek the help of Allah and do not feel helpless. Non-exclusive gains include we save ourselves from deviation regarding Allah's names and attributes against which Allah warned us. Affirming the divine names and attributes means we believe in all the divine texts associated with the names and attributes of Allah. Affirming the divine names and attributes the way the Prophet and his companions understood them will lead us to actualize the knowledge of them in our lives. Awareness of the attributes is associated with specific acts of worship, which increases the servant's fear and love for Allah. What are the consequences of negation? Likewise, believing in the names and attributes of Allah while entertaining one of the five violations will have a series of consequences. Some of the non-exclusive consequences include compound ignorance of belonging to the sect which deviated from the current understanding of the names and attributes of Allah, belying the Quran and Sunnah which speak of these names and attributes, loss of benefit of the names and attributes and actualizing them in life and in worship. Chapter 2 Allah's Divine Essence Under the shade of the Twelve Rules, we developed a structured seven-question query, SSQQ, that can guide our understanding of Allah's attributes. This is a necessity because of the diversity and complex nature of speculative theology practiced by many Muslim sects. In addition, Calling non-Muslims to Islam often involves discussing the nature of our Lord because many people of the book base their understanding on speculative theology. Our position cannot be rhetorical, philosophical or avoidance. Rather, the caller to Islam must have a structured response. The issue of divine essence and selfhood of our Lord is significant in calling non-Muslims to Islam in the West. Due to the polytheistic nature and anthropomorphic qualities of Judeo-Christian theology, therefore it is important to apply the SSQQ to this issue. 1. Why must we affirm the attribute? 2. Can we affirm the attribute without negation and resemblance? 3. Can the attribute be personally interpreted? 4. How does the attribute look? 5. What if shaitan succeeds? 6. What are the benefits of affirmation? 7. What are the consequences of negation? Allah's Divine Essence We believe that Allah has a divine essence free from imperfection 
in the highest degree of magnificence. The most significant verse in the Quran concerning this topic is Ayatul Kursi. The verse describes the greatness of our Lord's divine essence. The most significant chapter which discusses the unique monotheistic qualities of our Lord is chapter Al-Ikhlas. While there is sufficient evidence in the Quran and Sunnah, the caller to Islam may rely heavily on these two references. Why must we affirm the attribute? We must affirm the attributes of the essence because we have a textual evidence to confirm, the first of which was mentioned above. Refusing to acknowledge the divine essence is a tantamount to belying the Quran and Sunnah. The last words of Khubayb bin Adi radiallahu anhu, is an example of the firmness of the praise generations upon belief in the divine essence. At a time when the disbelievers were putting Khubayb radiallahu anhu, to death, he said, As I am martyred as a Muslim, I do not care in what way I receive my death for Allah's sake, for this is for the cause of Allah. If he wishes, he will bless the cut limbs of my body. Another evidence which was mentioned in several forms from multiple sources is from Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu who narrated that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said Contemplate on the signs of Allah but do not think about Allah himself. 1. Can we affirm without negation and resemblance? We affirm the attribute of selfhood for our Lord, the Most High, according to the rule. There is nothing like unto Him. Affirmation is mandatory, because if we refrain from affirming the attributes of the Divine Essence, we will then approve of the deviant belief that Allah is a spirit that dwells in His creation. The concept of divine selfhood existing as a pantheistic spirit is known and believed by the majority of Christians, animists and extreme Sufis. We cannot engage in calling them to Islam and discourse with any of these groups unless we affirm our Lord has a divine essence and selfhood. 2. Can the attribute be personally interpreted. The attribute of our Lord's essence and selfhood must not be interpreted by an individual. One of the foundations of freedom of religion in the West is respect for personal interpretation of the divine essence. We believe there is no compulsion in religion and we respect personal freedoms, but we say theology must be based on revelation. The evidence for this is in the sending of all the prophets as a means to guide towards monotheism in worship. One of the twelve rules concerning the divine attributes states that a believer cannot prefer a hidden meaning over a word or concept that has an apparent meaning without evidence. Following a personal opinion in theology is analogous to following a hidden meaning because it is a meaning which is innovated and unknown from revealed evidence or explanations of the companions who witnessed the revelation. Following a personal interpretation is an act of distorting and twisting the meaning of the attributes of our Lord. 3. How does the attribute look? We are not allowed to question how regarding the modality of the attributes of our Lord, the Most High. A believer must be aware that shaitan triggers the question of how concerning the modality of the divine attributes of Allah. The callers to Islam should be aware that how is one of the most common challenges that people in the West will bring to obfuscate our invitation to Islam. The caller to Islam should respond to the challenge of how is our Lord with consideration of the following. Imam Malik rahimahullah's criteria of understanding the attribute of rising over the throne. Only Allah 
subhanahu wa ta'ala knows how Allah is. We must cut off every hope and desire to cover the information, nature, reality, and functionality of the attributes of Allah. We should avoid innovating imagery of his selfhood in the mind, the spoken narrative, drawing, or painting. We reflect upon creation, such as the footstool, the throne, and the angels who bear the throne, all of which are unseen and impossible to comprehend. The complexity and incomprehensibility of the unseen is evidence that the essence of Allah is beyond our grasp. 4. What if Satan succeeds? Alhamdulillah, the Muslim who considers this question in sincerity is taking responsibility for his actions. Allah allows some doubt to inform the Muslim who is stepping into an area which Allah did not permit. Awareness that Satan's schemes can cause doubt is the first step to turn him on his heels in failure. If shaitan incites contemplation of the selfhood of Allah, one should follow short steps of mitigation. Immediately refrain from contemplating Allah's essence or selfhood. Say, Subhanallah, which means Allah is above. The contemplated image or attribute. Say, I seek refuge with Allah. Say, I believe in Allah and His Messenger. 5. What are the benefits of affirmation? We understand Allah's divine essence in a way that suits His majestic greatness. And according to the rule, there is nothing like unto Him. Therefore, we are banned from employing our intellect to picture Allah's divine essence in an explicit way. However, if one wishes to have an idea, we can ponder upon the creations of Allah, such as the throne, the angels that hold the throne, the footstool, and the whole universe with its trillions of stars. If shaitan returns to make us contemplate the essence, we say subhanallah and refrain from entertaining the insinuation. No one knows how Allah is except Allah. No one knows the reality and nature of his divine essence except him. Whatever the human mind may deduce, Allah is above that. We believe that Allah has a divine essence in reality and a nature that suits his majesty. We do not dictate the modality and we cut off all hopes to reach that. Nevertheless, we do not refrain from the attribute. Rather, when we affirm what Allah and his messenger affirmed, there are gains and benefits. Amongst them, consistency regarding the attributes. Affirming the attribute of the divine essence of Allah is essential. It reflects our firm belief and complete conviction and is a necessary part of a whole comprehensive submission to our Lord. Since there is textual evidence to establish His divine essence, then we must affirm it. Rejection of the essence is the rejection of all the attributes. Refutation of unity of existence and the Trinity. When we affirm the attribute of the essence and its real nature above the throne, it negates the transverse. This establishes the belief that Allah is not part of his creation in any form or shape. Hence, affirmation of it refutes the ideology of unity of existence or being. The incarnation approach and the excuse idol worshippers present to justify their act of polytheism. The pantheistic claim that Allah is a spirit intrinsic in everything is a violation of monotheism. There is no evidence in the Quran or Sunnah where Allah referred to himself as a spirit. On the contrary, Allah refers to this spirit as part of his creation. Affirmation of a selfhood for Allah above the throne is a compulsory negation of polytheism. Only the creator can be outside of creation and there can be only one creator. Proving the validity of the question. 
where is Allah? The question where is Allah is a challenge and a burden to polytheists and Muslims who are upon innovation. The affirmation of the locus of our Lord closes the door on polytheism and pantheism. It also gives insight into the evidence-based method that Islamic theology must be based upon. In turn, the evidence-based method supports the correct understanding of our Lord Most High and His attributes of Self. This is established through the following narration. Muawiyah bin al-Hakam radiallahu anhu reported, I had a servant, woman, who used to look after some sheep of mine. I am a man from among the sons of Adam, and I get upset as they get upset. I slapped her. I came to the Messenger of Allah, and he regarded that as a grievous action on my part. I said, O Messenger of Allah, should I set her free? He said, Bring her to me. So I brought her to him, and he said to her, Where is Allah? She said, Above the heavens. He said, Who am I? She said, You are the Messenger of Allah. He said, Set her free, for she is a believer. We also have other evidence in chapter Al Mulk. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Do you feel secure that he who holds authority in the heaven would not cause the earth to swallow you and suddenly it would sway? Or do you feel secure that he who holds authority in the heaven would not send against you a storm of stones? Then you would know. How severe was my warning. The Prophet ﷺ said, in an authentic narration, The merciful are shown mercy by Rahman. Be merciful on the earth, and you will be shown mercy from who is above the heavens. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's highness does not negate his nearness. The attribute of our Lord, established in the above evidence, can be described as highness in the sense of meaning of the word, while we do not fully understand the reality of highness from other than our position on the earth. The evidence-based method established that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above the heavens. Those who reject the crystal clear evidence that Allah is above its creation do so because it contradicts their position that our Lord is everywhere. They cannot reconcile Allah's Highness with His nearness because it is incongruous to human special relations. Rather than reconciling and harmonizing evidence, the people of innovation reject evidence that does not harmonize with their ideology. The position weakens the concept of calling others to Islam because it portrays our corpus of evidence as being rife with contradiction. The correct position is what has been mentioned in the Qur'an and Sunnah and promised that both would be protected. Contradiction is not in the evidence-based method, but is in our understanding. Below is an authentic situation that confirms that the highness of our Lord does not negate his closeness. Khawla bint Tha'laba radiallahu anha, visited the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to complain about her husband, Awais bin al-Samit, radiallahu anhu. Aisha, radiallahu anha, said, Praise be to Allah, whose hearing encompasses all voices. Khawla came to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, complaining about her husband. But I could not hear, but I could not hear what she said. Then Allah the Mighty and Sublime revealed, Certainly has Allah heard the speech of the one who argues with you concerning her husband and directs her complaint to Allah. And Allah hears your dialogue. Indeed, Allah is hearing and seeing. 6. What are the consequences of negation? There are devastating consequences if we do not affirm the attribute of Allah's divine essence. Reflect upon the following elements of creation which Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu mentioned in one narration, connecting them and our Lord in a special arrangement. Remember, if a Muslim chooses not to affirm 
Allah's divine essence, He is in turn striking out all the elements in this evidence. Likewise, a caller to Islam may refer non-Muslims to the creation as evidence of a creator who transcends earthly terms and perspectives. Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu said, Between the lowest heaven and the one above it is a distance of 500 years, and between each heaven and the next is a distance of 500 years marching. Between the seventh heaven and the footstool is a distance of 500 years. Between the footstool and the water is a distance of 500 years. The throne is above the water, and Allah is above the throne, and none of your deeds are concealed from Him. Denying, rejecting, or negating the attribute of the divine essence will strike out all these elements of the universe, and in turn negate the Qur'an and Sunnah, which address them. First, the seven heavens and the seven earths. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, It is Allah who has created seven heavens of the earth and the like of them. His command descends among them, so you may know that Allah is over all things competent, and that Allah has encompassed all things in knowledge. Second, the angels who bear the throne. Hamlet al-Arsh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Those angels who carry the throne, and those around it, exult with praise of their Lord, and believe in Him, and ask forgiveness for those who have believed, saying, Our Lord, you have encompassed all things in mercy and knowledge. So forgive those who have repented and followed your way and protect them from the punishment of hellfire. Moreover, Allah talks about the great angels that carry the throne. They are magnificent creatures from the best of Allah's angels. On the day of judgment, Allah tells us there will be eight angels that will bear his throne. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, And the angels are at its edges, and there will bear the throne of your Lord above them. That day, eight of them. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I have been given permission to speak of one of the angels of Allah, one of the bearers of the throne. The distance between his earlobe and his shoulder is like the distance of 700 years travel. It was also narrated, with the wording, the distance is like that of a bird flying for 700 years. Third, the ocean, al-bahr, above the heavens. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, And it is He who created the heavens and the earth in six days, and His throne had been upon water, that He might test you as to which of you is best indeed. Abdullah bin Amr radiallahu anhu narrated, that the Prophet wasallam said, Allah decided the decrees of creation 50,000 years before He created the heavens and the earth. He said, And His throne is above the water. Fourth, the footstool is above the ocean. The footstool, Al-Kursi, is a component of the throne. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above the throne. Yet He knows everything and nothing is hidden. The footstool has all the heavens and the earth under it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, His footstool extends over the heavens and the earth, and their preservation tires him not. In an authentic narration, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, The seven heavens in relation to the footstool are like a ring thrown into a desert, and likewise the footstool compared to the throne, is like a ring thrown into a desert. Fifth, the throne above the footstool. Abdullah bin Mas'ud, radiallahu anhu, a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, between the lowest heaven and the one after it is the distance of 500 years, and between every two heaven is the distance of 500 years, and between the seventh heaven and the footstool is the distance of 500 years, and between the footstool and the water is the distance 
of five hundred years. The throne is above the water. Allah the Almighty is above the throne, and nothing is hidden from Allah of your deeds. Additional evidence to support SSQQ: One, Allah's divine essence is above the throne. When we say that Allah is above the sky, it does not mean that Allah is within the boundaries of the sky. Rather, Allah is above His creation. The first piece of evidence would be His names. Allah's names, the High, the Highest, the Most High. Allah named Himself with three names relevant to the attributes of highness and aboveness. First, the High. Allah has mentioned one of the last two names in the most significant verse of the Quran. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said, "And He is the Most High, the Most Great." Second, the Highest. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said, "Exalt the name of your Lord, the Most High." Third, the Most High. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said. He is the knower of the unseen and the witnessed, the grand, the exalted. Allah's highness is ingrained in our fitra. The innate instinct of man is the fitra. Fitra is the state of purity, an innocence in which all humans were born with, a predisposition to worship Allah alone. There should be no dispute that man instinctively knows. That Allah is above the heavens. Whenever something overwhelming befalls a person, he turns to Allah for help. He looks towards heaven, not in any other direction. But it is strange that those who deny that Allah is above His creation still raise their hands in supplication to no other direction than heaven. The Pharaoh admitted Allah's highness. Even Pharaoh, the enemy of Allah. Instructed his minister Haman to expose Allah in his heights. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said, and Pharaoh said, "O Haman, construct for me a tower, that I might reach the ways, the ways into the heavens, so that I may look at the deity of Musa." Deeds are raised above to him. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said. The angels in spirit will ascend to him during a day, the extent of which is fifty thousand years. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala also said that the archangel Jibril, Gabriel, alayhi salam, and other angels ascend to Allah. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said, "The angels in the spirit Jibril, Gabriel, ascend to him in a day, the measure whereof is fifty thousand years." During supplicating, we raise our hands and sights. When we supplicate, we normally raise our hands up. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam also used to raise his hands towards heaven when he supplicated. For example, during the exchange the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had with his companions on the day of Arafah, after concluding his farewell speech. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam held a gesture of pointing up with his finger when addressing them. He asked the people, "Have I not conveyed the message?" And they said, "Yes." He said, "O oh Allah, bear witness," while pointing up to the sky and then at the people. Allah raised Prophet Isa, Jesus alayhi salam, to Himself. Allah subhanahu wa taala said about Prophet Isa alayhi salam. Rather, Allah raised him to Himself, and ever is Allah exalted in might and wise. Common sense, highness, is a quality that is associated in people's minds with perfection. If this is the case, then it should be attributed to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, because every absolute perfection should be attributed to Him. Part six. Actualizing Allah's names, Chapter One, Allah, Ar Rahman, the Beneficent. A second example of exploring and absorbing the names of our Lord is in the name 
of a Rahman. Ahsaha of this name renders the virtues and benefits much more than a memorizing of the name. The mechanism relevant to the names of Allah is the true meaning of Ahsaha, enumerating which comprises the following four steps. 1. Validating the name of Allah, Ar-Rahman. 2. Perceiving the name correctly. 3. Identifying the effect of the name. 4. Praising and supplicating Allah using the name. The incentive in the narration, narrated by Abu Hurairah, عنه, is that the Prophet وسلم, said, Allah has 99 names, 100 less one, and he who memorized them all by heart will enter paradise. The Sunnah tells us that whoever counts the names of Allah is promised admittance into paradise. Let us hope in Allah that his name, Ar-Rahman, is amongst the 99 names mentioned in the above narration, and we should validate and enrich our hope by facts like these mentioned below. The name of Allah, Ar-Rahman, appears in the Quran in 57 places, six of them paired with Ar-Rahim. The name of Ar-Rahman is among the three names in the Basmala, which we recite at the beginning of each chapter, except at Tawbah. In the name of Allah, the entirely merciful, the especially merciful. The name of Allah, Ar-Rahman, is the only name of Allah that a chapter of the Quran is named after. The name of Allah, Ar-Rahman, is the only name that Allah used equally to his proper name in chapter Al-Isra. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Say, call upon Allah, or call upon the most merciful, whichever name you call to him belong the best names, and do not recite too loudly in your prayer, or too quietly, but seek between that an intermediate way. 1. Validating the name Ar-Rahman The first meaning of Ahsaha is to recall the name Ar-Rahman and memorize it. Therefore, we must provide evidence from the Quran and the Sunnah to call him by the name Allah Ar-Rahman, even if the amount of evidence in the Sunnah is more remarkable. Below are authentic narrations from the Prophet وسلم, which established the name of Allah Ar-Rahman in his Sunnah. The Prophet وسلم, said, The word Ar-Rahman derives its root from the name Ar-Rahman. Allah said, I will keep good relation with the one who will keep good relation with you, and sever the relation with him who will sever the relation with you. Another narration of Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu recounts that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, There are three reasons why horses are kept. A horse that is kept for Ar-Rahman, a horse kept for Shaytan, and a horse kept for the man. As for the horse kept for Ar-Rahman, it is the horse that is being kept for the cause of Allah, and as such, its food, dung, and urine, etc. As for the horse that is for Satan, it is one that is being used for gambling. As for the horse that is for man, it is the horse that one tethers, seeking its benefit. For him, this horse will be a shield against poverty. 2. Perceiving Ar-Rahman correctly. Evidence mentions Ar-Rahman and it is incumbent to understand the meanings as the first three praise generations understood them. The derived attribute must be explored and expounded with the majesty the name implies, and understanding should be consistent around it. The name of Allah, Ar-Rahman, means the beneficent, the kindest, and giving, the one who continually showers all creation with blessings and prosperity without any disparity, the one who is most kind, loving, and merciful, whose endless loving mercy is perfect and inclusive. Allah's mercy. Allah 
is described with the attribute merciful. Some theologians and skeptics have failed to understand many of Allah's attributes and therefore misinterpreted them. Their failure to construe the reality of Allah's attributes stems from their conception of these attributes as they relate to human beings. As a human quality, mercy was created to trigger feelings and physical responses such as softness in the heart, crying, and perhaps the sense of vulnerability. Allah's mercy is befitting His majesty, and like all His names and attributes, it cannot be grasped by our limited minds. We can only observe and perceive their effects on us. Therefore, the way of our righteous predecessors was that they believed in all the divine attributes as described in the Qur'an and Sunnah, without seeking to know the nature of these attributes, such as likening divine mercy to human mercy. The mercy of Allah is of two types. General mercy. Allah's general mercy is bestowed upon all of His creation throughout the universe. This mercy emanates from Allah's attribute of Ar-Rahman. This mercy is all-encompassing and even touches the non-believers. All of his creations are living peacefully and nurtured, with all their sickness cured and needs fulfilled because of the existence of this mercy. The universal existence of the virtue of nurturing proves that this mercy does not differentiate between a believer and a non-believer. Special Mercy Allah directs His special mercy towards the believers in this world and the hereafter. This is a manifestation of His mercy towards the believers and His guidance and peace which He bestows upon them. Allah guides them to lead an honorable, pure and wholesome life in this world and a great reward in the hereafter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Whoever does righteousness, whether male or female, while he is a believer, we will surely cause him to live a good life, and we will surely give them their reward in the hereafter, akhirah, according to the best of what they used to do. When one contemplates the high value of being a believer in the life that those who have faith in Allah live, one will never fail to recognize that the life of a believer is more worthy and honorable than that lived by one who does not believe nor has faith in Allah. Examples of Allah's mercy We can never truly comprehend the mercy of Allah, but here are some examples. Abu Hurairah anhu, reported that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, I heard Allah's Messenger saying, Allah has divided mercy into 100 parts, and he kept 99 parts with him and sat down one part on the earth. And because of that one single part, his creations are merciful to each other, so that even the mare lifts up its hoof away from its baby animal, lest it should trample on it. Imagine how much a mother has mercy for a child, for the moment of birth to the moment of death. Imagine if that mercy could somehow be captured and placed in a bottle. Overall, to capture all the mercy that ever existed from the beginning of time until the end will only represent 1% of the 100 parts of the mercy that Allah created. The 99 other parts of this created mercy, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has reserved for the believers on the Day of Judgment. Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu anhu said, Some Sabi were brought from the Prophet and behold, a woman amongst them was milking her breasts to feed and whenever she found a child amongst the captives, she took it over her chest and nursed it. The Prophet said to us, Do you think that this lady can throw her son in the fire? We replied, No, if she has the power not to throw it. The Prophet then said, 
Allah is more merciful to his servants than this lady to her child. Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim Allah had Ar-Rahman with another name in the Quran, namely Ar-Rahim. Both Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim imply the attributes of mercy, compassion, kindness, and gentleness. The two names are about Allah's attribute of mercy. Ar-Rahman is the most compassionate or the most gracious. Ar-Rahim is the most merciful. Both names imply the attribute of mercy, but the two names do not mean the same thing, even when mentioned together. In fact, they appear together six times in the Quran, as we previously indicated. Both appear in the Basmala as well as in chapter Al Fatiha. Ar Rahman indicates Allah's mercy as an attribute of the divine essence of Allah. Meanwhile, Ar Rahim is an attribute connected to Allah's divine will and those who are subject to His mercy, such as humans and animals. In other words, Ar Rahman is related to Allah's most comprehensive and encompassing and eternal expressions of mercy, while Ar Rahim indicates Allah's practical mercy. Scholars supported this approach with multiple pieces of evidence in the Quran and Sunnah. And the most profound one is the mentioning of Ar Rahman in association with his magnificent throne. Allah described his footstool, which is below the throne, as encompassing the heavens and the earth. Likewise, the name Ar Rahman includes all levels and meanings of mercy in this life and the hereafter. His mercy encompasses and touches everything in the universe, including humans, jinn, animals, and all forms of life in the sea and on land. The Prophet wasallam spoke of Allah's mercy in a Qudsi narration. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, When Allah had finished creation, He ordained for Himself in His book, which is with Him above the throne, My mercy prevails over my wrath. The name Ar-Rahman, like the name Allah, is an exclusive name for Allah alone. No human being can claim this name, and it is forbidden for Muslims to name themselves by it, except with prefix Abd, which means a slave or servant. On the other hand, human beings may take the name of Rahim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Verily, there has come unto you a messenger from amongst yourselves. It grieves him that you should receive any injury or difficulty. He is anxious over you to be rightly guided to repent to Allah and beg Him to pardon and forgive your sins, in order that you may enter paradise and be saved from the punishment of the hellfire. For the believers, He is full of pity, kind and merciful. There is another difference that some scholars mentioned but refuted. They said Ar-Rahim is exclusive to the believers on Judgment Day. There is a reference in chapter Al-Baqarah, to Allah being merciful to the people in this world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, And thus, we have made you a just community, that you will be witness over the people, and the messenger will be a witness over you. And we did not make the qibla, which you used to face, except that we might make evident who would follow the messenger, from who would turn back on his heels. And indeed it is difficult except for those whom Allah has guided. And never would Allah have caused you to lose your faith. Indeed, Allah is to the people kind and merciful. 3. Identifying the effects of a rahman on you The individual who knows that Allah is the merciful will identify the impact of mercy on their life. It causes a re-evaluation of the relationship with Allah between the servant and the master. It necessitates our love for Allah. When someone shows excessive and abundant mercy, 
there is no response except to love that being and to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala belongs the highest similitude of mercy then how much more should we love Allah knowing every good we receive from creation the actual cause of that blessing is because of him it instills in a believer shyness from disobeying Allah's commandments when someone has showered you with gifts it becomes relatively hard to be ungrateful and go against his commands look at prophet nuh alayhi salam rebuking his people who worshiped others beside him despite all the bounties allah bestowed upon them prophet nuh alayhi salam started reminding them to shy away and display fear and respect what is the matter with you that you fear not allah and you hope not for reward from allah or you believe not in his oneness then he started listing allah's bounties upon them while he has created you in different stages see you not how allah has created the seven heavens one above another and has made the moon a light therein and made the sun a lamp and allah has brought you forth from the dust of earth afterwards he will return you into it and bring you forth again on the day of resurrection and allah has made for you the earth widespread that you may go about therein in broad roads the servant will never despair from allah's mercy allah's faithful servant recognizes that he has done so much sin to the point that the heavens and earth cannot contain them regardless of how heavy your sins are there is hope even if they are more substantial than all the mountains put together the servant may feel as though he is deserving of no mercy or that allah will not forgive him allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said say o my servants who have transgressed against themselves do not despair of the mercy of allah indeed allah forgives all sins indeed it is he who is the forgiving the merciful remember it is one of shaitan's tricks to make us give up on allah's mercy because he himself gave up on his majesty's mercy linguistically iblis is the proper name of shaitan which is derived from the arabic noun albalas that is translated as despair shaitan himself despaired of allah's mercy therefore he planned not to stop sinning or misguiding others to sin as well one of shaitan's tricks is to make individuals despair of allah's mercy anas radhiyallahu anhu reported that he heard the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam say allah blessed is he and the most high said o son of adam verily as long as you called upon me and hoped in me i forgave you despite whatever may have occurred from you and i did not mind o son of adam were your sins to reach the clouds of the sky then you sought forgiveness from me i would forgive you and i would not mind o son of adam if you came to me with sins nearly as great as the earth then you met me not associating anything with me i would come to you with forgiveness nearly as great as it never make others give up on allah's mercy there was once a serial killer who belittled life and slaughtered without conscience despite the gravity of the sin allah still showed him mercy abu sa'id al-khudri radhiyallahu anhu narrated there was a man from bani israil who murdered 99 persons then he set out asking whether his repentance could be accepted or not he came upon a monk asked him if his repentance could be accepted the monk replied in the negative and so the man killed him he kept on asking till a man advised him to go to such and such village but death overtook him on the way while dying he turned his chest towards that village where he had hoped his repentance would be accepted and so the angels of mercy and the angels of punishment quarreled amongst themselves regarding him allah ordered the village towards which he was going to come closer to him and ordered the village whence he had come to go far away 
and then he ordered the angels to measure the distances between his body and the two villages. So he was found one span closer to the village he was going to. So he was forgiven. Repentance, Toba, is the noblest and best form of obedience in the eyes of Allah. He loves those who repent. Repentance has a status that no other act of worship has. Just ponder upon the divine joy Allah has due to the repentance of a sinner. Anas radiallahu anhu reported that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Allah rejoices more over the repentance of a servant when he repents to him, when he repents to him, than one of you who was on his mount in the wilderness. Then he lost it, and his food and drink are on it, and he despairs of finding it. He goes to a tree and lies down in its shade, having lost hope of finding his mount. And while he is like that, there it is standing in front of him. So he takes hold of his reins and says, because of his intense joy, O Allah, you are my servant and I am your Lord, making this mistake because of his intense joy. After these narrations, a hadith, no one has the right to cause any Muslim to despair from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. 4. Seek the means to attain Allah's mercy. Obviously, the more we strive to actualize certain attributes, the closer we come to Allah's unique mercy in this life and the next. The most deserving people of Allah's unique form of mercy are the following categories of Muslims. Muslims who strive to attain excellence. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Indeed, the mercy of Allah is near to the doers of good. Muslims who are God conscious. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, My mercy encompasses, embraces all things. So, I will decree it for the muttaqun. Muslims who constantly beg Allah's forgiveness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, He said, O my people, why are you impatient for evil instead of good? Why do you not seek forgiveness of Allah that you may receive mercy? Muslims who listen to the Quran tentatively. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, So when the Quran is recited, then listen to it and pay attention that you may receive mercy. Muslims who obey Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, And obey Allah and the Messenger that you may obtain mercy. Muslims who strive to follow the Quran and Sunnah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, And this Quran is a book we have revealed, which is blessed. So follow it and fear Allah that you may receive mercy. Muslims who establish prayers, salah and charity. Zakah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, And establish prayer and give charity and obey the messenger that you may receive mercy. Muslims who have faith and they strive to sustain it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Indeed, those who have believed and those who have immigrated and fought in the cause of Allah, those expect the mercy of Allah and Allah is forgiving and merciful. Muslims who show mercy to others. Abdullah bin Amr radiallahu anhu narrated, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Those who are merciful will be shown mercy by the merciful. Be merciful to those on the earth, and the one above the heavens will have mercy upon you. 5. Praising and supplicating Allah using the name Ar-Rahman. Another meaning of performing Ahsaha or extolling the virtues of the name Ar-Rahman is to supplicate and call upon Allah using it, and also to praise Allah through it. Notice that the name of Allah Ar-Rahman is unique to Allah, and is not permissible to name any other with it, except with the addition Abdul Rahman. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Say, call upon Allah, or call upon the most merciful, 
whichever name you call to him belong the best names and do not recite loudly in your prayer or too quietly but seek between that and intermediate way chapter 2 the merciful will be shown mercy the teachings of islam demand muslims to implement mercy as much as they can to the best of their abilities therefore muslims must strive to be merciful to the entire creation muslims and non-muslims friends or foe and even animals the attribute of mercy of allah is associated with his other supporting characters including kindness compassion love tolerance forgiveness patience and treating others the way we would love to be treated muslims must aim to be advocates of mercy towards the entire creation representing and actualizing allah's attribute of compassion and mercy and sharing the essence of the message of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said and we have not sent you o muhammad except as a mercy to the worlds ibn taymiyyah rahimahullah said the adherence to the methodology of the people of the sunnah and the muslim community obey allah and his messenger and follow the truth hence they show mercy to the creations thus we must do our best to be merciful to the entire creation to the muslims and non-muslims to our families and relatives to friends and strangers to people and animals and even to our most bitter enemies a means to obtain allah's mercy naturally it makes a believer want to be more merciful to others when he knows that allah will show him mercy showing mercy towards others is also a means to attain allah's mercy jarir bin abdullah radiyallahu anhu narrated that the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said whoever is not merciful to people will not be shown mercy from allah also abdullah bin amr radiyallahu anhu reported that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said the merciful are shown mercy by ar rahman be merciful on the earth and you will be shown mercy from who is above the heavens mercy is a means to amend relations just by employing the attribute of mercy we can repair any broken bonds in our lives below are just seven circles where muslims may apply the attribute of mercy you will see for yourself that if everyone does this it will reform the entire muslim community and it will be a leading cause to their unity mercy towards parents the first domain where we must exercise mercy and compassion is towards our parents our parents are the reason why we exist in this world with the permission of allah hence allah always paired actualizing monotheism which is the right of allah with the rights of the parents ibn abbas radiyallahu anhu said three verses were revealed in connection with three others one will not be accepted without its counterpart allah said and perform salah and give zakah and irka that is bow down or submit yourselves with obedience to allah along with the raki'un whoever prays and does not give charity his prayer is not accepted second the saying of the almighty be grateful to me and your parents whoever is grateful to allah and is not grateful to his parents it will not be accepted from him and allah almighty said obey allah and obey the messenger whoever obeys allah and does not obey the messenger it will not be accepted from him furthermore parents may be our path of ease to paradise abu huraira radiyallahu anhu reported that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam amin 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 you are said o messenger of allah you ascended the pulpit and said amin 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 the prophet said verily jibril came to me and he said 
whoever reaches the month of Ramadan and he is not forgiven, then he will enter hellfire and Allah will cast him far away. So say Amin. I said Amin. Whoever sees his parents in their old age, one or both of them, and he does not honor them and he dies, then he will enter hellfire and Allah will cast him far away. So say Amin. I said Amin. Whoever has your name mentioned in his presence, and he does not send blessings upon you, and he dies, then he will enter hellfire, and Allah will cast him far away. So say Amin. I said Amin. This is a warning for us against failing to show dutifulness and mercy towards our parents. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, And lower to them the wing of humility out of mercy and say, My Lord, have mercy upon them as they brought me up when I was small. Mercy towards children. Children are an inestimable given grant from Allah. In Islam, parents have rights over their children. However, when their children grow up to be parents, their children will have rights upon them. As Muslim parents, we must strive to show them mercy, love, and compassion for the sake of Allah, following the example of His Messenger. Islamic teachings encourage parents to facilitate every means to nurture and educate. The essential qualities every parent should strive to attain are outlined in the Quran and detailed in the Prophet's performance of the Quran. The Prophet ﷺ's excellence Quranic character was not exclusive to his time and place where he lived. Instead, it was meant to be inclusive for all times, generations and communities. Thus, he is a lasting universal role model for all people, surpassing through time. The Prophet ﷺ's mercy towards children was exceptional. His treatment of all children, and not just his offspring, is an example to us all. The Prophet ﷺ would kiss and hug children often to express his compassionate mercy towards them. Al-Aqra' bin Habis anhu saw the Messenger ﷺ kissing Al-Hasan anhu. He said, I have ten children and I have never kissed any of them. The Messenger of Allah said, The one who does not show mercy will not be shown mercy. Despite the Prophet's many commitments, he would still find time to actively concern himself with the simple moments of community children. For example, when the pet bird of a young child died, the Prophet ﷺ went out of his way to try and console him. Anas bin Malik anhu said, The Messenger of Allah used to enter upon us, and I had a young brother who was known by the kunya, Abu Umair. He had a nugah with which he used to play, and it died. The Prophet entered upon him one day and saw him looking sad. He said, What is the matter with him? They said, His nugah died. He said, Abu Umair, what happened to the nugah? Mercy towards spouse. One of the missing ingredients in our Muslim houses is good character with our spouses. One might be smiling at everyone outside the house, and the moment he steps inside the house, his smile disappears. For this reason, the Prophet ﷺ made it a sign of complete faith to exercise kindness and mercy towards one's household. The Prophet ﷺ said, Indeed, among the believers with the most complete faith, Iman is the one who is best in conduct and the most kind to his family. One of the mounting dilemmas in the Muslim world is the rising occurrence of divorce. Many Muslims have forgotten the foundation upon which their marriage bond was founded. It is love and mercy. When love is not felt in a spousal relationship, then mercy should be the replacement. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and of his signs, 
is that he created for you from yourselves matters that you may find tranquility in them and he placed between you affection and mercy indeed in that are signs for a people who give thought mercy towards kinship in many narrations allah and his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam equated the kinship ties with a mother's womb where the baby grows and develops this implies the close connection all of humanity has because we can track our lineage to a common origin allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam further equated the attribute of mercy with a mother's womb allah said in a qudsi narration i will keep good relation with the one who will keep good relation with you and sever the relation with him who will sever the relation with you there is divine wisdom behind this equation the mother's womb perfectly illustrates the concept of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy a mother's womb is the child's only source of protection and nourishment the child is taken care of entirely by the mother and it is entirely dependent on mercy the mother loves the child and shows her mercy in every aspect while the child is unaware that this protection and nourishment are extended another illustration of mercy of allah is exhibited in the mercy mothers have towards their infant children umar bin al khattab radiyallahu anhu narrated that some prisoners of war were brought to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and a nursing woman was among them whenever she found a child among the prisoners she would take it to a chest and nurse it the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said do you think this woman would throw her child into the fire the companion said no not if she was able to stop it the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said allah is more merciful to his servants than this mother is to a child the disappearance of mercy compassion and kindness is a leading cause of the widespread severing of kinship in our muslim communities meanwhile allah and his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam commanded us to uphold our kinship ties and warned us against severing the kinship in many narrations abu huraira radiyallahu anhu narrated that the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said allah created the creations and when he finished from his creations ar rahman that is womb said o oh allah at this place i seek refuge with you from all those who sever me that is sever the ties of kith and kin allah said yes won't you be pleased that i will keep good relation with the one who will keep good relations with you and i will sever the relation with the one who will sever the relation with you it said yes o oh my lord allah said then that is for you allah's messenger added read in the quran if you wish the statement of allah would you then if you were given the authority do mischief in the land and sever your ties of kinship muslims hear the exhortation to keep the ties of kinship every friday sermon isn't it time to respond mercy towards another muslim showing mercy towards other muslims is another means of actualization the mercy of allah and a means to receive a special mercy jarir bin abdullah radiyallahu anhu narrated that the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said he who is not merciful to others will not be treated mercifully abu hisham rahimahullah said it has reached me that it is written in the torah as you show mercy you will receive mercy an nu'man bin bashir radiyallahu anhu reported that the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said you see the believers as regards their being merciful among themselves showing love among themselves and being kind among themselves resembling one body so that if any part of the body is not well then the whole body shares the sleeplessness and fever with it 
Hence, by being merciful to others, we not only benefit them in this world, but we also benefit ourselves in the hereafter. Allah revealed the following verse, offering forgiveness for Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu if he resumed charity to an individual. And let them pardon and overlook. Would you not like that Allah should forgive you? And Allah is forgiving and merciful. When this verse was revealed, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu said, By Allah, I certainly love that Allah should forgive me. So he resumed spending on Mr. as he had spent on him before. And he said, By Allah, I shall never stop spending on him. Mr. bin Uthatha radiallahu anhu was someone who slandered his daughter Aisha radiallahu anha, the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and the mother of the believers. The quality of mercy is not restricted to the Muslims. Mercy shown by non-Muslims towards Muslims can be the cause to receive guidance to Islam as well. The following is a story from our time. There was an old American man who was not yet a Muslim. Whenever he heard of trouble or instability in one of the developing countries, he would go there and bring an orphan to a sponsor. When the United States invaded Afghanistan, he went there to bring an orphan. And usually, this orphan's late parents taught the child to neglect sleep and pray the night prayer. One night, the orphan's beautiful recitation of the Qur'an woke the old man up. He came to check on the young boy. He asked him, What are you doing? He said, I'm praying. The old man started inquiring more about his religion, which eventually became the reason for this old man at 84 years of age to accept Islam. Mercy towards non-Muslims The Prophet ﷺ applied the teaching of divine mercy throughout his entire life, even to his enemies and oppressors. One more than one occasion, the companions asked the Prophet ﷺ to curse or pray against their enemies who had been persecuting them for years. Even so, the Prophet ﷺ refused to curse or pray against their enemies as it would have contradicted the message of mercy. Abu Hurairah reported, The Messenger ﷺ was told, O Messenger of Allah, pray against the idolaters. He said, I was not sent as an invoker of curses, rather I was sent as a mercy. The most famous of the Prophet was mercy was the forgiveness he was shown, his opponents, after the conquest of Mecca, after nearly 23 years of suffering oppression for his message of monotheism. Despite all of this oppression, the Prophet was able to spread the message of mercy back to the mother of all cities. Rather than taking revenge, the Prophet ﷺ responded to the former enemies with what they expected, mercy. Indeed, the Prophet ﷺ was forgiving and merciful because Allah had revealed to him, as well as to the prophets before him, that among the best and most honored people to Allah, are those who forgive others and treat others the way they would love to be treated. When Aisha radiallahu anha asked the Prophet وسلم, if he had experienced a day more difficult than the day of Uhud, his reply was yes. Then he mentioned to her the story of his journey to Ta'if. When the Prophet وسلم, invited the people of Quraysh to Islam, they did not respond to him, and he headed towards Ta'if to convey Allah's message to them. When he invited Ta'if to Islam, their attitude was worse than that of the people of Mecca. So, he وسلم, left Ta'if dejected. He was unaware of his surroundings until he met Angel Jibreel. Salam. The Prophet وسلم, told Aisha, radiallahu anha, Jibreel said, Allah has heard what your people said to you and how they have rejected you. 
he has sent to you the angel of the mountains, so that you can tell him to do whatever you want to them. Then he called the angel of the mountains to me, and he greeted me with salam. Then he said, O Muhammad, Allah has heard what your people have said to you, and I am the angel of the mountains. Your Lord has sent me, so that you can tell me what to do. What do you want? If you wish, I will bring together al akhshabain the two mountains of Mecca, to crush them. The Messenger of Allah said, Rather, I hope that Allah will bring forth from their loins people who will worship Allah alone, not associating anything with Him. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring a progeny from the hypocrites of Ta'if, who became righteous servants and people free from associating partners with Him. Mercy is an essential value of what Muslims build together as a community. The lack of mercy is a vacuum of loss, and the presence of mercy is an inspiration for perseverance. Therefore, it is incumbent on us to spread mercy. Mercy towards animals. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu reported that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, a prostitute passed by a panting dog near a well and saw that the dog was about to die of thirst. So she took off her hoof and tied it with her head cover and drew out some water for it. So Allah forgave her because of that. Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, commented on the above narration. If Allah Almighty had forgiven one who gave water to a dog suffering from extreme thirst, then how about the one who relieves the thirst, satisfies the hunger, and clothes the naked among the Muslims? One of our predecessors used to wake up every morning to pray the morning prayer, and he would pass by a Christian lady who would wake up to feed the birds every day. Our predecessor used to tell her, what you're doing is great, but it will not help you on the day of judgment, because you are not on monotheism. One day, our predecessor was performing the annual pilgrimage in Mecca and was making circumambulation around the Kaaba. He was surprised to see the Christian lady there. He immediately asked her what brought her to Islam rather than the invitation from the brother. Her guidance to Islam was the engagement with mercy she felt when feeding the birds. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, reported that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, While a man was walking on a road, he became very thirsty. Then he came across a well, got down into it, drank, and then came out. Meanwhile, he saw a dog panting and licking mud because of excessive thirst. The man said to himself, This dog is suffering from the same state of thirst as I did. So he went down the well and filled his shoe and held it in his mouth and watered the dog. Allah thanked him for that deed and forgave him. The Prophet further explained, There is a reward for serving any animate living being. Qurra ibn Iyas radiallahu anhu reported, A man said, O Messenger of Allah, I would have slaughtered a sheep, but I had mercy on it. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, If you had mercy on the sheep, then Allah will have mercy on you twice. It is by virtue of our spreading of mercy among us that Allah bestows upon us some of the mercy we rely upon in this life. Mercy is raised between us, and the virtues are its sharing without accounting. Yet, we anticipate a fuller return in the hereafter, while we feel no deficit in the present. Surely, our Lord is abundantly merciful to those who know Him. Chapter 3 The Greatest Name of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala All the names of Allah are great. Without exception, they are void of any imperfections or flaws and are most excellent. However, several narrations were reported 
concerning the greatest name of Allah. The most famous these narrations are the following. Abu Umama radiallahu anhu narrated that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, The greatest name of Allah, if he is called, by which he will respond, is in three chapters, Al-Baqarah, Al-Imran, and Taha. Anas radiallahu anhu narrated, I was sitting with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam while a man was praying. The man said in supplication, O oh Allah, I ask you, because all praise is due to you. There is no God but you alone. You have no partner or associate, the bestower, the originator of the heavens and the earth, the possessor of majesty and honor. O ever-living, O sustainer, the Prophet ﷺ said, He has asked Allah by his greatest name, which if he is called upon thereby, he answers, and if asked thereby, he gives. Buraida bin al husayb radiallahu anhu narrated, The Prophet heard a man supplicating, and he was saying, O oh Allah, indeed, I ask you, by my testifying that you are Allah, there is none worthy of worship except you, the one, as samad the one who does not beget, nor was begotten, and there is none who is like him. The Messenger of Allah said, By the one in whose hand is my soul, and has asked Allah by his greatest name, the one which if he is called upon by it, he responds, and when he is asked by it, he gives. Asma bint Yazid radiallahu anhu narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the greatest name of Allah is in these two verses, ayat. Your deity is one deity. There is none who has the right to be worshipped but he. Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. Alif Lam Mim. Allah, none has the right to be worshipped but he. The ever-living, the sustainer. Difference of opinion. Scholars have a difference of opinion regarding the potential greatest name of Allah. The opinions vary as follows. The first view is that it is incorrect to differ between names and to favor one over another. All the names must be viewed equally, approached and used equally. Al-Hafiz ibn Hajar rahimahullah said that Imam Malik rahimahullah believed it was impermissible to regard some divine names as superior to others. Imam Malik rahimahullah was famous for making no distinction between parts of the Qur'an and held all of them in the highest esteem. So too with the names of Allah. It was said he believed making a decision may lead to believing that the less favoured parts are inferior to those that are more favoured. Advocates of this position still must sort out the different narrations that refer to Allah's most excellent name. Their view of their narrations is to interpret reports of a greatest name to mean among the great. This is like saying that each of Allah's names is among the greatest, and the use of any of the names known from evidence will bring the same result. What was meant by the companions in the narrations quoted above was a reward for their sincerity by calling Allah based on knowledge of his names. And this reward was referred to by Ibn Hibban rahimahullah, as what is sought by calling upon Allah by a specific name. Al-Hafidh ibn Hajar rahimahullah, said, What was meant by way of identifying greatness was the extra reward earned by the reciter, just as an individual may have a shorter chain in a narration or a longer one, and both reach the Prophet ﷺ. What is required of a Muslim is to call upon Allah using any of the names of Allah. The one must call him in complete submission and with a singular focus of mind, and a mix between fear and hope. Whoever calls like this will receive a response, as though 
they called using the greatest name. Hence, what is meant by the greatest name is the frame of mind and focus of the one who is calling upon Allah by that name. An example of this might be that of a scholar named Bal'am bin Ba'ura in the time of Prophet Musa salam. Some Quranic commentators feel that verses 175 and 176 of chapter Al-A'raf refer to Bal'am. Ibn Kathir rahimahullah recorded that Qatada radiallahu anhu reported that Ka'b radiallahu anhu said that Bal'am was gifted with the knowledge of Allah's greatest name. Bal'am was also known for his beautiful and acceptable forms of supplicating the Lord. And so Prophet Musa salam, sent him as an emissary to the people of Madian. When Bal'am directed his benedictions against Prophet Musa salam, Allah took away his knowledge. The second view, the advocates of the second position believe that Allah has kept knowledge of his greatest name with himself only. Ibn Hajar rahimahullah expressed that this opinion was held by others and respected, and Allah knows best. The third view, this is the view of those who affirmed that the greatest name of Allah exists and that it is a specific name, but they differed as to which is the greatest name. There are 14 views expressed by Al-Hafidh ibn Hajar rahimahullah in his book Fath al-Bari. 1. Who, he, followed by an authentic name such as the Ar-Rahman, the Merciful. 2. Allah. 3. Ar-Rahman, the Merciful. 4. Ar-Rahim, the Beneficent. 5. Al-Hay, Al-Qayyum, the Ever-Living, All-Sustaining. Al-Mannan, Allah is the one who is tremendous in giving. 7. Al-Badi'a al-Samawati wal-Ard, the originator of the heavens and the earth. 8. Dhul Jalali wal-Ikram, Lord of Majesty and Generosity, Lord of Glory and Honor. 9. Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-Ahad, al-Samad, al-Ladhi lam yalid wa lam yulad. وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ كُفْوًا أَحَدٍ It is Allah. There is no one worthy of worship except He. One and only. As-Samad, the self-sufficient master, whom all creatures need. He neither eats nor drinks. He begets not, nor was He begotten. And there is none co-equal or comparable unto Him. 10. Rabb, Rabb, Lord, Lord, Lord of all. That exists. 11. The prayer of Prophet Yunus السلام, in the belly of the fish. La ilaha illa anta. Subhanaka inni kuntum min al There is no deity worthy of worship except you. Exalted are you. Indeed, I have been of the wrongdoers. 12. Who Allah? 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 الذي لا إله إلا هو الرب العرش العظيم. He is Allah, Allah, Allah. Besides whom, there is no other God worthy of worship except He, Lord of the mighty throne. 13. It is concealed within the divine names. 14. The word of monotheism, Tawheed. لا إله إلا الله. There is no God worthy of worship except Allah. The fourth view, there are scholars who approve of the reality of Allah's existing names by evidence and explored a distinction between the names. These scholars have two popular opinions. The first opinion is that the greatest name is Allah because it encompasses all the other names and indicates all the subtle and sublime attributes. This name was never bestowed on anyone in creation. Furthermore, it refers to his essence and relates to all his praiseworthy attributes. 
and to many semantic meanings. It is mentioned in the Quran in at least 2,697 places, depending on criteria. And it is mentioned in all the narrations concerning the content of the greatest name of Allah. The fourth view has a second opinion. The greatest name is al Hayy al-Qayyum, the ever-living, the sustainer. This is the view of several scholars, such as Nawawi, rahimahullah, and Ibn Uthaymeen, rahimahullah. And when my servants asks you, O Muhammad, concerning me, indeed, I am near. I respond to the invocation of the supplication when he calls upon me. So let them respond to me by obedience and believe in me that they may be rightly guided.